urban legends are stories that claim to be true, sometimes used to teach moral lessons or simply to enjoy a quick scare. While some aren't really too believable, there's those that have really disturbing, true backstories behind them and make us wonder how much truth there really is to them after all. Whether they're true or not though, everyone, no matter where they're from, has heard and maybe even believe one or two of them. In this video, we'll be taking the deepest dive yet into the world of urban legends, aiming to cover all those you're familiar with and many you've never heard of. So without further ado, welcome to the complete urban legend iceberg. Ankle Slicing Car Thief The ankle slicing car thief is an urban legend that taps into fears of vulnerable situations, mainly those involving women in seemingly safe places like parking lots. The roots of this legend aren't really too well known, but some trace it back to the late 1970s, which was a time where people had a heightened fear and paranoia about random acts of violence. This was because things like Cold War tensions were around, and even since terrorism was rising at the international stage. The tale typically involves an assailant hiding under a victim's car in a public parking lot or garage. As the victim approaches their vehicle, the hidden attacker slashes at their ankles, aiming to sever the Achilles tendon, which renders the victim immobile. This then allows the attacker to rob or steal the car of the victim, simply leaving them in severe pain and unable to escape or pursue. The thing about this legend though that makes it especially scary is the sort of plausibility to it, since we're not really tapping into supernatural things here. It also echoes childhood fears of hidden monsters like the boogeyman under our bed, but translated more into an adult context. The spread of this legend was so pervasive in some instances that it prompted police departments to address public concern, despite no verified reports of such crimes matching the exact details of the legend. Variations of this story sometimes also include different elements like the requirement for a gang initiation involving the severing and presentation of a limb, although these two lack substantiation. In recent years, social media like TikTok has had some effect on the urban legend too, with people making videos with captions like, me checking if someone is under my car, trying to slash my ankles. Black Eyed Children The story of the Black Eyed Children is a modern urban legend about mysterious kids who have completely black eyes and show up at people's homes or cars, usually asking to be let inside. These encounters often leave people feeling very uneasy, and the story of this whole phenomenon basically became widely known through a report by a journalist named Brian Bethel in 1996. Brian Bethel claimed he met two children in Albline, Texas, and according to him, the children asked for a ride in his car, but he felt a sudden fear and decided to drive away. Since then, similar stories have been reported across the world, with people reporting that children might ask to use your phone or say that they are waiting for their parents, but something always feels off, especially since the children's eyes are all black with no white part visible at all. The children's appearance is usually described as somewhat normal, sometimes wearing clothes that sort of seem out of date. One detailed account involves an elderly couple and two mysterious children taking place in a snowy town in Vermont. Basically, one night during a pretty bad snowstorm, the couple heard three distinct knocks at their door. Upon opening the door, they were greeted by a young boy and a girl standing in the cold who politely asked if they could come in to wait for their parents. Despite feeling uncertain, the couple ended up welcoming them inside. The children settled on the couch as the wife prepared hot cocoa, trying to make them feel at home. Meanwhile, the husband attempted to engage them in conversation, but his questions were often met with silence. Returning with the drinks, the wife noticed their pet cat displaying fear and aggression towards their guest, which was an unusual behavior that raised her suspicious. It was when the children asked to use the restroom that the wife truly noticed that their eyes were completely black without any sign of white. This realization struck her with instant fear, and her husband, who was already distressed, revealed he was experiencing a sudden and unexplainable nosebleed. Then, all of a sudden, without warning, the house was plunged into darkness as the power went out, mirroring the deep blackness of the children's eyes. And amidst the blackout, the children calmly stated that their parents had arrived. They then left the house, and the wife, seeking to glimpse these parents, 
saw two tall, slender men waiting at the driveway. Despite a friendly gesture, they didn't respond and simply drove away with the children. After the children's departure, the power returned, but a series of disturbing events began to take place in their home. According to them, three of their four cats had disappeared, and the fourth was tragically found dead. The husband's health also started getting bad too, marked by continuous nosebleeds, which ultimately led to a diagnosis of aggressive skin cancer. Cow tipping Cow tipping is an urban legend that describes the purported activity of sneaking up on a sleeping or unsuspecting upright cow and then pushing it over for one's entertainment. This practice is generally considered a tall tale and is viewed as a stereotype of rural activities for fun. The concept of cow tipping actually developed in the 1970s with historical accounts dating back to the Roman Empire where tales of animals that can't get up if they fell were common. One version of the legend suggests that because cows sleep standing up, it's possible to approach and tip them over without the animals reacting. However, the thing is, cows only sleep lightly while standing up and are actually easily awakened. Instead, they lie down to sleep deeply and it's said that most cows weigh over 450 kilograms and can easily resist any lesser force. A 2005 study by zoologist Margot Lilly and her student Tracy Bossler at the University of British Columbia concluded that tipping a cow would require a force of nearly 3,000 newtons and is therefore impossible to accomplish by a single person. Their calculations showed that it would require more than four people to apply enough force to tip over a cow. Journalist Jake Steelhammer also noted that the myth of cow tipping probably originated in the 1970s and became more popular in the 1980s because of movies like Tommy Boy and Heathers, which featured cow tipping expeditions. Stories about cow tipping are often secondhand, told by someone who claims to know someone else who has done it, but not actually by individuals who have directly experienced it. Slenderman The Slenderman is a fictional character that emerged from the internet in 2009, created by Eric Knudsen, who is also known as Victor Surge, on the Something Awful forum. This character is portrayed as a tall, thin figure with a featureless face, wearing a black suit. Its origins lie in a Create Paranormal Images contest where Knudsen submitted two black and white images of groups of children with a tall, spectral figure in a black suit added to them alongside snippets of text that describe the abduction of the children. The proximity to the Slender Man is said to cause a slender sickness, which is then said to cause paranoia, nightmares, and nosebleeds. Originally targeting children or young adults in narratives, it's said that the Slender Man sometimes influences individuals to act on its behalf, which goes into the next part of this entry. The concept of proxies or humans under the Slender Man's control was popularized by the web series Marble Hornets. This series also introduced the idea of the Slender Man interfering with video and audio recordings. But the Slender Man legend took an even more darker turn in 2014 when two girls end up stabbing their classmate 19 times after luring her into a secluded area, claiming that they did it to appease Slenderman and become proxies. They believe that by committing a murder, it would allow them to live alongside him, and they also fear that failure to commit the murder would result in harm to their families. Thankfully though, the girl ended up surviving the attack, managing to crawl to an open area where she was discovered by a bicyclist. The severity of her injuries was such that she was only one millimeter away from death as it said that one of the stab wounds came really close to her heart. And both the girls who did it entered pleas of not guilty because of mental illness and ultimately accepted plea deals to avoid prison time and instead were committed to mental health institutions. If you guys want to read more about it, I do suggest it, it's an interesting case and yeah, I'll leave a link in the description. Hanako-san Hanako-san is a Japanese urban legend about the spirit of a young girl who haunts school toilets. The origins and details of the legend kind of vary, with some accounts saying Hanako-san was a World War II era girl killed during an air raid while playing hide and go seek, while others say she was murdered by a parent or a stranger, or even that she took her own life in a school toilet because of bullying. Physically, Hanako-san is often described as having a bobbed haircut and wearing a red skirt or dress. In terms of her nature, she's described as a yokai or yuri, which are types of spirits in Japanese folklore. 
To summon Hanukkah-san, it's said that one must knock three times on the third stall of a girl's toilet, usually on the third floor of a school, and then ask if she's present. In some versions of the story, Hanukkah-san's response can lead to some pretty bad consequences, like a bloody or ghostly hand appearing, the individual being pulled into the toilet, or even encountering a three-headed lizard. The whole thing kind of reminds me of a scene in Stranger Things, where a creature named Vecna appeared in a bathroom stall, which was pretty creepy looking back, and let me know if you guys know what I'm referring to. And the legend of Hanukkah-san dates back to the 1950s, and has since become a well-known urban legend associated with schools across Japan. Since the 1990s though, it's been gaining a lot of popularity, and it's been featured in a lot of films too. Colonel Buck's Cursed Tomb The legend of Colonel Jonathan Buck and the Witch's Curse originates from Bucksport, Maine, a town founded by Buck himself in 1763. This story centers around Buck's monumental gravestone, which is notable for an unusual stain resembling a boot. And the lore surrounding this stain basically comes from New England, where witchcraft was a big part of its early history. Colonel Buck, born in 1719 in Woolburn, Massachusetts, and later residing in Haverhill, moved to what is now Maine, establishing a settlement that eventually bore his name. His contributions to the area and his role in the Revolutionary War made him a really respected figure there. Following his death in 1795, his descendants erected a commemorative monument in 1852. The urban legend though that has persisted through the years first appeared in public consciousness in the late 19th century and involved Buck's alleged role as a judge condemning a woman to death for witchcraft. As the narrative goes, during her execution, the woman cursed Buck, proclaiming that a mark would appear on his gravestone as an eternal testament to what he did. She is quoted as saying, Jonathan Buck, listen to these words the last my tongue will utter. It is the spirit of the one and only true living God which bids me speak them to you. You will die soon. Over your grave they will erect a stone that all may know where your bones are crumbling to dust. But listen, upon that stone the imprint of my foot will appear, and for all time, long after you and your cursed race has vanished from this earth, will the people from far and near know that you murdered a woman. This curse, as legend has it, manifested as the boot-shaped stain on Bucks' gravestone, serving as the haunting reminder of the woman's death and Bucks' alleged involvement. And this tale has actually seen various iterations over time, with some versions suggesting that the woman was not a witch, but perhaps a wrong lover or an indigenous woman. And historical records don't really support the existence of any such trial or execution carried out by Buck, and no concrete evidence really links him to the practice of witchcraft accusations. The last known witch trials in New England occurred decades before Bucks' lifetime, predominantly during the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Also, it's said that the stain on Bucks' monument is probably natural, attributed to the properties of the stone and its interaction with the environment, rather than a supernatural curse. Killer in the Backsea The urban legend of the Killer in the Backsea, also known as High Beams, is a pervasive tale in the United States and Canada telling of a hidden assailant lying in wait for unsuspecting drivers. This story taps into deep-seated fears of vulnerability, especially when one is alone at night. The core narrative involves a woman driving home on a dark, deserted highway followed by a strange car that flashes its high beams, signaling danger lurking closer than she realizes. The essence of the legend unfolds as follows. After stopping at a gas station, a woman resumes her late-night journey home. Soon after though, she notices a car aggressively tailing her, flashing its high beams and even ramming her car. In a state of panic, she races to safety, only to discover upon reaching home that the pursuing driver was attempting to warn her of a more immediate threat, being a man with the axe hidden in her backseat. Variations of this tale include different methods by which the woman is alerted to the danger in her backseat, such as a gas station attendant noticing the killer when the woman stops for fuel, or just the killer revealing himself while the car is still in motion. Despite these variations though, the central element always remains the same that the killer's presence is in the backseat. The origin of this urban legend is kinda difficult to pinpoint, with documented references dating back to at least 1968. Killer Clowns The concept of killer clowns or evil clowns has its roots in the fear of clowns, known as colorphobia. 
This fear has been amplified by various cultural references and urban legends through the years. One key figure often associated with the fear of clowns is John Wayne Gacy, a serial killer who performed as Pogo the Clown at children's parties and other events. While Gacy didn't commit his crimes in his clown costume, his dual identity contributed to the sinister image of clowns in popular culture. Lethal clown trope has also been explored in various forms of media too, including literature, films, and television. Characters like the Joker from Batman and Pennywise from Stephen King's It have become iconic representations of these fears. These portrayals often depict clowns as psychopathic and deviant, which you know just adds to the fear of clowns in popular culture. Urban legend of evil clown sightings known as phantom clowns have also been reported in real life too. The first known incident was in 1981 in Brookline, Massachusetts, where children reported that men dressed as clowns had attempted to lure them into a van. This phenomenon resurfaced in various locations over the years, including Phoenix, Arizona in 1985, West Orange, New Jersey in 1991, and in several other places. These incidents often involve reports of clowns trying to kidnap children, although in most cases, these reports were made by children and were not confirmed by adults or police officers. In 2016, the killer clown craze emerged again, as costume individuals stood on street corners to scare passersby. To be honest, I personally was paranoid of the whole killer clown frenzy in 2016, since it was all over the place. I used to go down to the creek and stuff, and you know, I would just always be scared that a clown would just pop up. Kill Switch Kill Switch, reportedly released in 1989 by the Karvina Corporation in Czechoslovakia, is a game known for its self erasure feature after completion. A little background on the game, it offered players two characters, Gast, an invisible demon, and Portal, a human woman. And because of Gast's invisibility making navigation difficult, players primarily chose Portal. Basically, it's said that she wakes up in an abandoned coal mine, aiming to escape while encountering deceased co-workers and various demonic entities. The game unfolds in a mine under attack by demons and coal golems, with Porto discovering bodies of miners and facing demonic inspectors sent by the Sovatic Corporation. The plot involves industrial exploitation, hinted to critique Soviet industrial methods. To progress, players collect iron axes to decipher a code revealed by a character online as Porto881. This deciphered code leads Porto to ingest raw coke, enabling her to maintain a stable size and navigate the game's final levels. Upon reaching the surface, the game self-deletes, removing all files from a player's computer, prohibiting any replay or exploration of alternative narratives with Gast. Kill Switch gained authority for its ending and limited release, with claims of only 5,000 copies produced. The Carvina Corporation's statement on the game's design philosophy did little to quell the curiosity and frustration of players though interested by the mystery of Gast's relationship with Portal, suggested by the company referring to Gast as Portal's beloved. In 2005, a copy allegedly the last available was bought by Yamamoto Ryuichi for $733,000. Ryuichi planned to document his gameplay on YouTube but the only video reportedly uploaded showed him visibly distressed without any gameplay footage. Despite extensive searches, no concrete evidence of Killswitch's existence has been verified. The story originated from the Invisible Games blog, known for fictional tales, with suspicions pointing to author Catherine M. Valente as the creator. Carvina Corporation's existence, like the games, also remains unconfirmed, with no records of the company or its supposed other games found. Monkey Man of Delhi The Monkey Man of Delhi, also known as Kalabandar, is an urban legend from India that emerged in mid-2001. The legend basically began when residents of Delhi started reporting attacks and sightings of this creature. People claimed that the monkey man would appear at night, often jumping from building to building and sometimes just attacking random people. The descriptions varied though, with some saying it had a more monkey-like appearance while others suggested it was more robotic or even alien. The panic surrounding the monkey man was also really significant. It led to widespread fear, with people avoiding going out at night and taking extra precautions to keep their homes secure. This ended up causing the authorities to be overwhelmed with calls and reports about the creature, 
leading to police patrols and even special task forces to investigate the phenomenon. The legend led to over 350 reported sightings and around 60 injuries as people panicked and even hurt themselves in fear of attacks. Tragically, there were also reports of people dying from falls while trying to escape from what they believed to be the monkey man. Some speculated that the phenomenon might have been a case of mass hysteria, possibly triggered by the settings of unusually large monkeys or other animals. Others believe it could have even been a prank that ended up spiraling way out of control and, you know, ended up causing the lives of some. Nain Rouge The Nain Rouge, which translates to Red Dwarf in English, is a creature from French and American folklore, particularly associated with Detroit, Michigan. Originating as a figure believed to be a harbinger of doom, the Nine Rouge is depicted in legends as a small, childlike entity with distinct red or black fur boots and notable for its blazing red eyes and rotten teeth. Historically, the Nine Rouge is reputed to have assaulted Antoine de la Motte Cadillac, the founder of Detroit, in 1701, an event believed to have led to Cadillac's eventual downfall. Additionally, it said that the creature was always seen before, you know, bad events in the city's history, such as the Battle of Bloody Run in 1763, where it was said to have danced on the banks of the Detroit River, which had turned red with blood, and even the devastating fire of 1805 that raised most of Detroit. Other reported sightings include an encounter before General William Hall's surrender during the War of 1812 and various individual reports throughout the 19th and 20th centuries describing attacks or sightings resembling the Nine Rouge. In contemporary times, the legend of the Nine Rouge has sort of transformed. Since 2010, the Marche de Nine Rouge has been celebrated annually in Detroit, where community members parade to banish the imp from the city for another year. The event ends up drawing thousands of people and includes a ceremony where an effigy of the Nine Rouge is destroyed, symbolically protecting the city from evil. Paul is Dead The Paul is Dead conspiracy theory is an urban legend suggesting that Paul McCartney of the Beatles died in 1966 and was replaced by a lookalike. This rumor started circulating in 1966 and gained traction in September 1969 mainly on American college campuses. According to the theory, McCartney supposedly died in a car crash, and to spare the public from grief, the remaining Beatles replaced him with the lookalike. This secret was then subtly communicated through elements of Beatles songs and album artwork. Fans and conspiracy theorists point out various clues, like messages heard when playing songs backward and symbolic interpretations of lyrics and album covers. One notable claim was that McCartney argued with his bandmates during a Sgt. Pepper recording session, drove away angrily, and was involved in a fatal car crash. Alleged clues included the Abbey Road album cover, where McCartney is seen barefoot and out of step with the other Beatles, and even the Magical Mystery Tour album, where McCartney is depicted with a differently colored flower compared to the others. Also, phrases like I Buried Paul, supposedly heard in the song Strawberry Fields Forever, and back mass messages in Revolution 9 and I'm So Tired were cited as evidence for this. Despite widespread popularity though and the intrigue it generated, the theory has been consistently debunked and McCartney himself has refuted it over the years. Puckwedgies the Pukwudgie is a creature from Wampanoag folklore, standing 2-3 to three feet tall with human-like features, but distinguished by its enlarged noses, figures, and ears. Its skin is often described as smooth grey and is sometimes said to glow. Originating from Native American lore, Pukwudgies possess several abilities including appearing and disappearing at will, transforming into a porcupine-like creature, attacking humans, using magic, and creating fire spontaneously. They're also known to control the souls of those they have killed, referred to as Te Pawankas. Traditionally, Native Americans advised against interacting with Pugwidgees because of their mischievous and dangerous nature. Initially friendly to humans, their relationship soured, leading Pugwidgees to commit acts such as kidnapping, murder, and causing general mayhem. Shotgun Man the urban legend of the shotgun man revolves around a figure alleged to have been active in Chicago, Illinois in the 1910s. 
He is basically believed to have been an assassin and spree killer, connected to murders attributed to the Black Hand, which is a Sicilian organized crime syndicate. His way of operating was both simple and pretty terrifying, being he would drive by his targets and mercilessly gun them down with a shotgun, usually at night. The randomness and brutality of these acts caused widespread fear among the residents. Notably, the shotgun man is believed to have killed 15 Italian immigrants between January 10th and March 1911 in a violent Italian immigrant neighborhood known as Death Corner in Chicago's Little Sicily. Despite numerous eyewitnesses to these killings, the Chicago police never succeeded in identifying the murderer. It was speculated that he was well known within the Italian community, but the Black Hand's political influence likely deterred residents from exposing him. His fate still remains a mystery as he seemingly vanished from Little Italy shortly before the Prohibition era, around the same time the Black Hand's extortion operations had declined. Teke 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 is a Japanese urban legend about the ghost of a schoolgirl who tragically fell onto a railway line and was cut in half by train. This legend is mainly prevalent in Japan and is known for its chilling details and the ghost's overall vengeful nature. The story goes that the schoolgirl, who was often portrayed as timid and frequently the subject of practical jokes, met her untimely death at a train station. In one account, her friends placed a cicada on her shoulder, startling her so much that she fell onto the tracks and was severed in half by a speeding train. This tragic incident transformed her into Teke Teke, a vengeful ghost haunting train stations and urban areas, especially at night. Teke Teke, now as a ghost, is depicted as moving around with her upper body using her elbows or hands, making a Teke Teke sound as she moves. In some versions of the story, Teke Teke wields a scythe or a similar sharp instrument, using it to cut her victims in half, just as she was. The legend of Teke Teke is rooted in the broader category of Onryo in Japanese folklore, which represent vengeful spirit, and these spirits are often female and seek revenge for injustices they suffered in life. The Vanishing Lady The Vanishing Lady is a classic urban legend with several variations across the world, but it typically follows a similar pattern. The story often takes place in a hotel or a similar setting and involves two women, usually a mother and a daughter, traveling together. As the tale goes, one of the women, often the mother, becomes really ill and the daughter goes out to get medicine. When she returns, not only is her mother missing, but the hotel staff deny any knowledge of the mother's existence at all. In one of the more well-known versions of the story, the two women are traveling tourists. After the mother falls ill, the daughter leaves her in their hotel room to seek medical help. And upon returning, she finds the room completely different and there's no sign of her mother at all. The hotel staff, including the manager, claim that the daughter arrived alone and that there's no record of her mother ever being there. Desperate and confused, the daughter searches for her mother to no avail. As the story unfolds, it's often revealed that the mother had died of a contagious disease and the hotel, fearing a tarnish to the reputation and a panic among the guests, had hidden the body and covered up her existence. The daughter, now left bewildered and distraught, is left to question her sanity and the reality of her mother's disappearance. Flatwoods Monster The Flatwoods Monster, also known as the Braxton County Monster or the Phantom of Flatwoods, is a famous American urban legend and alleged extraterrestrial sighting. The story originates from the town of Flatwoods in Braxton County, West Virginia, and dates back to September 12, 1952. According to the legend, a group of local kids, led by brothers Edward and Fred May and their friend Tommy Heyer, witnessed a bright object cross the sky and land on a nearby farm. Accompanied by Kathleen May, the mother of Edward and Fred, and a few others, they went to investigate. And as they approached the site, they reportedly saw a large, pulsating ball of fire in a thick mist that made their eyes and noses burn. What they saw after though was described as being at least 7 feet tall with a black body and a dark glowing face. Witnesses reported that the creature had large non-human eyes and a head shaped like a spade or ace of spades which is often attributed to a hood or a helmet. 
entity was also described as making a sort of hissing sound and even seemed to glide towards them, which caused the group to run away in fear. Following this encounter, the story of the Flatwoods monster quickly spread, attracting attention from both the media and UFO enthusiasts. While some believed it to be an alien or supernatural being, skeptics suggested more earthly explanations, like an owl or a meteorological event being misinterpreted in a state of panic. Night Marchers Night Marchers, which come from Hawaiian mythology, are considered the ghosts of ancient Hawaiian warriors. They're believed to march in groups led by a sacred king or chiefess, particularly on nights dedicated to certain Hawaiian gods. Emerging from the burial sites or the ocean, these warriors march to ancient battle sites or sacred places, floating above the ground, leaving no trace of their passage. Characterized by their warrior attire, night marchers are described as carrying spears, clubs, beating war drums, and blowing conch shells. Their appearance, though, is a forewarning of a great misfortune. They march after sunset until just before sunrise, accompanied by chanting, conch cell sounds, and the odor of death. And the night marchers are said to be invisible to the living except on special occasions, like escorting a dying relative to the spirit world. Looking upon or showing disrespect towards the night marchers though is said to result in death. Tradition suggests that lying motionless, face down, shows the required respect to avoid their wrath. Ancestral recognition by a marcher can also spare individuals, with the protector calling out Nau to claim them and prevent harm. To keep night marchers at bay, it's believed that planting living tea plants around one's home can also protect against their visitation. The behaviors and customs of night marchers kind of vary with the preferences of the honored leader, ranging from musical processions to silent marchers. The taboo of looking at sacred body parts of a king or chief is strictly observed, with penalties for violation including instant death by supernatural means. Also, the configuration of the march indicates which parts of the leader should not be viewed. Night marchers may also include Hawaiian gods in the ranks, signified by brighter torches. The presence of gods and specific configurations of torches and deities are detailed in the lore, with particular emphasis on the significance of the number 5 and the inclusion of specific goddesses such as Hiaka. Skinwalkers Skinwalkers, also known as Yi Nad Loshi in the Navajo language, which translates to with it he goes on all fours, are part of Navajo legend. These beings are essentially the witches who possess the supernatural ability to transform into, possess, or disguise themselves as animals. Skinwalkers basically represent a corruption of the positive role that medicine men and women play in the community. They're believed to be individuals, often former healers or medicine men, who have basically turned to the dark side. It's said that they use their powers for evil purposes, such as inflicting pain, spreading disease, and even causing various misfortunes. By night, they transform into animals like wolves, coyotes, or bears, and they're said to be nearly impossible to kill except with a bullet or knife dipped in white ash. Navajo people are typically reluctant to even discuss skinwalkers with outsiders, partly because speaking about these beings is considered bad luck and feared to increase the likelihood of their appearance. This secrecy is also a means of protecting their cultural beliefs and practices from misinterpretation or exploitation by non-natives. Skinwalkers are not only part of folklore though, there's also been numerous modern reports and sightings. One notable location associated with skinwalker activity is the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, which has been the site of various unexplained events, including UFO sightings, cattle mutilations, and encounters with large, unidentified creatures. The ranch has basically attracted the attention of researchers and has since been featured in various documentaries and popular media. Skunk Ape The skunk ape, which is a creature from North American folklore, is particularly prominent in the southeastern United States, especially Florida. Often compared to Bigfoot, the skunk ape is described as a large, hairy, human-like being inhabiting forests and swamps. Its most distinctive characteristic, as its name suggests, is a foul odor similar to a skunk, believed to be a mix of swamp gas and poor hygiene. 
Standing over six and a half feet tall and weighing around 450 pounds, the skunk ape is typically covered in brown or red hair. Notably, it also has only four toes, and its shaggy hair more closely resembles that of an orangutan than a gorilla. And sightings of the skunk ape actually date back centuries, with Native American tribes reporting encounters long before European settlers even arrived. These tribes revered the creature as a protector of the woods, calling it Este Kapkaki, or the tall man, believed to possess mystic powers and a vigilant gaze over the forest. Modern sightings gained traction in the 20th century though, with the first well-known encounter occurring in 1957 when hunters in the Everglades reported a gigantic smelly ape invading their camp. This incident and the subsequent ones like a family witnessing a skunk ape chasing a child in 1973 and another family hitting one with their car in 1974 have all contributed to the creature's legend. Melon Heads the legend of melon heads comes from parts of the United States, mostly in the states of Ohio, Michigan, and Connecticut. These legends tell of small humanoids with oversized heads resembling melons, hence their name. The melon heads are often depicted as reclusive, hiding in forested areas, and are sometimes associated with strange and creepy behavior. The origin stories of the melon heads kind of vary by region but they often contain elements of tragedy, signs gone wrong, and isolation. One common version, particularly in Ohio, suggests that the melon heads were originally orphans or children with hydrocephalus, a medical condition that causes swelling of the head. It's said that they were then subjected to cruel experiments by a doctor, which led to their deformities and strange behaviors. Eventually, they escaped or were released into the woods, where they continue to live, hidden from society. In Connecticut though, the legend involves a similar group of children with hydrocephalus, which were mistreated and eventually released or escaped into the wilderness. Michigan's version of the melon heads though often ties them to the felt mansion area near Saugatuck and Holland. The story suggests that they were once housed in an asylum near the mansion, which they actually escaped from and now lurk in the surrounding forest. Despite the variations though, the tales of melon heads are unified in their portrayal of these beings as outcasts, often the result of inhumane treatment and societal rejection. Bandage Man of Cannon Beach The Bandage Man of Cannon Beach is an urban legend originating from the coastal town of Cannon Beach in Oregon, United States. This tale has been part of local lore since the 1960s, and according to the legend, the bandage man is a ghostly figure wrapped entirely in bandages, much like a mummy. He is said to emit a foul smell of rotting flesh, and the most common version of the story tells of the bandage man appearing on a stretch of road just outside of Cannon Beach, often during stormy nights. He is said to prey on unsuspecting motorists, particularly teenagers parked or driving along the road. The legend describes him as suddenly appearing in the backseat of vehicles, terrifying the occupants before disappearing just before the car reaches the town or just when the vehicle crosses a bridge. One of the more disturbing elements of the bandage man legend though is that he set to leave behind pieces of his moldy bandages in the car he haunts. Some versions of the story even claim that he has been known to break windows or damage the vehicles he appears in. The origins of the bandage man aren't really clear though with several theories and no definite answer. Some believe he was a logger who was injured in a horrific accident and then wrapped in bandages, only to die before receiving help. Others speculate that he might have been a victim of some terrible crime or a patient who escaped from a nearby asylum. Barbara O'Brien's Operators Operators and Things, The Inner Life of a Schizophrenic is a memoir written by Barbara O'Brien, a pseudonym for an author who experienced a six-month psychotic break during the 1950s. The book, originally published in 1958, offers a rare and insightful look into the mind of someone suffering from schizophrenia. In the memoir, O'Brien describes waking up one day to find herself in a world populated by operators who she perceived as people in control, pulling the strings of power and influence, and things, the puppets they manipulated and exploited. Barbara O'Brien's account is noted for its vivid portrayal of her mental state during this period. 
Her narrative provides a unique perspective on the experience of living with schizophrenia, capturing the confusion, fear, and altered reality that can accompany the condition. Cropsy The urban legend of Cropsy, which originates from Staten Island, New York in the 1970s, is a tale that has had some different variations throughout the years. But the general thing is Cropsy is often seen as a menacing figure preying on children, with the story evolving and adapting to local fears and respective folklore of the area. In one specific iteration of the legend which we'll be focusing on, Cropsy is described as a mentally unstable man who kidnaps children to replace his own lost son. This version portrays him as a grief-stricken father turned sinister, stealing children as substitutes for his own. Another portrayal of Cropsy casts him as a disfigured camp counselor seeking revenge. This variant aligns more with the archetype of a wronged individual returning to enact vengeance, which is a common theme in many urban legends and horror stories. But maybe the most terrifying depiction of Cropsy is probably as a homicidal madman being an escaped mental patient with the hook for a hand, and it's said this version hunts children and drags them into the tunnels beneath the ruins of the old Seaview Hospital, a former sanitarium. And the legend of Cropsy was given a sort of reality with the crimes of Andre Rand. Basically, in the late 20th century, Rand was convicted of kidnapping and allegedly murdering children in Stanton Island, which eerily echoes the Cropsy legend and is really disturbing. Goody Cole Goody Cole, formerly known as Eunice Goody Cole, is a figure that comes from the history and folklore of Hampton, New Hampshire. Her story is a reminder of America's history with witch trials, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, and which actually predates the more famous Salem witch trials by several decades. Basically, the story goes that Eunice Cole was accused of witchcraft multiple times during her life in the 17th century. In 1656, though, specifically, is when she was officially convicted of witchcraft in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and spent several years in jail thereafter. The term goody, short for good wife, was a common title used for women of lower social standings and sort of became attached to her name. According to local legend, Goody Cole was blamed for a variety of misfortunes that befell the Hampton community, from deaths and illnesses to filled crops and other unexplained phenomena. These accusations were typical of the superstitions and fears that fueled the witchcraft hysteria of the era. After her death, the legend of Goody Cole continued to just grow. She became a figure in local folklore and she was often invoked in ghost stories and tales of hauntings. It was said that her spirit basically lingered, bearing a grudge against the town and its inhabitants for persecution. And in 1938, in a gesture of sort of reconciliation, the town of Hampton officially exonerated Goody Cole of witchcraft, and even a memorial was established in her honor. This act was as much about healing the wounds of the past as it was about correcting historical wrongs, so that's something to add to the legend. Clinton Road Clinton Road in New Jersey has a lot of eerie legends and ghost stories associated with it, and is one of the most intriguing alleged haunted roads in America. One of the most well-known legends concerns a bridge near its infamous Dead Man's Curve, where a ghostly boy is said to return coins to those who leave them. This tale sort of varies, but some versions portray the boy as a benevolent spirit saving people from accidents. Another legend, though, involves phantom vehicles, mainly the ghost of a teenage girl who died in a Camaro crash on Clinton Road in 1988. It's said that mentioning her while driving on the road at night might provoke a spectacle encounter. Another thing about Clinton Road is the reports of strange creatures, possibly coming from legends of albinos living in the woods or even some cryptids. People have reported seeing bizarre, unidentifiable animals or creatures that don't resemble any known wildlife in the area. Even some mysterious lights and unexplained vehicles have been reported, so you can see how there's a lot to this area. Travelers have recounted stories of headlights from vehicles that seem to appear from nowhere, tailgating them aggressively only to disappear without any trace. Although these are urban legends though, Clinton Road 
extends more beyond the supernatural. It's also had a history of being a site for illegal activities, including the dumping of evidence in crimes. One notable instance was the discovery of a body near the road in the 1980s, which was linked to a hitman known as the Iceman. Sheep Squatch The Sheep Squatch is a cryptid reported mainly in the rural regions of West Virginia, known as a mix of a sheep and a Sasquatch. It's described as a tall creature covered in shaggy white hair with long ram-like horns, and sightings of the Sheep Squatch have been reported all the way since the mid-1990s. These encounters were said to be across Boone, Kanawha, Putnam, and Mason counties in West Virginia. The earliest notable sightings date back to 1994, including an account by a group of women driving near West Virginia's TNT area, which you might know is an area noted for its Mothman sightings. The women reported encountering a large, white-haired creature with a sheep-like head and horns. In the same year too, a former Navy seaman near Bethel Church Road in Mason County reported seeing a similar creature drinking from a creek. This creature was described as walking on all fours with four limbs resembling hands rather than paws and even emitting a sulfuric odor. And throughout the 1990s, sightings continued on, including a 1995 report of a couple in a car being attacked by a white, bear-like creature with a horned, four-eyed head. Even in 1999, campers in Boone County claimed to have been chased by a large, white creature emanating a sort of otherworldly scream. More recent accounts include a 2015 report from Fox Run, Virginia, where campers described encountering a large, white bipedal creature resembling a dog. The creature was reportedly frightened off by a distinct shriek in the forest. HIV Attacks Urban legends relate to HIV attacks often revolved around the fear and misinformation surrounding the virus, which is mostly in the context of transmission. One of the most pervasive stories from the 1990s is the pin prick attack. According to this myth, a person visiting a cinema or nightclub feels a slight prick on their arm, only to later find a badge or sticker with the message, welcome to the AIDS club, and subsequently testing positive for HIV. This narrative, which echoes the AIDS Mary legends of the 1980s, has actually been widely dismissed as a hoax by health authorities, including the Center for Disease Control, which has never actually confirmed a case of HIV transmission in this manner. A variation of this legend features a young woman being picked up by AIDS Harry, who leaves her with a similar fate, often symbolized by a miniature coffin or a mug inscribed with a foreboding message about AIDS. And another legend involves unsuspecting victims being pricked by HIV-infected needles hidden in places like gas pump handles or even payphones. While these tales have largely been debunked, I guess they contribute to a heightened sense of vigilance and fear about the disease. But I want to add, in a few isolated cases such as the attack on a prison officer by an HIV-infected inmate or even a physician deliberately infecting a lover with HIV, I guess there is some reality to this urban legend. 10% of the brain The 10% of the brain myth, which you've probably for sure heard, suggests that humans only use 10% of their brain capacity, which likely originated from the reverse energy theories of Harvard psychologists William James and Boris Sidis in the 1890s. James suggested that people only meet a fraction of their full mental potential, a claim that has evolved over time. The concept basically gained popularity in the self-help movement of the 1920s. An advertisement from the 1929 World Almanac included a line stating that scientists and psychologists believed we only use 10% of our brain power. Then in 1936, this idea was later popularized by Lowell Thomas in the foreword to Dale Carnage's book How to Win Friends and Influence People where it was said that Thomas inaccurately quoted William James, saying that the average person develops only 10% of their latent mental ability. Another theory suggests that the myth arose from a misunderstanding or even a misrepresentation of neurological research in the late 19th or early 20th century. For instance, the complexity of brain regions and the subtle effects of damage led early neurologists to question the functions of certain areas. Also, the brain was found to consist mostly of glial cells, which seemed to have minor functions. 
and even the misunderstanding of the function of local neurons may have all contributed to this myth. But yeah, it's now considered a myth. Coca-Cola dissolves teeth. The urban legend that Coca-Cola can dissolve a tooth overnight is a widely circulated, but like the last entry, largely considered a false notion. Basically, Coca-Cola, like many other acidic drinks, does contain acids like citric acid and phosphoric acid, which do have the potential to contribute to tooth decay and erosion, especially with frequent consumption. However, the thing is, the idea that these acids can like completely dissolve a tooth overnight isn't too accurate. This myth may have originated from classic science experiments conducted in schools, where teachers would demonstrate the effects of various liquids on organic matter. Coca-Cola was often used in these experiments to test acidity, leading to the misconception that it has a rapid, powerful dissolving effect. Despite the acidic content though, Coca-Cola can dissolve a tooth overnight. Scientific studies have shown that tooth decay and erosion occur over time, mainly because of the combination of sugar and acids in foods and drinks, not just Coca-Cola. Regular and prolonged exposure to these substances can weaken tooth enamel and lead to decay, but this is for sure a far cry from the immediate and dramatic effect implied by the myth. And think about it, if everyone was drinking Coca-Cola and it was dissolving teeth, we'd for sure know by now. Home Intruder Poses as a Clown Statue So this one is actually pretty creepy. It's an urban legend about a baby sister who finds herself in a house with the creepy clown statue. In the story, a wealthy couple in Newport Beach, California, hires a teenage girl to babysit their two young children. The parents instruct the babysitter to watch TV in their bedroom after putting the kids to bed as the children have been having nightmares. As the babysitter settles in to watch TV in the parents' bedroom, she notices a clown statue in the corner of the room. Initially, she tries to ignore it, but the statue's eerie appearance and the feeling that it's staring at her becomes increasingly unsettling. Feeling more and more uneasy, the babysitter eventually decides to call the parents to ask if she can watch TV downstairs because the clown statue is, you know, creeping her out. When she mentions the clown statue, the father on the phone responds with alarm, instructing her to take the children and leave the house immediately as they don't have a clown statue. The babysitter then quickly gathers the children and flees the house. Shortly after, the police arrive and find a man dressed in a clown suit in the upstairs bedroom, along with the concealed knife in his costume. It's said that the man turns out to be a mentally disturbed, small person who was a convicted murderer and had been stalking the family for months, hiding in their attic and sneaking around the house at night. This urban legend has basically been widely circulated and has many variations. But yeah, that variation was a pretty widely known one. Corpses in water tanks. So this urban legend might seem like, you know, it's not true or it hasn't happened, but it does have real life parallel. The most notable instance that brought this urban legend to reality happened in 2013 at the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. Basically, the hotel guests started complaining about strange tasting and discolored water. When the hotel staff inspected the water tanks, they were horrified to find the decomposing body of Elisa Lam, a young woman who had been missing for several weeks. The circumstances surrounding Lam's death remain a mystery though. Her behavior in elevator footage captured shortly before her disappearance can be seen, you know, in YouTube and stuff, and it's pretty mysterious. The video shows her entering and exiting the elevator multiple times making hand gestures in the hallway outside and appearing to hide in the elevator. This footage sparked a bunch of theories since people suggested that Lam, who suffered from bipolar disorder, might have been experiencing a psychotic episode, which might have caused what happened. Others speculate though, you know, that something bad happened and maybe there was foul play at hand. This incident has sparked a bunch of fictional adaptions in TV shows and movies, and you know, it's pretty creepy thinking that they were drinking that water, I don't know. But yeah, the story of Alyssa Lam in particular has been cited as an instance where an urban legend type scenario actually occurred in real life. And yeah, it's just overall a really sad story. Drugs and Halloween Candy So this entry is about the urban legend of drugs or poison in Halloween candy. 
This fear has been around for decades, I'd say, but extensive research has shown that cases of actual tampering with Halloween candy are exceptionally rare. One of the most infamous examples often cited is the 1974 case of Ronald Clark O'Brien in Deer Park, Texas, who poisoned his own son's Halloween candy with cyanide. O'Brien's motive was to claim life insurance money, and he also gave poison candy to other children to cover up his crime. However, this was an isolated incident and not a random act of violence against trick-or-treaters. The children, other than his son, didn't consume the poison treats, and O'Brien was later executed for his crime. Sociologist Joel Best, who has studied the phenomenon of contaminated candy since the 1980s, emphasizes that there's no documented case of a child being killed or seriously hurt by contaminated treats from trick-or-treating. The fear of poison candy increased the Tylenol murders in 1982 though, where painkillers laced with cyanide led to the deaths of 7 people. However, this didn't result in a wave of Halloween poisonings. Bess's research spanning back to 1958 has yet to uncover a single case of a child harmed this way. In 2013, there was a case of a college student arrested for having 40 pounds of homemade candy laced with marijuana. However, this candy was not intended for children, but was actually being sold to adults. So this incident, while it was alarming, didn't represent a widespread threat to trick-or-treaters. Fatal Fair the urban legend of the Fatal Fair is a Japanese tale involving a taxi driver and a mysterious woman. In this story, the taxi driver basically picks up a seemingly disturbed woman who gives him a series of complex directions, leading him through various streets and towns. As the journey becomes longer though, the driver grows annoyed and asks how much further they have to go. The woman cryptically responds, you shall soon see. When the driver turns around to look at her, she suddenly vanishes, leaving him just moments to avoid crashing off a cliff. The origin of the story is sometimes linked to a distraught woman who, in trying to reach the hospital to see her dying daughter, fails because of traffic delay and ultimately throws herself off a cliff. The legend suggests that she now spends eternity enacting justice on taxi drivers. Another version of the story mentions that the passenger takes the taxi from a hospital to a desolate cemetery and disappears after reaching there. These variations of the Fatal Fair urban legend are pretty chilling tales for taxi drivers and those who frequently travel late at night. The story basically taps into fear of the unknown and the supernatural, which are common themes in many urban legends, especially those from Japan. Bunyip The Bunyip is a mythical creature from Australian Aboriginal lore, which is known for its mysterious and often frightening nature. Generally, the Bunyip is depicted as a large creature with supernatural attributes, inhabiting swamps, billabongs, creeks, riverbeds, and waterholes. The physical characteristics attributed to the Bunyip are pretty diverse and often contradictory, ranging from a dog-like face, dark fur, flippers, a duck-like bill, to even more bizarre features. Some stories describe it as having a roaring cry and being ferocious in nature, being capable of sneaking up on unwary travelers and devouring them. Other accounts depict the Bunyip as more benign, but still mysterious. And the Bunyip plays a significant role in Aboriginal mythology, often serving as a cautionary tale. It's sometimes used to warn children about the dangers of playing near the water and to teach them to be wary of unknown creatures. The Bunyip's habitat in waterways also reflects the importance of these natural resources in Aboriginal culture, as well as the dangers they can present. During the 19th century, as Europeans settled in Australia, the Bunyip began to be feared in their tales and newspapers, and was often sensationalized as a strange and terrifying monster from the Australian wilderness. Various sightings and discoveries of the Bunyip were reported, some with alleged evidence like bones or sketches but these often turned out to be misidentifications or hoaxes. Mongolian Deathworm The Mongolian Deathworm, known in Mongolia as Olgoi Kurkhoi, or Large Intestine Worm, is a creature said to inhabit the Gobi Desert. This cryptid first gained Western attention through Roy Chapin Andrews' 1926 book On the Trail of Ancient Man. Andrews described it based on second-hand accounts from Mongolian officials who firmly believed in its existence, although none had actually seen it. 
The worm is described as a sausage shaped creature about two feet long without a head or legs. It's believed to be extremely poisonous with mere touch leading to instant death and supposedly dwells in the desert's most desolate parts. According to Mongolian legend, the death worm lives in burrows underground, occasionally surfacing and is capable of killing at a distance by either spraying venom or through electric discharge. It creates visible waves of sand on the surface as it moves and the creature is said to primarily inhabit the western or southern parts of the Gobi. Doll that grows human hair. The legend of the doll that grows human hair centers around Okiko Nigyo, a human shaped doll from Japan. In 1918, Akichi Suzuki bought this doll for his two year old sister, Okiku. The doll, dressed in traditional kimono, quickly became Okiku's beloved companion. Tragically, though, the young girl died from a high fever in 1919. Following her death, the family noticed that the doll's hair, initially styled short, began to grow, eventually reaching 10 inches. Believing Okiku's spirit resided in the doll, the family placed it in the Menenji Temple, where it remains now. Remarkably, scientific examination purportedly confirmed the hair to be that of a human child. The temple monks periodically trimmed the doll's hair, adhering to a belief that this aligns with the doll's wishes. Okiki Ningyo has since become a subject of fascination, with many people visiting the temple to witness its legendary human hair, although photography of the doll is not permitted. Baba Yaga Baba Yaga, who is a figure from Slavic folklore, is seen as an old woman, sometimes cruel and fearsome, and is known to eat children and at other times as a kind helper to heroes. Her ambiguous nature is part of her character, making her neither wholly good nor evil. The name Baba Yaga varies in meaning across Slavic languages, typically relating to the term grandmother or old woman. Baba is a common term in these languages, while Yaga has more uncertain etymology, with some suggesting linking it to words meaning horror or witch. Baba Yaga's attributes include a magical, chicken-legged hut that can turn and move, and she's often seen flying in a mortar, wielding a pestle, or using a broom to erase her tracks. This choice of tools is thought to be influenced by pagan rituals involving women. Another notable feature is her overall appearance, which includes things like a bony leg or iron teeth. Inside her hut, she stretches across the space, her nose often touching the ceiling, and you know, just has an overall eerie and repulsive demeanor. Gasha Dukuro The Gasha Dukuro, a figure from Japanese folklore, is a spirit that manifests as a gigantic skeleton, towering over 10 meters tall and composed of the skulls of people who perished in battle. This entity is said to roam at night, mainly at 2 a.m., preying on humans. Despite super great size, the Gashi do Kuro is known for its stealth and can even become invisible. It's said that when a Gashi do Kuro approaches, it makes a clattering sound with its teeth, but it can also be silent when hunting humans. These spirits are believed to be invincible and are thought to be created from the bones of people who died with strong feelings of anger or hunger which linger after death. The Gashi do Kuro will continue hunting its prey until its pent up anger is released, causing the bones to crumble and the spirit to collapse. One of the earliest myths of the Gashi do Kuro dates back to the 10th century and involved the samurai Tara na Masakado. Tara na Masakado was a powerful figure in the high end period of Japan and was known for his rebellion against the central government in Kyoto. His insurrection, though initially successful, ultimately led to his demise. According to legend, the violent battles and numerous deaths resulting from Masakado's rebellion had a significant supernatural consequence. The unburied bodies of the fallen soldiers who had died in pain and bitterness were left to decay in the fields. Their vengeful spirits filled with anger and a sense of betrayal were ultimately unable to find peace. These restless souls eventually congregated, merging into the colossal skeletal form of the Gashi do Koro, and that's how the legend basically started. Shadow People Shadow people, also known as shadow figures or black masses, 
are perceived as patches of shadow taking humanoid forms. Martin believes in shadow people were popularized by the late night radio talk show Coast to Coast AM where listeners submitted drawings of shadow people they had seen. Heidi Hollis, who is an author on the topic, describes them as dark silhouettes with human shapes flickering in and out of peripheral vision. Some people report these figures attempting to jump on their chest and choke them. Hollis believes there's, you know, some sort of negative aliens that can be repelled by invoking the name of Jesus. The name of shadow people is also debated, with some believing them to be evil, helpful, or just neutral. Some even speculate that they could be extra-dimensional inhabitants of another universe. McMinnville UFO Photographs the McMinnville UFO photographs taken by Paul and Evelyn Trent near their farm outside Sheridan, Oregon in 1950 are some of the most famous images of a UFO. These photos were reprinted in Life magazine and newspaper nationwide, sparking a lot of interest and debate. While many UFO skeptics consider the photographs a hoax, UFOlogists argue they depict a genuine, three-dimensional unidentified flying object. Evelyn Trant noticed a slow-moving metallic dish-shaped object while walking back to her farmhouse and called for her husband, who managed to take two photos before it sped away. Initially, the Trants thought the object was a secret military aircraft and feared repercussions from the photos. However, after showing them to a local banker, the photos gained a lot of public attention. A local newspaper reporter, Bill Powell, found no evidence of tampering with the negatives, and the story was then subsequently published. The images have since become iconic in UFO folklore, representing some of the best photographic evidence of UFOs. Devil's Tower The Devil's Tower is a geological feature that rises dramatically from the Black Hills near Hewlett and Sundance in northeastern Wyoming. One of the most well-known legends associated with Devil's Tower comes from the Lakota, Sioux, and other Plains tribes. They tell the story of seven little girls who were being chased by a giant bear. As the bear was about to catch them, the girls jumped onto a small rock. They prayed to the rock to save them and the rock began to rise from the ground, lifting the girls higher and higher. The bear then clawed at the sides of the rising rock, leaving deep grooves in its sides, which are said can still be seen today as the vertical striations on the sides of Devil's Tower. Eventually, the girls were lifted to the sky, where they became the constellation known as the Pleiades. Another version of the legend from the Kiowa tribe tells of a group of girls who played near the river and were chased by several giant bears. The girls jumped on a low rock and prayed for help. As the bears were about to reach them, the rock grew towards the heavens, saving the girls. The marks of the bears' claws are said to be the vertical columns on Devil's Tower, and you can see how these versions are basically very very similar. Hello Kitty Murder The Hello Kitty Murder case is a really gruesome real life incident that occurred in Hong Kong in 1999. Fan Man Ye, a 23-year-old nightclub hostess, was abducted, tortured, and killed by three men and a girl after she stole a wallet from a frequent customer. Her decapitated body was mutilated, with her skull being placed inside a Hello Kitty mermaid plush, leading to the case's name. Fan Man Yi had faced a troubled life, being abandoned by her family and raised in an orphanage, later returning to drugs and prostitution before trying to change her life for the sake of her son. The details here are really gruesome so I won't get too much into detail, but the case basically culminated in a trial where the three men were convicted of manslaughter as the jury could not confirm whether Fan was murdered or died from a drug overdose. The Hello Kitty murder has since become a dark part of Hong Kong's criminal history and has, you know, inspired a lot of cultural references including films and books. So if you guys want to read more about it, you know, you guys can, but yeah, it's pretty gruesome to talk about. Boy Scout Lane Boy Scout Lane, a reportedly haunted road in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, has had a fair share of its, you know, urban legends. The road itself is an isolated, dead-end street surrounded by dense forests, and the legend associated with it actually has some variations, which each add to its, you know, overall eerie reputation. The most common version of the legend, though, tells of a group of Boy Scouts 
who embarked on a trip down this road many years ago. The story goes that the boys never returned from their expedition. Over the years, different iterations of what might have happened to them have surfaced. One version suggests that the boys were killed by their bus driver or a chaperone on their way to a camping trip. Another tale tells that they accidentally dropped a lantern, which caused a fire which led to their deaths. These tragic stories have given rise to the belief that the spirits of the lost boys still haunt Boy Scout Lane. Visitors and local residents have reported various paranormal phenomena along the road, such as disembodied voices, ghostly figures, and unexplained lights. Some claim to hear the sound of footsteps crunching on the gravel or the rustling of leaves as if someone or something is moving through the woods. Also, I just wanted to add, there's no historical record of any such incident involving Boy Scouts on this lane. The Boy Scouts of America have no documentation of a troop disappearing or any accident of that nature occurring in the area. So, you know, that's just something to add and, you know, part of why it's an urban legend. Ghouls Ghouls are mythical creatures originating from pre-Islamic Arabian folklore and later adopted into Islamic mythology. They have since become sort of a staple in global horror stories and tales of the supernatural. In the original Middle Eastern context, ghouls are desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demons known to rob graves and prey on human flesh. They are often depicted as cunning and deceitful, capable of assuming the guise of an attractive woman to lure unsuspecting men into their clutches. Once captured, these men would become victims of the ghouls' cannibalistic appetites. The ghoul's ability to change shape makes them particularly dangerous and elusive in folklore. In Arabic, the term for a ghoul is gul, derived from the verb gala, meaning to seize. Over time, the concept of ghoul spread to other cultures and has been adapted in various forms. In Western horror literature and cinema, ghouls have often been depicted as undead beings, like zombies, with an insatiable hunger for human flesh. This interpretation sort of differs from the original portrayal as intelligent and malvid demons but still retains the aspect of grave desecration and cannibalism. Jeff the Killer Jeff the Killer is a modern urban legend and example of internet folklore, also known as a creepypasta. You probably know what a creepypasta is so I won't really you know, introduce it, but the character basically became widely known online with the story accompanied by a disturbing image of a face. The legend of Jeff the Killer typically revolves around a young boy named Jeff, who, after a series of traumatic events, becomes a psychopathic killer with a disfigured face. According to the most popular version of the story, Jeff was a normal teenager until he and his brother were attacked by bullies. The altercation resulted in Jeff being severely injured and his face scarred. Struggling with his disfigurement and mental deterioration, Jeff eventually snaps, killing his family and embarking on a murderous spree. The character is often described as having unnaturally pale skin, burnt off eyelids, and a red, joker-like smile that he carved into his face. The image associated with Jeff the Killer is known for its eerie and unsettling appearance, like you guys can see on this screen, and it's often used in internet pranks or as a form of shock content. The origins of the image are somewhat unclear though, but it's widely considered to be digitally altered. But yeah, once again, it's a creepypasta. So yeah, it's basically like, you know, it's been circulated around the internet. Kagome 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 is a Japanese children's game and a song that over time has developed an eerie reputation, partly because of its mysterious nature of its lyrics and because of the urban legends that have grown around it. The game is traditional and has been played in Japan for generations, but in modern times it has become associated with very spooky stories and interpretations. The game is played with one child standing in the center of a circle, blindfolded or with their eyes covered, while other children join hands and walk in a circle around them, singing the Kagome Kagome song. When the song stops, the child in the middle tries to name the person standing directly behind them. The lyrics of Kagome Kagome are somewhat cryptic and open to interpretation, which has basically contributed to its association with the supernatural. The term Kagome itself is difficult to translate directly, but it generally refers to the pattern of a bamboo basket or cage. 
The rest of the song's lyrics are equally mysterious though, with references to birds in a basket, who is it in the morning, and other phrases that have been variously interpreted. Over time, various urban legends and theories have been developed to explain the song's meanings, with some suggesting connections to Japanese folklore, wartime spies, or even experiments on children. One popular legend suggests that the song was sung by orphans of war or that it was related to some form of ritual or ghost story. Another theory posits that the game was used during World War II as a code for Japanese spies. Walt Disney's Body is Frozen The urban legend that Walt Disney's body, or more specifically his head, was cryogenically frozen after his death is a well-known and enduring myth, so you guys probably have heard this. Walt Disney passed away on December 15, 1966 because of complications from lung cancer. According to official accounts and his death certificate, he was cremated two days later and his ashes were interred at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. The legend of Disney being cryogenically frozen though likely stems from the fact that cryonics was a relatively new and fascinating field at the time of his death. Cryonics is a practice of freezing a body in the hope that future medical technology will be able to revive the person and cure their ailments. In the 1960s, when Disney died, the idea of cryonics was gaining public attention, and the first known human cryopreservation took place just a month after Disney's death, which may have contributed to the timing and believability of the rumor. Over the years though, the myth has been embellished and repeated, with various versions suggesting that his frozen body was stored beneath Disneyland or Disney World. These stories are often seen as a reflection of Disney's forward thinking and innovative spirit, as well as the public's interest and speculation about his private life and legacy. Boogeyman The Boogeyman is a common figure in folklore across various cultures, typically used as a personification of fear, especially for children. The name and nature of the Boogeyman vary considerably around the world, but the character itself is almost universally depicted as a malevolent entity that preys on misbehaving children. In many traditions, the Boogeyman doesn't really have a specific appearance. He's often seen though as a shadowy figure, lurking in the dark or hiding under the bed or in the closet, waiting to scare or punish bad children. The origin of the Boogeyman is not really clear though, as similar types of characters appear in many different cultures, each with their own myths and stories. The concept though likely stems from a combination of historical fears and moral tales used to instill good behavior in children. The boogeyman basically acts as a cautionary figure, embodying the consequences of misbehavior or disobedience. In some cultures, the boogeyman is more than just a disciplinary tool though, he takes on more specific characteristics and stories. For example, in Latin American countries, El Coco or El Cuco is depicted as a monster that kidnaps and eats children who don't obey their parents. In contemporary times, the boogeyman has been featured in various forms of media, including literature, films, and television, often symbolizing the universal fear of the unknown and the darkness. Fiji Mermaid the Fiji Mermaid is a famous example of a sideshow hoax popularized in the 19th century by P.T. Barnum, the American showman known for his work in entertainment and for founding the Barnum and Bailey Circus. The Fiji Mermaid was presented as a mummified body of a creature that was supposedly half mammal and half fish, a classic mermaid. In reality though, the Fiji Mermaid was a fabricated object typically the torso and head of a juvenile monkey sewn to the back half of a fish, often a salmon. The result was basically a grotesque and bizarre looking creature that captured the public's imagination. This oddity was first exhibited in London in the early 1820s and later acquired by Barnum in the 1840s. Barnum's genius in promotion and advertising came into play with the Fiji Mermaid. He created a buzz around the object through a series of teasers and advertisements, suggesting it was a real mermaid. His tactics included planting articles in newspapers, a practice known as Barnumizing, to basically stir public interest and debate about the authenticity of the mermaid. The Fiji mermaid was then exhibited in Barnum's American Museum in New York City, where it drew large crowds eager to see the so-called mermaid. 
Part of the exhibit's success lay in the public's willingness to believe in, you know, the unknown, combined with Barnum's skill in blurring the lines between reality and what was a hoax. And it does make sense, like, if people heard it was a mermaid, it would definitely capture attention, and people would want to believe, you know, it's true. Sinbad's Shazam Sinbad's Shazam is a prominent example of, you know, a Mandela effect. In this case, many people claim to recall a 1990s family comedy movie titled Shazam, starring the American actor and comedian Sinbad as a genie. According to those who remember the movie, Shazam featured Sinbad as a friendly genie who helps two children navigate the challenges of their lives. Despite these detailed recollections, there's actually no evidence that such a film was ever made. Sinbad himself has publicly stated that he never appeared in a genie movie, except for hosting a movie marathon in costume in the 1990s, which may have contributed to the confusion. The origin of this widespread and specific false memory is sort of unclear, though it might be partly because of the conflation of several cultural elements from the 1990s. One likely source of confusion is the 1996 Kazam, which stars Shaq O'Neal as a genie. Also, the popularity of Sinbad's comedic style and family-friendly entertainment during that era might have made it easy for people to mistakenly associate him with such a role. Unfavorable Semicircle Unfavorable Semicircle is a mysterious internet phenomenon that began in 2015 involving a YouTube channel of the same name. This channel gained a lot of attention for posting thousands of cryptic videos, leading to a lot of you know debate and question about what this could have been and the purpose and origin of it. The videos uploaded to the Unfavorable Semicircle channel were typically short, often just a few seconds long, and featured abstract and seemingly random content. They often consisted of blurry images, single colors, distorted sounds, and various visual and auditory anomalies. Many videos also included single letters or digits in their titles, which further just added to the mysterious nature of the content. The sheer volume and frequency of the video uploads were also very staggering, sometimes reaching a rate of several videos per minute, which suggested an automated process behind their creation. Some speculate that the videos were part of an alternate reality game, a form of interactive network narrative. Others theorize that they could be test transmission for a data encryption, an art project, or an experiment in video algorithms. In February 2016, the original Unfavorable Semicircle YouTube channel was actually terminated for violating YouTube's policies. Subsequent channels and social media accounts appeared to continue the pattern of uploads, keeping the intrigue alive. Despite attempts by online communities and individuals to decode or explain the Unfavorable Semicircle videos, no definite explanation has been established, so the purpose of the videos basically still remains a mystery. Alright, moving on to tier 2. The Water Bomber and the Scuba Diver The Water Bomber and the Scuba Diver tells a story about a scuba diver who gets accidentally scooped up by a water bomber plane during a firefighting operation. Water bombers are large aircraft designed to fight wildfires by dropping large quantities of water or fire retardant on flames. The story goes that while collecting water from a lake or reservoir, the plane unknowingly picks up a scuba diver who is exploring underwater at the same time. The diver, along with thousands of gallons of water, is then dropped over a forest fire. The legend concludes with firefighters or authorities finding scuba gear or even the diver themselves among the ashes of fire, far from any natural water source. This unexpected discovery leaves everyone involved puzzled and amazed. This urban legend plays on several fears and fascinations, being the danger of firefighting from the air, the risks of scuba diving in open waters, and even the randomness of accidents that can lead to unbelievable situations. The story basically mixes the reality of natural disasters and the efforts to combat them with the nearly impossible yet somehow plausible occurrence. The story has a lot of versions though and sometimes changes detail to fit the location or audience but the core elements, you know, always remain the same, being a scuba diver, a water bomber plane, and a forest fire. And despite, you know, all the widespread telling and stuff, there's no real evidence that such an event has ever occurred. The Babysitter and the Man Upstairs In the legend of the babysitter and the man upstairs, a young babysitter is tasked with watching children for the evening in the large, quiet house. As the night progresses, she receives several unsettling phone calls from an unknown caller. 
each call escalates in creepiness with the mysterious voice urging her to check on the children upstairs. Initially, she dismisses the calls as a practical joke, but the persistence and tone of the caller spark fear and concern. Feeling increasingly uneasy, the babysitter decides to contact the police for help. She then asks to trace the origin of the calls, hoping to put an end to the harassment. The police then agree but advise her to keep the caller on the line long enough for them to trace the call. After another chilling call, she manages to do just that and the police trace the call. What they discover though is stuff of nightmares, being that the calls are coming from a second phone line within the house itself. The police urgently instruct the babysitter to leave the house immediately, emphasizing the danger she and the children are in. They arrive shortly thereafter, just in time to ensure her safety and search the house. To everyone's horror, they find a man upstairs, hidden away close to where the children were sleeping. This intruder had been making the calls from inside the house, watching and waiting in the shadows. The man's motives vary with different tellings of the story, being in some versions he intends to harm the babysitter and the children, while in others he's a disturbed individual playing a twisted game. Regardless of his intentions though, the story concludes with the man's arrest, leaving the babysitter and the children shaken but safe. And although this is a bit different since it doesn't involve the person calling, there was an incident involving a babysitter in the 1950s, and the details are really tragic and sad, but yeah, it's said that that case might have inspired the legend. The Expressionless So this creepypasta is about a story in 1972 that emerged about an unusual and eerie incident at a hospital involving a figure known as the Expressionless. According to a creepypasta, the legend goes that a woman arrived at the hospital looking nothing like anyone had ever seen before. She had the appearance of a mannequin with flawless skin and a wig that seemed too real. What stood out the most though, however, was her lack of expression, being her face was completely blank showing no sign of emotion. The woman was wearing a white gown resembling something out of a 19th century photograph, which added to her out of place appearance. Despite her condition though, she could walk and move like any human. Hospital staff were initially baffled by her presence and demeanor, but proceeded to try and help her. The situation though took a dark turn here when they attempted to sedate her. The woman fought back with extraordinary strength, her jaw opening wider than physically possible and revealed sharp, almost metallic teeth. And according to the story, she attacked the staff before uttering the phrase, I am God in a tone that was as emotionless as her face. After the incident, she vanished from the hospital, leaving no trace behind except for the haunting memory of her visit. Hippo Eats Dwarf The tale of Hippo Eats Dwarf is one that found its way into the realm of urban legend because of its bizarre and shocking nature. The story goes that during a circus performance, a dwarf, part of an act, was tragically swallowed whole by a hippopotamus. The act was supposed to involve the dwarf jumping from a trampoline into a body of water, but an unforeseen error led to the dwarf landing into the hippo's open mouth instead. This narrative taps into the unpredictable and often dangerous aspect of live performances involving wild animals. You know, circuses and similar entertainments have a pretty long history of showing a lot of, you know, wild stunts that involve animals. The Hippo Eats Dwarf story sort of serves as an extreme example of when such acts go wrong, emphasizing the inherent risks performers face. Over time, this legend has been retold with various details changed or embellished, such as the location of the circus, the name of the dwarf, or even the circumstances leading to the tragic event. However, the core of the story always remains consistent, being the dwarf's unexpected and tragic demise. This tale has, you know, obviously been debunked as an urban legend, with no concrete evidence or credible sources to confirm its occurrence, and it's believed to have originated from a fake news article and has basically been perpetuated by shock value and the visual imagery it evokes. Curse of Bambino The Curse of Bambino is probably something you've heard of if you're a baseball fan. This one specifically involves the Boston Red Sox and arguably one of the goats of baseball, Babe Ruth. The story begins in 1919 when the Red Sox sold Babe Ruth also known as the Bambino, to the New York Yankees. Before this trade, the Red Sox were one of the most successful teams in baseball, having won five World Series titles. 
However, after Ruth's departure, the team's fortunes dramatically changed. The curse supposedly cast a shadow over the Red Sox, resulting in an 86-year World Series drought. During this time, the Red Sox experienced numerous disappointments and near misses, including a heartbreaking loss in the 1986 World Series. On the other hand, the Yankees, with Ruth on their team, became one of the most successful franchises in baseball history, winning numerous World Series titles and further fueling the legend of the curse. So yeah, it basically became a big part of the Red Sox's identity, with fans and players alike believing that some supernatural force was preventing the team from winning the World Series. But if you know baseball, you'd know that the curse was finally broken in 2004 when the Red Sox won the World Series against the Yankees in the American League Championship Series and then sweeping the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series. This victory was celebrated not just as the championship win, but as the end of a curse that has lingered over the team for nearly a century. Kelly Hopkinsville Encounter The Kelly Hopkinsville Encounter is one of the most detailed stories in the history of UFO sightings. This incident took place on the night of August 21st, 1955 in Kelly, a small town near Hopkinsville, Kentucky. The Sutton family, along with friends visiting their farmhouse, reported a really weird encounter with mysterious beings from another world, as they claimed. According to the witnesses, the ordeal began when one of their family members noticed a strange glowing object landing in a nearby field. Later, the family described seeing small creatures approaching their home. These beings were unlike anything they had ever seen, being about 3 feet tall with large heads, pointed ears, glowing eyes, and silver skin that seemed to reflect the moonlight. The family reported that these creatures were floating above the ground and would periodically peer into the windows of the house, seemingly curious but never really aggressive. Frightened by the appearance of these visitors, the family and their guests grabbed firearms and began shooting at them, claiming that the beings were impervious to bullets. They described the sound of the bullets making a metallic ping as if striking a metal object. This standoff continued for several hours, with the creatures repeatedly appearing and disappearing into the darkness. But finally, in the early hours of the morning, the family saw help from the local police. Law enforcement officers, along with military personnel from the nearby Fort Campbell, investigated the site but found no evidence of the creatures or the spacecraft. The absence of physical evidence combined with the nature of the story led to a lot of skepticism among some. However, the sincerity of the witnesses and the lack of any clear motive for fabrication lent the story sort of a degree of credibility. In the Air Tonight In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins is a song that is also one of the most enduring urban legends in the world of music. The legend centers around the song's haunting lyrics and atmospheric quality, leading to speculation about what its true meaning might be. According to the legend, Collins wrote the song after witnessing someone refusing to help a drowning man despite being capable of saving him. The story goes on to claim that Collins, tormented by the incident, penned the lyrics as a way of confronting the guilty party, even going so far as to invite him to a concert where he performed the song directly to him, spotlighting him in the audience to expose his inaction. This tale has interested audiences for years, but Collins himself has debunked this story. He stated in interviews that the lyrics were inspired by his own feelings of anger and frustration following his divorce. The song, with its iconic drum solo, was more of a product of Collins' experimentation with the drum machine and his emotional state at the time, according to him. But yeah, this was actually interesting because I remember from the song Stan by Eminem, there's a reference to this song and I never really got it until now. Lighthouse and Naval Vessel the story of the lighthouse and naval vessel is a classic tale often cited in discussions about communication and misunderstanding. This legend involves a naval vessel and a lighthouse with the two parties engaging in a tense radio exchange. According to the story, the crew of a large naval ship notices a light directly in their path, assuming it to be another vessel, decides to radio them to change course. The exchange goes something like this, the naval message sends a message being Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. The response from the other party is unexpected, being recommended you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The ship, asserting its greater size and power, responds, this is the captain of a US Navy ship, 
I say again, divert your course. The reply comes quickly, being, no, I say again, you divert your course. The exchange escalates with the naval vessel threatening. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States' Atlantic fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of the ship. The punchline though of this story reveals the misunderstanding, being this is a lighthouse, your call. This legend, which is often shared as sort of a humorous anecdote, underscores the importance of clear communication and even just the dangers of assuming superiority in a situation without having all the facts. It's been retold in various forums and sometimes features different branches of the military and locations around the world, but the essence always remains the same, being a powerful naval vessel mistaking a lighthouse for another ship and the ensuing exchange highlighting a mix-up with potentially serious consequences. Millennia Trump Replacement The story about Millennia Trump having a body double is a modern urban legend that suggests that at public events, sometimes the person standing next to Donald Trump wasn't actually his wife, Millennia, but someone pretending to be her. This tale is fueled by photos and videos where Millennia looks noticeably different, like differences in her appearance, height, or behavior that are often cited as these evidences. The legend took root on social media where people began to closely examine photos of, you know, Millennia and some pointed out that in certain pictures, her facial features, height, and mannerisms seemed a bit off. For instance, in one photo, her nose appeared different and in another, her smile wasn't quite the same. There are also times when her body language seemed unusually distant or formal for someone known to be quite poised. Conspiracy theorists suggest that the use of a body double might be for security reasons or to help Millennia avoid public appearances she'd rather not attend. They argue it's a secret high level decision made behind closed doors, with the lookalike stepping in to fill Millennia's shoes at certain events, unbeknownst to the public. One particular video that went viral featured Millennia standing next to Trump, wearing sunglasses, which prompted someone to declare, that's not Millennia. The claim was that her height and the way she held herself didn't match up with other appearances and this video ended up you know spreading across the internet with many taking it as proof of the body double theory. But despite all this and all the you know observations that people have pointed out, there isn't really concrete evidence to support the existence of a body double. The White House even denied these claims and fact checkers have debunked specific instances by showing inconsistencies in the conspiracy theory. For example, differences in appearance can be often attributed to factors like lightning, makeup, or even, you know, camera angles. Ghost P-40 The Ghost P-40 legend is about a World War II fighter plane that was said to mysteriously appear and then vanish in the Sahara Desert. This story has interest many over the years, and it's basically about a Curtis P-40 Warhawk, which was a type of aircraft used during World War II. The tale begins with pilots flying over to the Sahara, spotting a perfectly preserved P-40 that had crash landed in the desert sands. The plane seemed untouched by time, which sparked a lot of curiosity and speculation, you know, why it was there. According to the legend, the P-40 was thought to belong to a pilot who got lost during a battle or a mission. As the story goes, the pilot tried to find his way back but eventually had to land in the desert because of fuel running out. The mystery deepens with the disappearance of the pilot, and searches for the pilot or any trace of him turned up nothing, which just added to the legend that the plane and its pilot might have met a supernatural fate. Over the years, many expeditions try to find the ghostly P-40. Some say they saw it from the air, perfectly preserved, as if it had landed recently. But when they tried to reach the location on foot, the plane was nowhere to be found. This led theorists to think that the plane was a ghost, appearing and disappearing in the desert, perhaps reliving its last flight over and over again. What makes the legend fascinating is not just the mystery of the plane though, but also about the stories about the pilot. People speculated who he might have been, what mission he was on, and how he managed to land so perfectly in the harsh desert. Some even suggested that the pilot might still be wandering the desert, trying to find his way home. The desert itself also plays a significant role in the story, since, you know, it's all about changing landscapes and you know, all the sands can hide some secrets. 
The desert's ability to preserve things for decades because of its dry climate also make the story of the perfectly preserved P-40 seem, you know, actually plausible. But despite numerous searches and the advancements of technology, no concrete evidence of the ghost P-40 has ever been found. Skeleton in a Tree The story of the skeleton in a tree is actually a true mystery that unfolded in the quiet town of McAllister in Oklahoma in the 1970s. The tale begins with the discovery of human remains lodged inside the hollow trunk of a large tree. Basically, back in 1975, a group of hunters were searching for a lost dog in the woods when they stumbled upon a large old chestnut tree. Looking inside its hollow trunk, they found a skeleton standing upright, hidden away as if the tree itself was keeping a secret. The skeleton was dressed in remnants of clothing with a pair of shoes still on its feet suggesting that it hadn't been placed there recently. After that, the local authorities were called in immediately to investigate this eerie find. They determined that the remains belonged to a man who had been missing for at least a year, but how he ended up inside the tree was completely a mystery. There were no clear signs of foul play, no indication or how or why the person would climb into such a tight space, and most weird of all is how the tree seemed to grow around him. The identity of the man was eventually confirmed through dental records. He was a local resident who had vanished without a trace, leaving his family and the community searching for answers. The discovery only deepened the mystery rather than providing closure though. Questions arose about the circumstances leading to his final moments, and how he became entangled in such an unlikely grave. One theory suggests that the man might have sought shelter during a storm or hidden in the tree for some unknown reason, ultimately getting trapped. Then over time, the tree continues to grow, enclosing his body within its trunk. This natural process, combined with the elements, would have probably preserved his remains in a way that seemed almost deliberate. The Spider Bite The story of the spider bite is a cautionary tale that has been shared in various forms over the years. It centers around a young woman who is bitten by a spider, leading to an unexpected and terrifying consequence. This tale basically serves as like a warning about the dangers lurking in our everyday surroundings and even just the importance of paying attention to what might seem like minor injuries. So basically, according to the legend, the young woman was trying on clothes in a store when she felt a sharp pain like a pinprick. She didn't think much of it at first, assuming it was just a scratch from a tag or a hanger. However, over the next few days, the spot where she felt the pain began started to swell and turn red. It became increasingly painful and a small pimple-like bump formed. Concerned, she ended up visiting a doctor who prescribed antibiotics for what was thought to be a bacterial infection. Despite the medication though, the bump grew larger and the woman started to feel sick. The pain then became unbearable and the area around the bump turned black. In a desperate state, she went to the emergency room. The medical staff, puzzled by her symptoms, decided to make an incision to relieve the pressure and drain the wound. But to everyone's horror, as soon as the cut was made, Dozens of tiny spiders emerged from the bump, having hatched inside her skin from an egg laid by the original spider bite. This tale taps into a lot of deep-seated fears of spiders which you know a lot of people have and just the unseen dangers that they might present. It also plays on the fear of our bodies being invaded by something foreign and harmful since the story, you know, it does really sound creepy and you know sad. The story varies in detail though with some versions specifying the type of spider or altering the location of the bite, but the core elements you know always remain the same, being a bite that turns into a nightmare scenario. Rods Rods, also known as skyfish or solar entities, are a phenomenon that caught public attention in the mid-1990s. These mysterious objects were first noticed in video footage where they appeared as fast-moving, elongated shapes that seemed to dart through the air. They're described as being rod-shaped with a series of undulating fins along their side, which is why some people think they look a bit like a fish swimming through the sky. The origin of rods is actually tied to footage captured by cameras that were set up to film other phenomena, such as birds flying or scenic landscapes. People start to notice these strange shapes in the background of their videos, moving too quickly to be seen by the naked eye, but clearly captured on the film. This sparked a lot of speculation about what these could be, and rods ended up being reported worldwide, with people claiming to see them in various environments, from high mountain areas to deep caves, and even in underwater locations. 
They seem to be able to move through the air and water with equal ease, which has led to all sorts of theories about their nature. Some say they're a type of undiscovered biological creature, maybe even extraterrestrial in origin. Others go even further, suggesting that they might be interdimensional beings, visible only under certain conditions or through the lens of a camera. The Mystery of Rods is also enhanced by their apparent ability to fly at incredible speeds, making them invisible to the human eye and difficult to study. They typically appear in videos as brief, fleeting images, often leaving as quickly as they arrive. Despite the interest surrounding these rods though and all the, you know, the theories that came up, their presence in videos is often attributed to optical illusions or camera tricks. The way a camera's shutter speed interacts with fast moving objects can create elongated images, so it basically suggests that rods, you know, may not be mysterious creatures, but rather ordinary objects like insects or birds captured in a way that makes them appear otherworldly. Sydney Bridge Hidden Bodies the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is an iconic structure known for its massive steel arc and stunning views of the harbour, is also a centre of a chilling urban legend. According to this tale, during the bridge's construction in the 1920s and early 1930s, several workers met their fate in accidents. The legend basically goes that some of these workers fell into the structure's steelworks and because of the immense scale and the complexity of the construction project, their bodies were never recovered. Instead, they were left entombed within the bridge's massive steel framework. And construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge was for sure a dangerous task. It required thousands of workers and the project was one of the most ambitious engineering feats of its time. The work involved handling heavy steel beams and working at, you know, really high heights. And safety measures back then were not as great as they are today, which for sure led to accidents during the construction project. So yeah, while it's true that several workers died during the construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, there's actually no official record that supports the idea of bodies being left, you know, within the structure. The legend likely grew from the real dangers faced by the workers and the tragic accidents that for sure occurred, but you know, the tendency of people to create stories to remember and make sense of such tragedies might have been the cause of it. But over time, this urban legend has basically become a part of the lore surrounding the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It serves as a reminder of the human costs associated with building the massive structures that have come to define our skylines. Swallowing Gum The urban legend about swallowing gum has been around for generations and generations. It claims that if you swallow gum, it will stay in your stomach for 7 years. This story is often told to children to discourage them from swallowing gum, warning them of a long-lasting mistake that could stick around quite literally inside them. According to the legend, gum is different from other foods. It's said that it's indigestible, meaning that once you swallow it, your body can't break it down and use it like it does other food. Instead, the gum supposedly just sits there, taking up space in your stomach for years on end. Some versions of the story even suggest that swallowing too much gum could lead to a massive gum blob forming inside you, causing all sorts of health problems. In reality though, while it's true that gum is not easily broken down by the digestive system, it doesn't stay in the stomach forever. Instead, like other things that the body can't digest, gum basically passes through the digestive system and is excreted. But the process doesn't at all take 7 years, and instead it takes about the same time that it does for other indigestible materials. Organ theft. The organ theft legend is a pretty dark tale that warns of criminals stealing people's organs to sell on the black market. This story has circulated around the world evolving with many variations but always maintaining its core element of fear and violation. According to the legend, travelers or unsuspecting individuals are lured into vulnerable situations, perhaps through the promise of a cheap vacation, a blind date, or a taxi ride. Then they are often drugged into unconsciousness. When they wake up, it's often in a bathtub filled with ice, with the phone nearby and a note urging them to call for emergency help. But the most dark part of this is they discover an incision on their body, typically around the kidney area, indicating that one of their organs has been removed without their consent. This narrative plays on fears about bodily violation and exploitation, as well as distrust of strangers and unfamiliar places. The legends suggest that there are networks of skilled criminals who can perform such surgeries quickly and leave the victim alive, but with one less organ. 
These stories often include details about the high demand for organs on the black market and the enormous sums of money that illegal organs can fetch. And the organ theft legend has definitely been fueled by real world concerns over organ trafficking, which is a serious and legitimate issue in some parts of the world. However, the dramatic scenario of waking up in a bathtub missing an organ with no memory of the surgery is you know why it's an urban legend. Investigation into such stories have found no evidence to support the existence of such crimes happening as described in the legends. But yeah, this legend has still been referenced in a lot of movies, television shows, and cautionary tales, often as a warning to be cautious in unfamiliar situations or even just while traveling. Dog Boy The Legend of the Dog Boy is a creepy story that comes from Arkansas. It's about a boy named Gerald Bettis who was rumored to have a strange and frightening power along with a deep connection to dogs. According to the tale, Gerald was not only known for his unusual behavior but also for the eerie occurrences that surrounded him and his family's house. Born in the 1950s, Gerald Bettis grew up in a large Victorian style house on Mullerbury Street. From a young age, people said he had a peculiar interest in dogs, collecting stray ones and allegedly performing cruel and allegedly performing cruel experiments on them. This behavior earned him the nickname Dog Boy among the locals. As Gerald got older though, the stories became even darker. It was said that he used his physical strength to dominate and imprison his own parents in their home, treating them harshly and controlling every aspect of their lives. The tale describes how the house became a place of dread, with neighbors hearing unsettling noises and witnessing bizarre lights within. The legend also suggests that Gerald possessed supernatural abilities, which he used to terrorize those around him. These powers, combined with his cruel actions, made the dog boy a figure of local fear and fascination. Eventually though, Gerald Bettis was said to have met a mysterious end, which added a final chapter to the legend. After his death, rumors spread about the haunted nature of the Bettis house, with claims of ghostly apparitions, strange sounds, and an unsettling presence felt by those who dared to explore it. Despite the sinister stories though, much of the dog boy legend is rooted in local lore, with actual details about Gerald Bettis and his life being less dramatic. He actually did exist and while his life was troubled, the tales of supernatural powers and extreme cruelty don't really have evidence and are probably embellishments that have grown over time. Mothman The Mothman is described as a large winged creature with glowing red eyes spotted for the first time by a group of people in November 1966. According to reports, this creature was not seen standing still but was capable of flying at incredible speeds and making high-pitched screeching sounds. The first sighting happened near an area known as the TNT area, an old World War II munitions plant that was mostly abandoned and had become a local hangout spot. Witnesses said the Mothman chased their cars as they drove away from the TNT area, flying over them and keeping pace with their vehicle. After this first encounter, more sightings began to come up and you know it was seen by different people, different times, and in different places but still around Point Pleasant. Some witnesses described feeling a sense of dread or fear before or after seeing the creature. Others reported having nightmares or experiencing strange phenomena such as unexplained noises or eerie lights in the sky. The Legend of the Mothman became even more mixed with the history of Point Pleasant because of a tragic event. In December 1967, the Silver Bridge, which connected Point Pleasant to Ohio, collapsed during rush hour, causing the deaths of 46 people. Some locals began to believe that the Mothman sightings were connected to the bridge collapse, seeing the creature as either a warning or an omen of the disaster. The Mothman story has been the subject of books, documentaries, and even a major film, all trying to explore or explain the phenomenon. Researchers and enthusiasts have proposed various theories about what the Mothman could be, ranging from a supernatural being to a previously unknown species of animal. Alice Killings The Alice Killings is actually a creepypasta and it centers around some unsolved crimes. According to a story, between 99, according to a creepypasta, between 1999 and 2005, a string of unrelated victims were found murdered across Japan. What linked these crimes together though was a single eerie clue left at each crime scene, being a playing card with the name Alice written in the victim's blood, leading the media and the public to refer to the case as the Alice killings. The victims of these crimes were diverse, ranging from a young woman to a middle-aged man with no apparent connection between them. 
The methods of murder varied just as widely though, including stabbing, poisoning, and strangulation, suggesting that the killer had no specific, you know, method, but just wanted to cause death and fear. Despite the brutal nature of the murders, each crime scene was described as arranged, almost with a sense of care or artistic expression, which only added to the public's horror and fascination. Investigators were baffled by the killings, and the lack of a clear pattern or motive combined with the cryptic Alice clue left them scrambling for answers. The player's cards became a symbol of the killer's mocking challenge to law enforcement and the public, and it was a taunting signature that was both a clue and a dead end. As the creepypasta continues, some speculate that Alice referred to Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, suggesting that the killer was obsessed with themes of innocence lost. Others wondered if the killer was sending a message about the victims or society at large, though what that message might be remained a mystery. The creepypasta basically ends by saying that despite a massive investigation and widespread media coverage, the legend concludes that the killer was never caught, leaving the Alice killings as one of Japan's most disturbing unsolved mysteries. The Loyan The Loyan is a mysterious figure associated with an unsettling urban legend from the forests of Switzerland. This story began to spread in the early 2000s, centered around the forest near the town of Wallace. According to local accounts, a strange person or entity known as Le Loyon has been spotted wandering the woods. What makes Le Loyon particularly eerie though is the description, being a figure dressed in a military uniform and wearing a gas mask, making it impossible to identify whether it is a man or something else. For over a decade, people claimed to have encountered this figure, describing it as tall and silent, walking through the forest with an unsettling presence. The Loyan never interacted with onlookers or showed signs of aggression. Instead, it simply walked and its intentions and identity were unknown. These encounters left those who saw it feeling uneasy as the figure's face was always hidden behind the gas mask and its body was covered in a long coat regardless of the season. The legend of the Loyan took a more intriguing turn when a local newspaper received a letter allegedly from the Loyan expressing a desire for peace and solitude disturbed by the attention it had attracted. Despite numerous attempts to learn more about Laloyan, including who it might be or why they wandered the forest dressed in such a manner, no clear answers were ever found. Some speculated that the entity could be a former soldier, a hermit living off-grid, or even something supernatural given the figure's ability to appear and disappear without a trace. The story reached a sad note when articles reported the discovery of abandoned clothes and a gas mask believed to belong to Laloyan, hitting at the end of the forest wanderings. Accompanying the items was a note suggesting that the pressure of being pursued and the loss of solitude had become too much. The Legend of Laloyan though raises some questions about the nature of solitude, the right to anonymity, and the impact of public curiosity on individuals living on the margins of society. It's basically like a modern tale of a ghostly figure, not haunting in the traditional sense but haunting in its loneliness and the mystery it represents. But to this day, the truth behind the Loyon remains as hidden as the figure's face behind the gas mask. Candyman Candyman is an urban legend that has been part of American folklore for decades. It tells the story of a sinister spirit that can be summoned by saying his name five times while facing a mirror. According to legend, upon doing this, the Candyman appears behind the person and uses a hook hand to do them harm. The origins of the Candyman though vary in different tellings of the tale. Some say he was a man who fell to a tragic fate, seeking revenge from beyond the grave. Others believe he was always a figure of the supernatural, a dark entity tied to mirrors and reflections. The Candyman is often associated with themes of vengeance and the past coming back to haunt the present. And you know, mirrors are a common element in folklore and horror stories since they sort of act as a portal to other worlds or as a means to reveal hidden truths. The Candyman has also been linked to various locations, with some versions of the story setting his origin in a specific place where tragedy or injustice occurred. These locations are said to be cursed or haunted, with the Candyman's spirit lingering, waiting to be called upon. Over the years, the Candyman legend has been popularized and kept alive through movies, books, and other media, each adding new layers to the story. These adaptions often explore themes of history, society, and the consequences of our actions, using the Candyman as a figure to evoke fear and suspense. Urine Indicator Die The Urine Indicator Die legend is a popular story often told about swimming pools. 
According to this legend, there's a special dye that pool owners can add to the water. If someone pees in the pool, the dye reacts with urine, creating a colorful cloud around the person. This cloud supposedly reveals who peed, embarrassing them in front of everyone. This story sort of serves like as a warning, especially to children, to discourage them from urinating in the pool. The idea behind the legend is pretty simple, you know, it plays on the fear of public embarrassment. No one really wants to be like the center of attention for doing something wrong, especially in a public setting like a swimming pool. It's a tale that pool goers, especially kids, might hear from friends, parents, or lifeguards, often told with a hint of seriousness to make sure the lessons stick. But despite the widespread belief in the caution it instills in swimmers, there's no evidence that such a dye actually exists. Pool chemicals do include substances that can indicate pH levels or the presence of chlorine, but none specifically react to urine to produce a visible marker. Death of Gloria Ramirez The death of Gloria Ramirez is a true and puzzling medical mystery that happened in 1994 in Riverside, California. Basically, Gloria was brought to the emergency room with severe heart problems, but what unfolded next turned into a bizarre and frightening story. Upon her arrival at the hospital, Gloria was extremely ill and the medical staff quickly worked to stabilize her. However, when they tried to draw blood, they noticed something very unusual. Her blood had a strange, fruity smell and there were manila colored particles floating in it. Shortly after the discovery, people in the emergency room began to fall ill. They felt dizzy and had trouble breathing and some even passed out. In total, 23 hospital staff were affected and 5 were hospitalized. The situation was so strange and serious that the emergency room was evacuated and a special team in hazmat suits was called in to investigate. Despite their efforts, Gloria Ramirez died that night and the cause of her mysterious symptoms and the illness of the hospital staff became the center of an intense investigation. Many theories were proposed to explain what could have happened. Some suggested that Gloria might have been using a home remedy for her cancer that created toxic fumes. Others thought it might have been a rare medical condition. The official explanation pointed to a combination of chemicals, including dimethyl sulfone and others that could have produced toxic fumes when electricity was used during her treatment, but this theory has been debated. Gloria's case became known as the incident of the toxic lady. News of the event spread widely, leading to all sorts of speculation and fear about what dangerous substances our bodies could potentially produce or react with. It also raised questions about hospital safety and the risk medical staff face. The mystery of Gloria Ramirez is that though still remains unsolved, and while scientific explanations have been offered, none have fully satisfied all questions about the case. Her story has been featured in medical journals, documentaries, and TV shows capturing the imagination of people around the world. 8 Feet Tall 8 Feet Tall, also known as Hachisha Kusama, it's a chilling urban legend from Japan about a supernatural entity that appears as a woman abnormally tall at 8 feet with an eerie presence. This legend has spread fear among children and adults alike, cautioning them against watering alone in certain rural areas. The story goes that this entity preys on people, mainly targeting children. She's described as wearing a long white dress or a hat, making her look like a towering, slender figure from a distance. What makes 8 feet tall particularly terrifying though is her deep, masculine voice that mimics the sound of a drum or a long, drawn out po po po, which she uses to attract or disorient her victims. According to a legend, once 8 feet tall sets her sights on you, escaping her grasp is extremely difficult. She's said to have the ability to mimic the voices of your loved ones to lure you into her trap. Victims who hear her voice or see her are marked for death and can become obsessed with finding her again. There are tales of protecting rituals and charms that can ward off 8 feet tall's interest though, but if someone is chosen, they must leave the area immediately and are advised never to return. The legend mentions a few who have encountered her and survived, but they had to go through elaborate rituals or take drastic measures to ensure their safety. The origins of 8 feet tall though are pretty mysterious, with various versions of the story, with various versions of the story suggesting she's a restless spirit a demon or a cursed individual. Cursed Japanese Kleenex Ad The Cursed Japanese Kleenex Ad is an urban legend that emerged in the 1980s, centered around a television commercial for Kleenex tissues in Japan. This particular ad gained notoriety not only for its product, 
but for the eerie atmosphere and the series of misfortunes that allegedly befell those associated with it. According to the legend, the commercial featured a woman dressed in a white gown, resembling a traditional Japanese ghost, alongside a young child dressed as an ogre or a demonic figure. The background music was said to be a haunting, slow version of It's a Fine Day by Jane and Barton, which combined with the visuals gave the ad an unsettling vibe. Viewers reported feeling uneasy or distressed after watching the ad, with some claiming it brought bad luck or triggered a sense of foreboding. The legend eventually ended up growing, incorporating tales of the cast and the crew experiencing misfortunes, accidents, or even deaths. The most chilling aspect of this urban legend is the claim that those who watched the ad were cursed. Rumors also circulate that the ad had been pulled from television because of its negative effects, although no evidence substantiates these claims. Skeptics and rationalists have pointed out logical explanations for the ad's unsettling nature, such as the use of eerie imagery and music to make a memorable impression on viewers. They also note the lack of concrete evidence linking the ad to any real-life misfortunes. Ratman of South End The Ratman of South End comes from the area of South End on Sea, Essex, England. It tells the story of a mysterious figure, half man and half rat, lurking in the shadows of the underpasses and alleyways of the town. This legend has interest in frightened residents and visitors for years. According to the tale, the Ratman was once an old man who lived on the streets, finding shelter wherever he could, which was often in dark and damp places like underpasses. One bitterly cold night though, he fell asleep in one of these underpasses and tragically froze to death. Rats, which were drawn to the warmth of his body, gnawed at his flesh, leaving his corpse in a horrific state. Since then, it's said that a spirit merged with those of the rats, roamed the underpasses, seeking vengeance against those who dare to enter his domain. Witnesses claim to hear the sound of scratching and the scurrying of rat feet against the concrete, often accompanied by an eerie squeaking that shows the blood. Some even speak of seeing a shadowy figure with glowing red eyes, watching them from the darkness before disappearing without a trace. The rat man though is not just a tale of horror, but also a cautionary story about the neglect of homelessness and the consequences of societal indifference. His legend is sort of a reminder of what can happen when people are forgotten and left to fend for themselves in the harshest of conditions. Gozu Gozu, translating to cowhead, is a Japanese urban legend about a story so terrifying that listeners are driven to madness or death upon hearing it. The legend of Gozu is basically a meta story, meaning it's a story about a story and its content is supposedly so horrifying that it's never fully recounted in the telling of the legend. The tale of Gozu is said to have originated from ancient Japan, with some versions suggesting it's an old folk tale that has been passed down to generations. However, the story's details are so elusive and disturbing that they're rarely, if ever, directly shared. Instead, the legend focuses on the reactions of those who hear the story, describing extreme fear, panic, and even physical illness leading to death. According to the legend, the Gozu story was discovered in a forgotten manuscript or book, and since then, anyone who reads or hears the tale experiences unbearable terror. Teachers who inadvertently tell the story to their students or curious individuals who stumble upon the manuscript find themselves overwhelmed with fear or meet untimely fates. What makes Gozu particularly intriguing though is the paradox at its heart, being that the story is supposedly widely known, yet no one can tell it because of its lethal consequences. But efforts to find a written version of the Gozu story have been fruitless, so you know it's part of why it's an urban legend. Gateway of the Mind The Gateway of the Mind is a disturbing urban legend about a secret experiment purportedly conducted in the 1980s by a group of scientists. The experiment's goal was to unlock the human mind's full potential by eliminating all sensory input, thereby, according to the legend, enabling the subject to perceive the presence of God or access higher state of consciousness. According to the story, the scientists believed that by removing a person's senses, they could isolate the mind, allowing it to expand beyond the physical confines of the body. To achieve this, they supposedly selected a volunteer, an elderly man who had claimed he had nothing left to lose. The procedures they used were pretty extreme, involving the surgical removal of the subject's sensory capabilities. His ability to see, hear, taste, smell, and feel were all deliberately nullified. After operations, the man was completely isolated from any sensory input, living in a state of profound silence and darkness. Initially, he reported experiencing a deep sense of solitude, but gradually claimed to hear the voices and see visions, 
suggesting he was tapping into unseen realms or connecting with divine entities. As the experiment continued, the man's claims became more intense and alarming. He insisted that he could hear the dead and they were tormenting him with whispers of the afterlife. This condition eventually rapidly deteriorated as he became more distressed, culminating in a chilling final moment where he violently claimed to have spoken with God and begged to be killed to end his torment. The legend concludes with the experiment being abruptly terminated, but the fate of the man and the scientists involved remain a topic of eerie speculation. The Gui of the Mind story is, you know, like a cautionary tale about the dangers of human experimentation and the theory of boundaries between science, spirituality, and madness. Evil Farming Game The Evil Farming Game is a modern urban legend born from internet forums, revolving around a mysterious and elusive video game that nobody has been able to verify exists. According to online discussions, the game involves a farmer who, after killing his wife in a fit of rage, must continue to manage his farm while concealing her death from the authorities and the local community. The search for the evil farming game has captured the curiosity of a lot of internet users, with people scouring old game archives, reaching out to vintage game enthusiasts, and digging through obscure gaming forums. Despite these efforts though, no concrete evidence of the game's existence has ever been surfaced, linked to speculation that it might have been a collective false memory or a detailed hoax. The game is said to feature a mix of farming simulation and dark narrative elements, with the player needing to perform daily farm tasks such as planting crops and tending to animals, all while avoiding suspicion. The twist of having to hide evidence and lie to NPC neighbors about the wife's whereabouts adds a sinister layer to the traditional farming game genre. Interest in the evil farming game peaked when users began to link it to other known games, suggesting it might have been a misremembered version of an existing title. However, every lead turned out to be a dead end, which further deepened the mystery. Denver International Airport Denver International Airport, or DIA, is surrounded by a variety of interesting urban legends and conspiracy theories. Since its opening in 1995, the airport has become a center of numerous tales that touch on everything from apocalyptic artwork to hidden underground bases. One of the most talked about aspects of DIA is its collection of murals and sculptures which some people interpret as containing messages about future global catastrophes and world government. Among these, the most notable are two large murals created by artist Leo Tanguma, which depict unsettling themes of war and peace in vivid colors and striking imagery. Critics of the murals argue that they're filled with sinister symbols and hidden meanings, while others see them as a call for world peace and harmony. Another focal point of the conspiracy theories is the airport's large blue Mustang statue known as Blucifer. Standing at 32 feet tall with glowing red eyes, the statue has become infamous not only for its imposing and somewhat menacing appearance, but also because it accidentally killed its creator, Luis Jimenez, when a section of it fell on him. This tragic event has fueled speculation about the statue being cursed. The IA is also rumored to have extensive underground tunnels and bunkers, with some theorists suggesting that these areas serve as a headquarters or as fallout shelters for the global elite. The fact that the airport's construction went significantly over budget and its footprint is much larger than necessary for its operations only add to the speculation. Adding to the airport's mysterious nature though are the odd markings on the floors and strange inscriptions on the buildings which some interpret as secret codes or messages to those in the know. Despite the DIA's efforts to dispel these rumors through public statements and allowing media tours of some of its underground areas, the theories still persist. The airport though has embraced its reputation as a subject of interest, even featuring a talking gargoyle in the terminal that jokes about the various conspiracy theories. Huggin' Molly Huggin' Molly is a ghostly figure from a unique urban legend rooted in Abbeville, Alabama. According to local lore, Huggin' Molly is a phantom woman who wanders the streets at night. She's described as being exceptionally tall, dressed in Charlie in black, and wearing a wide-brimmed hat. The legend says that she seeks out people walking alone after dark, envelops them in a tight embrace, and screams into their ears without saying any words. The story of Huggin' Molly has been part of Abbsville history for generations, serving as both a spooky tale and a cautionary warning to keep children off the streets at night. Parents would often tell their kids about Huggin' Molly to ensure they were home before it got too dark, invoking the specter of this mysterious figure as sort of a deterrent against staying out late. Unlike many ghost stories that involve malevolent spirits or harmful intentions, 
while getting Molly's actions, while terrifying, are not set to cause physical harm. The fear basically comes from the surprise of her sudden appearance and the intensity of her scream. After the encounter, she simply vanishes, leaving her startled victims to hurry home, shaken but unharmed. The origins of Hug and Molly are a subject of speculation though. Some believe she was actually a real person who suffered a great loss and now searches for a deceased child or loved one, attempting to give the hug she never could in life. Others think the tale might have been inspired by an actual person known for giving unwelcome embraces or as a story connected to keep children safe by discouraging nighttime wandering. Despite the variations in her story though, Huggin Molly remains a well-known figure in Abbeville where her legend continues to be passed down through generations. Black Shuck Black Shuck is a legendary ghostly black dog set to roam the coastline and countryside of East Angalia, England. This fearsome creature is described as being larger than a normal dog with glowing red eyes and shaggy black fur. Legends say that Black Shuck prowls silently but its presence is heralded by a chilling sense of dread in an eerie electric atmosphere. It's rooted in the local folklore of Norfolk and Suffolk and the surrounding areas with accounts dating back hundreds of years. According to these stories, encountering Black Shuck is an omen of bad luck or even death. Some tales describe the creature as you know really malevolent, capable of bringing disaster and doom to those who see it. However, other stories suggest that Black Shuck can also be a protective presence, guiding lost travelers to safety. One of the most famous accounts of Black Shuck dates back to 1577, when it's said to have burst through the doors of St. Mary's Church in Bungay. It allegedly left scorch marks on the church door, which can still be seen today. When it is described a terrifying black hound wrecking havoc, killing a man and a boy and causing the church steeple to collapse to the roof. Despite fearsome reputation though, Black Shuck is just one of many ghostly black dogs recorded in British folklore with similar entities reported in other parts of the country. These spectral canines are often associated with ancient pathways, crossroads, graveyards and even places that were once sites for execution. Killing praying mantises is illegal. The belief that killing prey mantises is illegal is a widespread urban legend which is often accompanied by claims that there is a hefty fine for anyone caught, you know, killing a praying mantis. This idea taps into the reverence many people feel for praying mantises because of their unique appearance and the fact that they prey on pests, harmful to gardens, and crops. However though, the truth is that in most places there are no specific laws against killing praying mantises. The confusion may stem from generalized protections for endangered species or beneficial insects within certain regions, but these don't typically single out praying mantises. Some versions of this urban legend even detail specific fines, ranging from several hundred to several thousand dollars, supposedly enforced by local or federal wildlife agencies. These stories often lack specific legal references and can vary widely in detail, but you know, it's still part of like the urban legend. The spread of this belief might have also been fueled by a general principle taught to many children, being that it's wrong to harm creatures that are helpful to the environment. It's also possible that the legend started as a way to discourage people from killing these insects. Over time though, this encouragement has sort of morphed into a legal myth, reinforced by the authoritative way it's often shared among friends, family, and communities. Toilet Seed Spider the urban legend of the toilet seat spider tells of venomous spiders lurking under toilet seats in public restrooms, waiting to bite unsuspecting users. This story varies in detail but often features a particular kind of spider, said to be deadly, which has somehow found its way into a restroom. According to the legend, these spiders hide in the underside of toilet seats and when disturbed, they bite the person sitting there. The stories sometimes specify types of spiders like the brown recluse or the black widow, which are known for their potent venom. In some versions, the spiders are exotic species purportedly transported in shipments of fruit or other goods from overseas, ending up in urban settings far from their native habitats. The narrative usually includes a warning about the dangers of using public restrooms without checking under the sea first. The legend has also been added by occasional reports finding spiders in restrooms though these incidents are rare and seldom as dangerous as the legend suggests. Experts point out that while it's not impossible for a spider to end up in such a location, spiders generally avoid human activity and are unlikely to seek out such exposed and frequently disturbed places. So the toilet sea spider legend has been debunked numerous times 
but it still persists, partly because it plays on, you know, actual realistic fears that people have. Don't lick envelopes. The urban legend warning people not to lick envelopes stems from claims about harmful substances or objects being present in the adhesive. According to various versions of the story, individuals have suffered adverse reactions or even more dire consequences after licking envelopes due to toxins or sharp objects supposedly embedded in the glue. One popular version of the legend involves a woman who supposedly cuts her tongue on a small piece of metal or glass hidden in the envelope's adhesive. This incident then leads to a serious infection attributed to bacteria or venomous substances present on the object. In some tellings, the story escalates to life-threatening situations involving trips to the hospital, surgeries, or even, you know, just fatal outcomes. Also, another variant claims that cockroach eggs are present in the glue, which then hatch inside the person's stomach or lips, leading to horrifying medical emergencies. These stories try to discourage people from, you know, the act of licking envelopes by evoking fear of injury or illness, and despite it being an urban legend, it does make sense since, you know, it doesn't seem too sanitary. So yeah, while it's theoretically possible for contaminants to come in contact with envelope glue, the risk is pretty low and not limited to envelopes alone, but yeah, it's generally not too sanitary. Area 51 Area 51 is a highly secretive military base located in the Nevada desert, known officially as the Nevada Test and Training Range. It's become the center of numerous urban legends and conspiracy theories, mostly revolving around aliens and UFOs. The intense secrecy surrounding the base fuels speculation about what the US government might be hiding there. The legend of Area 51 began to grow in the 1950s, around the same time the US government was testing high altitude reconnaissance aircraft like the U-2. UFOs were often reported in the skies above the US, but these were usually top secret military aircraft unknown to the public. However, the connection between Area 51 and extraterrestrial technology truly took off in the 1980s when a man claimed he worked on alien spacecraft at the facility, attempting to reverse engineer their technology. This claim put Area 51 into the public imagination as the home of alien visitors and their spacecraft. According to various accounts, the base houses everything from flying saucers to the remains of crash UFOs and even their alien pilots. Some stories describe underground laboratories where scientists work to unlock the secrets of advanced technologies beyond human understanding, while others speculate about meetings and treaties with extraterrestrials. Despite the nature of these stories though, the US government's long-standing refusal to acknowledge the existence of the Area 51 only added to the mystery. It wasn't until 2013 that the CIA officially recognized the site's existence, confirming its use as a testing ground for aerial surveillance programs. However, this acknowledgement did little to quell the speculation about hidden alien technology or covert extraterrestrial dealings. Tails Doll The Tails Doll is a character that originated from the 1997 Sega video game Sonic R, a racing game that featured characters from the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Unlike the other brightly colored and energetic characters in the game, the Tails Doll is portrayed as a lifeless, floating version of Tails, one of Sonic's friends. This appearance set the stage for the urban legend that surrounds it. According to the legend, the Tails doll is cursed and can emerge from the game into the real world, bringing misfortune or even death to those who summon it. The method of summoning involves playing the game's soundtrack in a dark room or completing certain tasks within the game itself. Some versions of the story mention performing a specific ritual or playing the game at midnight to invite the Tails doll into one's life. Despite the origins in the video game though, the story of the Tales doll has taken on a life of its own within internet folklore. It's become popular in forums and fan art and even in creepypasta stories where people share their own experiences or fictional tales involving the Tales doll. These stories range from mildly unsettling to downright terrifying, with the character often depicted as a malevolent entity capable of crossing over from the digital world, which, you know, makes it the urban legend it is. Atlantis the Legend of Atlantis is a story about an advanced island civilization that supposedly existed thousands of years ago but vanished without a trace. The tale was first mentioned by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato in his dialogues Timaeus and Crateas. According to Plato, Atlantis was a powerful and technologically advanced empire located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is generally believed to be the Strait of Gibraltar. He described it as being larger than Asia and Libya combined rich in resources, and possessing a sophisticated culture and society. 
Plato's Atlantis was said to be a naval power that conquered many parts of Western Europe and Africa around 9,000 years before its own time. However, because of people's moral degradation, the gods became angry and in a single day and night of misfortune, the island of Atlantis sank into the sea, disappearing forever. The story of Atlantis has captured the imagination of people for over centuries. It has been interpreted in countless ways, ranging from being considered a historical fact to a metaphor for Plato's philosophical ideas. Some people believe that you know Atlantis actually exists and it might be in the Mediterranean Sea or maybe in the Atlantic Ocean, while other theories have linked it to the Antarctic, the Caribbean, and even locations outside of Earth. Despite the fascination with finding the lost city though, most modern scholars agree that Plato's account was likely fictional, possibly inspired by real historical events like the volcanic eruption on the island of Santorini around 1600 BCE. This event destroyed the Minoan civilization, which could have served as inspiration for the story of Atlantis. However, the lack of concrete evidence and the mythical elements of Plato's narrative have led to a consensus among historians and archaeologists that Atlantis never existed as a real city or empire. Herobrine Herobrine is a legendary creature from the world of Minecraft, which is an immensely popular sandbox video game. This urban legend began circulating among players not long after the game's initial release. Herobrine is described as a mysterious, otherworldly figure with a default player skin, except for his white, empty eyes. According to legend, Herobrine possesses supernatural abilities, allowing him to build structures, manipulate the game's world, and interact with players in ways that normal players or game mechanics cannot. The tale of Herobrine often starts with players noticing odd structures appearing in their game worlds, trees without leaves, and tunnels that seem to have been dug without any explanation. Some players have reported encountering Herobrine, claiming he initiated hostile actions against them or caused unsettling phenomenon to occur in the game, such as text messages without a sender or complex systems being mysteriously dismantled. The origin of the Herobrine legend is a matter of speculation though. Some say it began with a post on the Minecraft forum, where a player claimed to have encountered an aggressive NPC that looked exactly like the player avatar but with ghostly glowing eyes. This story quickly captured the imagination of the Minecraft community, leading to the creation of numerous mods, fan art, and stories further expanding on the myth. Despite the widespread fascination with Hero Brian, though, the game developers have repeatedly stated that he's not part of Minecraft and never has been. The legend has officially been debunked several times, with updates jokingly noting removed Hero Brian in the chain log. Mandela Effect the Mandela Effect refers to a phenomenon where a large number of people remember an event or detail differently from how it actually occurred. The term was coined by Fiona Broom, a paranormal researcher, after she discovered that she, along with many other people, falsely remembered Nelson Mandela dying in prison during the 1980s. In reality though, Mandela was released from prison in 1990 and passed away in 2013. This phenomenon has since been identified in various other instances involving collective misrem involving collective misremembering of names, events, dates, and details from popular culture, history, and everyday life. Examples include the spelling of Berstein bears, often misremembered as Berstein, the number of United States, and even lines from movies that were said, like Luke I am your father from Star Wars, instead of the correct No I am your father. The Mandela effect has sparked a wide range of explanations and theories. Some attribute it to simple misremembering or social and cultural influences that lead people to misquote or misinterpret information. Others propose more speculative explanations, such as alternative realities or parallel universes, suggesting that those experiencing the Mandela Effect have memories from different versions of reality. Psychologists explain the Mandela Effect through the fallibility of human memory, emphasizing how memories are not recordings of events, but reconstructions that can be influenced by new information, beliefs, and suggestions from others. This reconstruction process can lead to confabulation, where false details are filled in or true ones omitted, leading to confident recollections of events that never actually happened. Despite its name suggesting otherwise though, the Mandela Effect is not considered a scientific phenomenon, but rather a social or psychological one. Momo Challenge The Momo Challenge is a modern urban legend that sparked a lot of fear among parents and guardians around the world. It was rumored to be a social media challenge that encouraged children and teenagers to perform a series of dangerous tasks, including harming themselves. 
The challenge was allegedly initiated by contacting a user named Momo on WhatsApp, who would then send instructions and threats to compel the participants to complete the tasks or face supernatural retaliation. The figure associated with the Momo challenge is a disturbing image of a woman with bulging eyes, a wide smile, and bird-like legs. This image actually originated from a sculpture created by Japanese artists, which had no connection to the challenge itself, but was appropriated by those spreading the rumor. Despite the widespread panic though, investigations found little evidence that the Momo challenge led to any physical harm or that it was a coordinated campaign. Law enforcement and child safety organizations concluded that the challenge was more of a concluded that the challenge was more of a viral hoax than a real threat. The spread of the rumor was fueled by media reports, social media, and parental concern, creating a moral panic that amplified the perceived danger of the challenge. Web driver Chorso. Web driver Torso was a mysterious YouTube channel that became the center of widespread speculation and intrigue. The channel, which began uploading videos in 2013, featured thousands of clips showing simple patterns of red and blue rectangles moving on a white background, accompanied by a series of electronic tones. The videos were short, usually lasting a few seconds to a minute, and seemed to follow no discernible pattern or purpose. This unusual content quickly caught the attention of internet users leading to a whirlwind of theories about its origin and meaning. The mysterious nature of the web driver torso sparked a wide range of theories though. Some speculate that it was a secret communication method used by spies, while others thought it might be an elaborate art project or a test pattern for developers. More fantastical theories suggested connections to extraterrestrial activity or alternate dimensions. The channel's seemingly non name and the cryptic nature of the videos only added fuel to the fire though. The intrigue surrounding web driver Torso grew as media outlets tried to unravel the mystery. The channel's videos were analyzed for hidden messages and its metadata was scrutinized for clues. This digital detective work was kind of reminiscent of solving a modern cryptogram, with each new video serving as a potential piece of the puzzle. The mystery of the web driver Torso though was eventually solved. Google revealed that the channel was part of an automated test system for YouTube designed to assess the quality of video uploads and streaming. The simple shapes and tones were used to detect any degradation in video and audio quality across different resolutions and playback settings. Tier 3 Zalgo Zalgo is a character from internet folklore embodying chaos and corruption. Originating from a meme, Zalgo is depicted as a dark, malevolent force that takes over comics, text, and images distorting and mutilating them with glitch-like patterns and black tentacles. The name Zalgo itself has sort of become synonymous with the style of text editing in which letters are overlaid with numerous stack critical marks creating a visual effect of corruption and disintegration. This editing style is often used to suggest the presence or influence of Zalgo, turning ordinary messages into something unsettling or distorted. The Legend of Zalgo plays on the fear of the unknown and the power of the internet to spread and mutate ideas beyond their original context. Unlike traditional urban legends though that are passed down through generation, Zalgo is more of a product of digital culture and reflects contemporary anxieties about technology, data corruption, and the loss of control over personal information. So yeah, Zalgo is often invoked in discussions about internet privacy, security breaches, and the potential for digital platforms to be used for harmful purposes. The character has been included in a lot of creepypastas, online media, webcomics, and a lot of fan art too. Laughing Jack Laughing Jack is a character that originated from the creepypasta genre and revolves around a clown-like figure who initially appears to children as an imaginary friend, but his intentions become increasingly sinister over time. I didn't really introduce what a creepypasta is because I assumed everyone knows, but if you don't know, it's basically a collection of horror-related legends or images that have been copied and pasted around the internet. So yeah, for this particular legend, it basically goes that Laughing Jack was once a colorful and friendly clown who lived inside a box, similar to a Jack in the Box toy. He was supposedly created to be a companion for a lonely child, offering friendship and fun. However, as the story unfolds, Jack's demeanor changes and he begins to reveal his true nature, which is anything but benign. The transformation of Laughing Jack from a joyful entertainer to a malevolent entity is marked by a significant change in his appearance. His colorful attire fades to black and white, mirroring the dark turn in his behavior. Laughing Jack 
becomes associated with acts of violence and terror, preying on the innocence of the children who once trusted him. The Tale of Laughing Jack is often told as a cautionary story, warning about the dangers of inviting unknown entities into one's life, even if they seem harmless or benevolent at first. Like we said before, the origin of Laughing Jack can be traced back to a creepypasta posted online, and it quickly became a popular figure within the community. Fans of the genre have expanded upon the original narrative, adding their own details and interpretations, which has allowed the legend of Laughing Jack to evolve and grow over time. Devil's Chair The Devil's Chair is an urban legend that revolves around a specific type of cemetery bench, which is said to be cursed or connected to the supernatural. These so-called devil chairs can be found in various graveyards across the United States, each with its own local legend and lore. The stories often involve sinister deals with the devil, ghostly apparitions, and dark consequences for those who dare to sit on these benches, especially after dark. According to legend, sitting in the devil's chair at midnight might result in the devil himself appearing to offer the sitter a deal, grant them a wish, or foretell their doom. Other tales suggest that if you leave an unopened can of beer on the chair overnight, it will be empty by the morning, either consumed by the spirits or by the devil as a token of their presence. The origins of the devil chair legends are kind of varied and murky, often blending local history with folklore. In some cases, these chairs were originally intended as resting spots for visitors to the cemetery, or as memorials donated by grieving families. Over time though, these benign intentions were overshadowed by the tales of curses and hauntings that seemed to accompany such chairs, transforming them into objects of fear and fascination. Each Devil's Chair story is unique to its location and reflects the cultural and historical context of the area. For example, in Casadaga, Florida, the Devil's Chair is part of the local lore in a town known for its spiritualist community. Meanwhile, in other regions, the legend might be linked to tragic events, unsolved mysteries, or even just historical figures with a dark reputation. Kuchisake Ona Kuchisake Ona, or the Slit Mouth Woman, is a figure from Japanese folklore and tells of a woman who roams the streets at night wearing a surgical mask. According to the legend, Kuchisake Ona approaches people, usually children, and asks them a simple question, being, am I beautiful? And if the person answers no, she kills them with a pair of scissors she carries. If the person answers yes though, she removes her mask to reveal her mouth, slit from ear to ear, and asks again, how about now? If the person responds with fear or changes their answers, she kills them. If they say yes, again, she slices their mouth to resemble her own disfigured smile. There are variations though on how to escape Kujisaka Ona's wrath. Some say that by giving a non-committal answer or throwing money or hard candies away from you, you can distract her and make her escape. These methods supposedly give the person a chance to run away while she is busy or confused. The origin of the Kujisaka Ona legend though is kind of debated, but it's believed to have started during the Edo period in Japan with its popularity peaking in the late 1970s and resurfacing periodically. The story has been linked to various historical figures and events, but it remains largely a product of folklore and urban legend. Madame Koikoi Madame Koikoi is an urban legend that originates from West Africa, mainly popular in Nigeria. The story centers around a ghostly figure of a female teacher who is set to haunt schools, walking the crowders at night. According to the legend, Madame Koi Koi is easily identified by the sound of her high heels clicking against the floor, hence the name Koi Koi, which mimics the sound of her steps. The tale kind of varies from one telling to another, but a common version describes Madame Koi Koi as a teacher who is known for her beauty, strictness, and distinctive red high-heeled shoes. After meeting a tragic end, details of which range from a car accident to unjust dismissal from her job, her spirit could not find peace. It said that she roamed school hallways after dark, seeking revenge or continuing her teaching duties from beyond the grave. Encounters with Madame Koikor are described as terrifying experiences. Students claim to hear the sound of her heels approaching, growing louder and then suddenly stopping, often leaving an eerie silence or a cold presence. Some versions of the story even suggest that seeing Madame Koikor or just hearing her footsteps up close can result in dire consequences for students, from failing exams, to more sinister fates. Sewer Alligators The urban legend of sewer alligators is a tale that comes mainly from the United States. According to the legend, alligators dwell in the sewers of big cities, having been flushed down toilets as small pets and then growing to monstrous sizes in the dark, wet underground. New York City is most often cited as the home of these creatures, with stories dating back to the early 20th century. 
The legends suggest that these sewer gators survive on rats, trash, and any other unfortunate animals that find their way into their sewer system. They're said to roam the labyrinth of pipes beneath the city, occasionally surfacing through manholes or broken pipes to the shock or horror of unsuspecting residents. One popular version of the story includes details of maintenance workers or explorers encountering these alligators, leading to panic or fascination. And the tales vary widely, with some describing the alligators as blind and albino from years of living without sunlight, adapting to their subterranean existence. Despite the widespread nature of this urban legend though, there's no concrete evidence to support the existence of a population of alligators in urban sewer systems. The conditions in sewers are harsh and not suitable for alligators, which would require specific temperatures to survive and reproduce. Also, the New York City sewer system, which is often cited as the home of these creatures, is regularly maintained and inspected, with no recorded incidents involving alligators. The origin of the sewer gator legend is thought to be a mix of misplaced fear, fascination with the unknown, and sensational media reports. In the 1930s, for example, newspapers reported finding an alligator in a New York City sewer, but this was an isolated incident, likely involving an abandoned pet rather than a breeding population. And you know, you could say that alligators are found in sewers worldwide, but yeah, the thing about a breeding population, it's much different since it would require much more and a lot of more factors would be in place. Vanishing Hitchhiker The Vanishing Hitchhiker is one of the most widespread and enduring urban legends with variations of the story being told across the world. The basic premise though involves a driver picking up a hitchhiker, usually on a remote or lonely road, who then disappears from the vehicle without a trace, often leaving behind a chilling revelation that they had died years before on that very road. In many versions of the tale, the hitchhiker is a young woman, sometimes dressed in white, signaling purity or a connection to the supernatural. She is typically quiet and mysterious, providing vague or cryptic answers to the driver's questions. As the journey progresses, she might point out a particular location or request to be dropped off at a specific spot. Upon reaching the destination, the driver discovers the passenger has vanished from the back seat. Seeking answers, the driver might inquire at a nearby home or address given by the hitchhiker, only to be informed that the person they described died in an accident at the spot where they were picked up, often on the same date but in a previous year. In some variations, the driver finds an article of clothing they lent to the hitchhiker draped over a gravestone in a local cemetery. Walking Sam Walking Sam is a figure that comes from the legends of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Described as a tall, shadowy entity cloaked in dark attire, Walking Sam is said to roam the reservation, particularly in wooded areas or along remote paths. According to local lore, this figure possesses long arms and is sometimes depicted with no mouth. The legend of Walking Sam is associated with sorrow and tragedy. He is said to whisper to individuals, particularly to the youth, encouraging them to take their own lives. These stories have emerged against a backdrop of real-life struggles faced by the community, including higher rates of people you know, ending their life among young people. This has led some to speculate that the legend of Walking Sam might symbolize the collective grief and challenges faced by the reservation, serving as a manifestation of the community's pain. Efforts to combat the negative influence attributed to Walking Sam have included community interventions, support from tribal leaders, and public health initiatives aimed at providing hope and assistance to those in need. These efforts highlight the community's resilience and its commitment to overcoming the challenges it faces. The story of Walking Sam, while kinda unique to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, echoes broader themes found in folklore worldwide, being themes of warning, protection, and the presence of unseen forces that influence the living. Wendigo the Wendigo is a creature from the folklore of various indigenous peoples from the northwestern forests of the Great Lakes region in North America, mainly among the Algonquin. This mythical being is often associated with winter, the north, coldness, famine, and starvation. The Wendigo is described as a malevolent, cannibalistic supernatural entity with an insatiable hunger for human flesh. Legend has it that the Wendigo is created whenever a human resorts to cannibalism to survive harsh winter conditions. Once transformed, the person is said to become a tall, gaunt figure with, with ashen skin, sunken eyes, and elongated limbs, sometimes depicted with antlers or animalistic features. In some narratives, the Wendigo though can be confronted and defeated by a shaman or warrior. Hodag 
The whole dog is a creature said to inhabit the forest around Rhinelander, Wisconsin. According to local lore, the whole dog is a fearsome beast with a mixed appearance, featuring the head of a frog, the grinning face of a giant elephant, thick short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with spears at the end. This creature is often described as being the size of a large dog or bigger, with green or black skin that adds to its intimidating appearance. The story of the whole dog first emerged in the late 19th century, attributed to a lumberjack and prankster named Eugene Shepard. Shepard claimed to have discovered the whole dog and even captured it, using it to draw crowds and garner attention. He staged photographs and displays featuring the whole dog, convincing many of his contemporaries of its existence. However, Shepard later admitted that the whole dog was, you know, just a hoax, revealing that the creature in his photographs was crafted from wood and animal parts, manipulated to appear alive through wires. Despite its origins as a hoax, though, the legend of the whole dog has since become an integral part of the local folklore around Rhinelander and surrounding areas. The creature is celebrated as a symbol of the region, embodying the spirit of the North Woods with its wild and mysterious nature. The whole dog, you know, has just been embraced by the community now, appearing as statues in local parades and even as the mascot for schools and events. Friday the 13th Friday the 13th is widely regarded as a day of bad luck in many cultures around the world. The superstition is rooted in various historical, religious, and cultural traditions, which have contributed to the belief that this particular day brings misfortune. One theory about the origin of the superstition links it to the Last Supper attended by 13 individuals, the 12 apostles and Jesus on Monday Thursday, with the crucifixion of Jesus occurring the next day, on a Friday. Another historical event that has been connected to the fear of Friday the 13th is the rest of the Knights Templar. On Friday, October 13, 1307, King Philip IV of France ordered the arrest of hundreds of Knights Templar, and many were later executed. In numerology, the number 12 is also considered a symbol of completeness, being 12 months of the year, 12 signs of the zodiac, 12 gods of Olympus, 12 labors of Hercules, etc. On the other hand, the number 13 is seen as irregular, transgressing this completeness. Also, Friday has been historically viewed as an unlucky day to undertake journeys or begin new projects. Despite these origins, there is no scientific evidence to suggest that Friday the 13th is inherently unlucky. Studies examining accidents, hospital visits, and stock market performance have found no significant difference between Friday the 13th and other days. Yet, the superstitions still persist, influencing behavior in surprising ways. This basically means that people may avoid marrying, traveling, or even working on this day. Some buildings even skip the 13th floor, and some streets don't even have a house number 13. The superstition has also been popularized by the media, most notably by the Friday the 13th horror movie franchise, which further cements its association with bad luck and fear in popular culture. Rat Kings Rat Kings are a somewhat gruesome phenomenon and are actually more rooted in historical accounts and folklore than in urban legend. A rat king occurs when a group of rats become intertwined at their tails, which can become knotted together with blood, dirt, ice, or feces, or simply tangled so tightly that the group becomes bound as one entity. The rats are then stuck together and are forced to live and move as a collective, creating a kind of disturbing sight that has sparked some horror throughout history. Historically, rat kings were seen as an ominous sign, often associated with plagues, diseases, and bad luck, given rats' reputation as carriers of illness. The earliest accounts of rat kings date back to the 16th century, with sightings reported mainly in Europe. Specimens have been found and preserved in museums, with some of the most famous examples being displayed in Germany. The term rat king itself originates from the German word Ratenkönig, and folklore around these creatures often imbued them with supernatural qualities. They were sometimes thought to have a special power or control over other rats, hence the term king. In some tales, seeing a rat king was believed to, you know, spell disaster or misfortune. Despite the fear though and the superstition surrounding them, the existence of rat kings has a sort of scientific explanation. It's thought that rat kings could form accidentally when a number of rats living in close quarters, such as in a nest, have their tails become mated and entangled. The phenomenon is kinda rare though, partly because rats are generally very clean animals and groom themselves and each other regularly, so it should prevent their tails from becoming knotted. 
In modern times, the debate continues about whether all historically reported Rat Kings were genuine or if some were hoax. However, the discovery of Rat Kings in the wild is exceptionally rare today, possibly because of the decrease in the population density of wild rats and increased urban sanitation efforts. Futakuchi Ona Futukuchi Ona, which translates to Two Mouth Woman and is kind of reminiscent of the other entry, the Kuchisake Ona. According to the legend, a Futukuchi Ona appears to be a normal woman at first glance. However, she harbors a second mouth on the back of her head, hidden beneath her hair. This second mouth is said to be cursed with an insatiable hunger, being it can speak and it demands to be fed. The origins of this yokai vary in different tellings of the tale. In one version, a woman becomes a Futukuchi Ona as a punishment for neglecting to feed her stepchild, who eventually starves to death. The child spirit then curses her, causing the second mouth to form as a manifestation of her neglect. In another version, the condition arises as a consequence of a woman's deliberate refusal to eat in order to maintain her appearance, or out of stinginess, leading to the formation of the second, more voracious mouth. This second mouth is said to have a mind of its own. It can be vicious and demanding, using the woman's hair as tentacles to feed itself when the, mouth, when the woman does not eat enough food. The mouth is also said to be capable of emitting a screeching voice, which can cause great distress to the woman. To satiate its hunger, the Futukuchi Ona must consume much more food than a normal person would, often to her dismay or ruin. Girl from the Gap the Girl from the Gap is an urban legend also originating from Japan, focusing on a mysterious and malevolent entity that is said to reside in the gaps of homes, meaning between furniture, doors, or drawers, and even in the narrow spaces of walls. This spectacle girl is described as beckoning to people, inviting them to play hiding go seek. However, it's said that those who accept her invitation are led to another dimension, or just vanish without a trace, never to return to the real world. According to the legend, the girl from the gap might appear to individuals who happen to notice her peering out from one of those narrow spaces. She's characterized by her seemingly innocent appearance and quiet, whispering voice, which belies her true intentions. The act of spotting her is enough to initiate the deadly game of hide and go seek, marking the individual for a, you know, eventual sinister fate. Nopero Bo Nopero-bo is a well-known figure in Japanese folklore, described as a mysterious spirit or yokai that appears as a human at first glance, but is actually revealed to have no face, meaning no eyes, nose, mouth, or any facial features whatsoever. This entity is known to terrify unsuspecting people by initially presenting as a normal person, sometimes even as someone familiar to the witness, like a family member, before revealing its true featureless visage. The Legend of Nopera Bo has been told in various forms across Japan and is a popular subject in Japanese literature, art, and theater. Encounters with the Nopera Bo usually occur in the evening or at night in very secluded areas such as rural paths, graveyards, or near temples and shrines. The yokai itself is not known to actually cause any physical harm, but instead its primary intent is to, you know, shock or frighten those it encounters. One famous story involves a samurai who comes across a young woman crying in the road. When he approaches to console her, she turns to reveal a blank, smooth surface where her face should be, causing the samurai to flee in terror. Other tales recount people encountering friends or relatives who suddenly become faceless, leading to a lot of confusion and fear. The origins of the Nobara Bo legend aren't really clear though, but its persistent in Japanese culture points to deep-seated themes of identity, the fear of the unknown, and maybe even just the unsettling notion that the familiar can suddenly become strange and terrifying. Infected Needles Hidden in Gas Pumps According to this legend, unsuspecting individuals pumping gas are pricked by needles concealed in the pump handles, with notes often claiming the needles are infected with diseases like HIV or hepatitis. This story has circulated widely via email, social media, and word of mouth, often accompanied by warnings to check gas pumps before use. Investigations into these claims have consistently found them to be unsubstantiated though. Health officials and law enforcement agencies have debunked the legend a lot of times, noting that there's a lack of verified incidents matching the descriptions in the warnings. The origin of this urban legend is quite unclear, but it does share some characteristics with other ones like the other HIV one. 
Redcaps. Redcaps are mythical creatures found in British folklore, mainly associated with the broader region between England and Scotland. These beings are depicted as dwarfs or goblins who reside within the ruins of castles and towers, places often associated with violence and bloodshed. Characteristics of redcaps include the red caps from which they derive their name, and legend has it that they dye their hats with the blood of their victims, and this act is crucial for their survival. Redcaps are also said to be swift, strong, and exceptionally dangerous, attacking those who trespass into their domains. They wield large, heavy iron pikes and have large teeth, which they use to attack their victims. Despite the ferocity and the danger they pose though, folklore also states that redcaps cannot withstand the recitation of biblical verses or the presence of a cross, which causes them to flee or disappear. The origin of the red cap legend is thought to reflect the violent history of the Anglo-Scottish border region which experienced frequent raids and battles for centuries. Castles and fortifications, often the setting for red cap tales, were common sites of conflict and thus became associated with dark and bloody deeds. In addition to their role as fearsome guardians of their dwellings, red caps are also considered omens of death. Seeing a red cap is believed to be a predictor of doom or misfortune. Over time, the figure of the red cap has entered a lot of popular culture and has even been featured in various forms of media including literature and games. Elevator to another dimension The urban legend of the elevator to another dimension gained popularity online and is often associated with the ritual known as the elevator game. This ritual suggests it provides access to another dimension or world by following a specific set of instructions within an elevator in a building that has at least 10 floors. The game involves a sequence of button presses that must be executed alone. The participant must enter the elevator from the first floor and then visit floors in a certain order, meaning pressing the buttons for the fourth floor, then the second, the sixth, the second again, and finally the 10th floor. If done correctly, when the participant presses the button for the fifth floor after the sequence, a woman is said to enter the elevator. Participants are warned not to look at or speak to her as she is considered a supernatural entity who may take them to another dimension if they do. The legend states that if the ritual is correctly followed, when the elevator returns to the first floor after visiting the fifth, the participant should press the button for the tenth floor instead of exiting. If the elevator ascends to the tenth floor, the ritual is successful and the door is open to another dimension. The world the participant steps into is said to be similar to the real one but with no other people and the only way to return is by entering the same elevator and repeating the ritual in reverse. But yeah, there's no evidence to suggest this actually occurs but you know it's been circling around in the internet a lot. La Llorona La Llorona or the Weeping Woman is a figure in Latin American folklore with roots dating back centuries. This legend tells the story of a woman who consumed by sorrow and rage after a tragic event involving her children, is doomed to wander the earth. According to the tale, La Llorona is often heard weeping for her lost children, and her presence is said to be an omen of misfortune or even death. The most common version of the story describes a beautiful woman named Maria who drowns her children in a river as a form of revenge against her unfaithful husband. Overcome with remorse, she then drowns herself. However, she is not permitted to enter the afterlife until she finds her children. Thus, she is trapped between the living world and the spirit world, endlessly searching for her lost children. La Llorona is often described as wearing a white or black gown and is said to cry endlessly for her children, with her wails being Ay mi hijos or O oh, my children, echoing through the night. Parents often use the tale of La Llorona to caution their children against wandering off alone, especially near bodies of water after dark. While the core elements of the story remain consistent, variations exist across different regions. Like in some versions, La Irona is portrayed as a protective figure who warns children of danger, whereas in others, she's feared as, you know, a harmful spirit who might lure or harm the unwary. The origins of La Irona are kind of difficult to pinpoint as well, with some suggesting that it predates the arrival of the Spanish in the Americas. Elements of the story may also be traced back to Aztec mythology, which includes tales of goddesses associated with water and death, which embody the themes of motherhood and loss. Tomino's Hell Tomino's Hell is a poem written by Yomoto Inohiko, featured in a collection called The Heart is Like a Rolling Stone, which was published in 1919. 
The poem itself describes the tragic fate of a boy named Tomino who descends into hell, painting vivid and disturbing images of his journey through suffering and torment. The urban legends surrounding Tomino's hell suggest that reading the poem aloud can curse the reader, leading to misfortune or even death. This aspect of the legend has been popularized on the internet, where many users have shared stories of their experiences and the supposed consequences of resetting the poem aloud. The poem is written in a hauntingly beautiful but eerie style with imagery that evokes a sense of despair and also horror. It's basically the combination of the poem's unsettling content and the superstition about its recitation that's contributed through the formation of the urban legend. Despite its reputation though, there's no evidence to support the idea that reading Tomino's Hell aloud can actually cause harm to the reader or listener. Phantom Vehicles Phantom vehicles are a recurring theme in urban legends and ghost stories across the world involving cars, trains, ships, or even planes that appear to be from another time or realm, often disappearing as mysteriously as they appear. These tales typically feature vehicles that are seemingly out of place, exhibiting unusual characteristics or engaging in impossible behavior, such as driving at incredible speeds, disappearing into thin air, or even just becoming completely silent. One common type of phantom vehicle legend involves ghost ships like the Flying Dutchman, said to be a spectral ship doomed to sail the oceans forever, never to be able to make port. Signs of the Flying Dutchman have been reported for centuries, with witnesses claiming to see a glowing, ghostly ship appearing in the distance during storms or fogs. Phantom trains are another variant, with stories often set in abandoned or rarely used tracks. These ghost trains are said to appear suddenly, often without a sound, and vanish just as quickly. In some tales, the trains carry passengers who are unaware they are deceased, bound for an unknown destination. Ghost cars also make a significant part of the phantom vehicle legends, which might be what the entry is focused on, but yeah, numerous accounts of encounters on lonely roads at night are reported. These stories frequently involve a mysterious car that suddenly appears to chase or race the driver, only to disappear without a trace. Some legends speak of cars that are recognizably antique or out of time, suggesting a supernatural origin. The origin of these legends are varied though and draws from historical events, accidents, and human fears of the unknown. For instance, phantom vehicle tales may stem from real accidents where vehicles vanish without a trace, leaving behind mysteries that fueled imagination. Rosewell Incident the Roswell Incident refers to an event that took place in July 1947 near Roswell, New Mexico, USA. It began with the crash of an object and the recovery of debris and materials near a ranch. Initially, the US military reported that a flying disc had been recovered, which caused a lot of interest worldwide. However, this statement was quickly retracted and officials declared that the debris was from a crashed weather balloon. The incident faded from public attention until the late 1970s when ufologists began to promote a variety of increasingly elaborate conspiracy theories claiming that one or more alien spacecraft had crash landed and that the extraterrestrial occupants had been recovered by the military which then engaged in a cover up. Investigations and documents declassified in the 1990s revealed that the debris recovered in 1947 was part of a top secret project named Mogul. Project Mogul was a military operation aimed at using high altitude balloons to monitor Soviet nuclear tests. The materials found, including metallic sticks, rubber strips, and foil, were consistent with the technology used in these balloons. Despite official explanations, the Roswell incident has become a focal point for theories about UFOs and alien life. It's inspired movies, books, and TV shows, and contributes to the popular culture surrounding UFOs and the possibility of government cover-ups concerning alien encounters. The city of Roswell even embraces its place in UFO lore hosting an annual UFO festival that attracts visitors from around the globe. Ningen Ningen is a term from Japanese folklore that refers to mysterious, humanoid creatures that inhabit the icy waters of the Antarctic. Descriptions of Ningen have varied but they are often depicted as being enormous in size, measuring 20 to 30 meters in length with a pale, human-like figure that features legs, arms, and even five-fingered hands. Some accounts even mention facial features such as an eye or a mouth, though these are typically described as minimal or indistinct. The Legend of Ningen first gained attention in the 1990s, reportedly originating from accounts by Japanese fishermen 
operating in Antarctic waters. These initial sightings describe encountering strange creatures appear to be submarines or large white sea animals. Interest in Ingen grew further as the story spread through Japanese forums, magazines, and eventually international websites. Despite these reports though, the lack of concrete evidence such as clear photographic or video proof has led to a lot of skepticism. Most available images purported to be of an Ingen are blurry, indistinct, or considered to be doctored or misidentified natural phenomenon. Bloody Bones Bloody Bones, also known as Rawhead or Tommy Rawhead, is a figure from British and American folklore, often told to scare children into good behavior. This entity is usually described as a skeletal figure with raw, exposed flesh, sometimes said to dwell in dark cupboards, under staircases, or in other secluded spots within a home or around dilapidated buildings and marshes. The origins of the bloody bones are believed to trace back to Britain, with the tale migrating to the southern United States, where it since became part of local folklore. The story varies by region, but calmly, Bloody Bones is said to snatch away naughty children who stray too far from home or who dare to venture into its domain after dark. In some versions of the tale, Bloody Bones is accompanied by another entity such as a character called Rawhead or Tommy Rawhead. Rawhead or Tommy Rawhead is sometimes depicted as the bloody, severed head of a pig or as another grotesque creature that works in tatum with Bloody Bones to punish or frighten disobedient children. But yeah, the tales of bloody bones usually serve as cautionary tales and emphasize the importance of obeying parents or guardians and avoiding dangerous or forbidden places. Hungry Snake The Hungry Snake story is a widespread urban legend with numerous variations around the world. The core of the tale though involves a pet snake, often a python or a boa constrictor, that begins to exhibit very strange behavior. This legend taps into common fears about snakes and the potential dangers of keeping exotic pets. In the most common version of the story, a snake owner notices that their pet has stopped eating. Concerned, they also observe the snake laying outstretched beside them at night or sizing them up in an unusual manner. Alarmed by this behavior, the owner seeks advice from a vet or a snake expert, only to be told that the snake is preparing to eat them. The expert explains that the snake's fasting and behavior of stretching out next to its owner are preparations for ingesting the large meal, implying that the owner is the attended prey. This legend plays on several fears, including the unpredictability of wild animals kept as pets and the possibility of misinterpreting an animal's behavior because of anthropomorphism. Snakes, in particular, are often subjects of fear here and misunderstanding, and this tale exploits those fears by suggesting that even a seemingly tame animal can pose, you know, a lot of danger. Critically, herpetologists and snake experts have debunked this story though as a myth. Snakes do not measure their prey before eating, nor do they prepare it in the manner described in the legend. Instead, snakes usually eat based on hunger and opportunity, and their fasting can be attributed to various normal reasons like shedding, temperature changes, or just illness. Guy. The tourist guy refers to a widely circulated photo and accompanying urban legend that emerged shortly after the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. The image purports to show a tourist standing on the observation deck on one of the World Trade Center towers with a commercial airplane approaching in the background moments before the attack. The man in the photo is dressed in casual tourist attire, complete with a camera slung around his neck, seemingly unaware of the painting disaster. The photo quickly gained traction on the internet shared via email and online forums as a supposed last photo taken before the tragedy stuck. The story that accompanied the photo varies in details but often suggested that the camera was found in the wreckage and the photo was retrieved from it. However, it was soon revealed that the Tor Sky photo was actually a hoax. The man in the photo who was later identified from Hungary took the picture in 1997 during a visit to the World Trade Center. After the 9-11 attacks, he digitally altered the photo to include the approaching plane and initially shared it with friends as a dark joke. The image was not intended for public distribution, but it quickly went viral online. Crabzilla Crabzilla is a tale that involves a gigantic crab said to reside near Candy County Harbor, England. The story gained momentum from a couple of photographs that appeared on the internet showing an enormous crab alongside boats and under a bridge. 
The first photo depicted the crab on the bank of the harbor, suggesting it measured an astonishing 49 feet and 572 inches, which would be a really colossal creature. The second photo presented a somewhat smaller version of Crabzilla, being observed by two children fishing by the bridge. These images sparked discussions, theories, and even concern about the existence of such a massive crustacean in the waters of England. However, the fascination with Crabzilla took a turn when both photos were confirmed to be hoaxes. The first image was supposedly captured via Google Maps. This claim led many to scrutinize Google Maps images closely, searching for signs of the crab or other unexplained phenomena, but yeah, it was confirmed to be hoaxes. Happy Yappy Happy Yappy is a fictional character from an internet urban legend originating from a creepypasta. The story of Happy Yappy revolves around a supposedly lost Nickelodeon show from the early 2000s, featuring an anthropomorphic apple named Happy Yappy who helps children with their problems. However, as the series progresses, the content becomes increasingly disturbing, with Happy Yappy exhibiting violent and sinister behavior. The Legend of Happy Yappy details how the show started innocently, with episodes dealing with common childhood issues and teaching moral lessons. Happy Yappy, who is the main character, was portrayed as a friendly apple on a stick, always smiling and eager to help. The show was said to be aimed at young children and featured simple, low-budget animation. According to Urban Legend, viewers began to notice a shift in the show's tone with each new episode. Happy Happy's methods of helping children started to take on a dark and gruesome nature, with episodes reportedly featuring scenes of Happy engaging in acts of violence under the guise of providing assistance. These episodes were said to include graphic content not suitable for the show's target audience, causing concern among parents and viewers. The creepypasta alleges that the show was abruptly cancelled because of its inappropriate content, with all episodes removed from broadcasts and any other mentions of Happy Happy scrubbed from Nickelodeon's history. The story suggests that only a few individuals remember watching the show, with some claiming to possess VHS recordings of the original episodes. As the urban legend grew, various online forums and communities began to discuss and share details about Happy Happy, with people creating fan-made episodes, artwork, and theories about the show's existence. Some claimed that the show was part of a psychological experiment, while others believed it was created by a disturbed individual with access to children's television program. Monoliths in Utah, California, and Romania In late 2020, a series of mysterious monoliths appeared in various locations around the world. The first of these monoliths was discovered in the remote desert of Utah, followed by subsequent appearances in California, Romania, and other global locations. These structures, made of metal and standing at a height of about 3 meters, were placed without explanation, leading to a flurry of theories regarding their origins. First of all, the Utah monolith was found by wildlife officials on November 18, 2020, when conducting a helicopter survey of bighorn sheep in a secluded area of the desert. The structure was a triangular prism, made of what appeared to be stainless steel and firmly planted in the ground. Its location was not disclosed to the public to prevent individuals from attempting to reach the remote and potentially dangerous area. Despite this, determined adventurers managed to locate the monolith, visiting the site and sharing images and videos on social media. Shortly after the discovery in Utah though, a similar monolith was found on a hillside in Romania, near the city of Paetranemat. And like its Utah counterpart, the Romanian monolith was metallic though it featured circular patterns on its surface. It appeared almost overnight on November 26, 2020, near a well-known archaeological landmark. Days later, another monolith was reported on the top of a mountain in California. This monolith too resembled the ones found in Utah and Romania. As with the previous structures, the origins of the California monolith were unknown, and no individuals or groups came forward to claim responsibility for its installation. The appearance of these monoliths led to widespread media coverage and public fascination, drawing comparisons to the monoliths described in Arthur C. Clarke's science fiction novel 2001 A Space Odyssey and the film adaption directed by Stanley Kubrick. This association fueled a bunch of theories that the monoliths were either art installations inspired by the film or part of a prank. Investigations into the monoliths yielded no definite answers. The Utah monolith was then removed by an unknown group on November 27, 2020, with witnesses reporting that individuals had dismantled the structure and transported it away in a wheelbarrow. 
Similarly, the Romanian monolith disappeared just days after its discovery, and the California monolith was removed by a group of young men who replaced it with a wooden cross. Despite extensive speculation though, the creators of the monoliths remained anonymous. Some suggested that the monoliths were a form of guerrilla art, while others speculated about extraterrestrial involvement or viral marketing campaigns. A Day with SpongeBob SquarePants A Day with SpongeBob SquarePants, the movie, is an unproduced and unreleased direct-to-DV mockumentary that has become the subject of an internet urban legend and a lost media search. The film was allegedly created by Innovism Inc., a company with little to no significant track record in animation or film production. According to the limited promotional material and descriptions available online I could find, the movie was supposed to offer a fictional and unauthorized narrative focusing on an actor portraying Spongebob and his interactions with a young fan during a day out. Interest in the movie spiked when its Amazon listing came out and a cover image depicting a crudely rendered Spongebob appeared on the internet. The description basically promised a behind the scenes look at Spongebob's life. However, attempts to purchase the DVD led to cancelled orders, and no buyers confirmed receiving a copy. The search for a day with Spongebob Squarepants quickly turned into a significant online mystery, with individuals and groups from various lost media communities attempting to uncover the truth behind the movie. Internet detectives contacted individuals associated with the project, including the artists responsible for the cover art and even companies supposedly involved in its distribution. Despite these efforts, tangible evidence of the film's completion or distribution remained elusive. Further investigation into Invism Inc. and other entities associated with the project suggested that the film might have been a concept that never progressed beyond initial planning stages. The lack of credible information, coupled with the absence of any official licensing from Nickelodeon or Viacom, reinforced the conclusion that the movie might have been a hoax or a project that was announced prematurely and subsequently abandoned. Tier 4 999 Phone Charging Myth The urban legend of dialing 999 to charge your phone battery is actually a myth that circulated widely, especially in the United Kingdom, where 999 is the emergency services number. According to a myth, if you're in a situation where your phone's battery is critically low and you need to make an emergency call, dialing 999 and then quickly disconnecting would somehow give your phone a small amount of battery charge, enough to make a call. This legend interests a lot of people, primarily because it suggested a hidden feature or a hack within mobile phones, enabling them to draw a burst of power from the act of dialing emergency services. The story played on the universal fear of being stranded or in danger without a means of communication. However, this claim has no basis in reality. Mobile phones don't have the capability to convert the dialing of emergency numbers into energy to charge the battery. The myth likely gained traction because of misunderstanding of how mobile phones work and the critical importance of maintaining battery life for safety reasons. Emergency services and telecommunications authorities have since debunked the myth, emphasizing that dialing 999 without a genuine emergency is misuse of emergency services and is considered illegal. Such actions can tie up emergency lines and potentially delay response to actual emergencies. Authorities have issued reminders that the public should conserve battery life and prepare for emergencies by keeping mobile phones charged, especially when traveling or even just in situations where charging may not be possible for extended periods. Black Volga The Black Volga is an urban legend that took off in the 1960s and 1970s throughout the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. The story centers around a mysterious black Jay-Z Volga limousine said to be associated with numerous abductions, primarily of children. The legend has various versions and interpretations, but common elements often include the involvement of sinister figures like priests, nuns, or even vampires and satanists who are believed to be operating the vehicle. According to the legend, the black Volga would appear out of nowhere, and those who approach the car or are unfortunate enough to be caught by its occupants would disappear without a trace. In some variations of the story, the Black Volga was said to be driven by dark, ominous figures who wear black garments, fueling fears of kidnapping for organ trafficking or for more supernatural purposes. The vehicle itself, a JZ Volga, was a symbol of luxury and power in the Soviet Union. This association with authority led to sinister credibility to the stories, as implied connection to the state's darker, secretive aspects. 
The Legend of the Black Volga reflected broader societal anxieties, though, during a period of intense political repression, censorship, and the widespread fear of the unknown. It sort of served as a cautionary tale, which warned children and adults alike of the dangers of interacting with strangers and the state's perceived ominous presence in everyday life. Authorities at the time attempted to dispel the rumors and fears surrounding the Black Volga, but the legend still persisted. The mystery of the Black Volga has since never been resolved, instead becoming a part of the collective consciousness and a reflection of the era's social and political tensions. Chupacabra The Chupacabra, a creature whose name translates to goat sucker in Spanish, is a cryptid rumored to inhabit parts of the Americas. The legend began in Puerto Rico in the mid-1990s and has since spread to many other Latin American countries and parts of the United States. The creature is said to attack and drain the blood of livestock, especially goats, hence its name. Initial reports of the chupacabra emerged in 1995 in Puerto Rico when farmers found their goats dead with peculiar circular puncture wounds and reportedly drained of blood. Descriptions of the creature are varied though, with some witnesses describing it as a reptile-like being, possessing leathery or scaly greenish-gray skin and sharp spines or quills running down its back. It's said to be about 3-4 to four feet tall and stands and hops in a fashion similar to that of a kangaroo. Another common description is that of a strange breed of wild dog that is mostly hairless, with a pronounced spinal ridge, unusually pronounced eye sockets, fangs, and claws. Despite numerous sightings and reports of livestock killings attributed to the chupacabra, no definite evidence of the creature's existence has been found. The Hook The Hook is an urban legend about a killer with a hook for a hand, targeting couples in parked cars. Thought to have originated in the 1950s in the United States, it gained widespread attention after being mentioned in the Dear Abby advice column in 1960s. The story typically involves a young couple in a car hearing a radio report about an escaped sealer killer with a hook. Deciding to leave for safety, they discover a hook hanging from the car door upon their return home, suggesting a narrow escape from the killer. This legend varies in details but commonly includes elements such as the sound of scraping on the car door or the couple spying the killer. In some versions, the encounter ends with the discovery of the woman brutally murdered or the couple managing to escape by the narrowest margins. An alternative narrative involves the couple stopping in a secluded area, only for the man to leave the car for some reason, leaving the woman to discover her fate indirectly through a gruesome token left by the killer. Despite its fictional nature though, the hook has been linked to real life fears of Lovers' Lane murders, such as the 1946 Tescarcana Moonlight murders, suggesting a basis in actual events that has been transformed into a more generalized urban myth. The Licked Hand The Licked Hand, sometimes known as the Doggy Lick or Humans Can Lick Too, is a popular urban legend with an eerie twist. The early instances of this story appeared in print tracing back to at least February 1982. Over time, it has evolved with numerous variations, each adapting to the cultural context or adding elements to intensify the horror. The core of the tale, though, revolves around a young girl or an old woman spending the night alone save for the company of their loyal dog. On this particular night, news of a killer on the loose reaches the protagonist, heightening her sense of fear. She ensures all possible entry points are secured but unknowingly misses one. As the night deepens, she is disturbed by the dripping sound from her bathroom but is too paralyzed by fear to investigate. Seeking comfort, she extends her hand to the floor beside her bed where her dog is sleeping. The warm, wet lick she receives in response soothes her enough to endure the night. The next morning brings a really gruesome discovery. The protagonist finds her dog dead, often hanged and mutilated in the bathroom, with the drip drip noise attributed to the dog's blood. A chilling message written in the dog's blood, humans can lick too, reveals the horrifying realization that what offered her comfort in the night was not her dog, but the killer. Avril Lavigne Replacement the Avril Lavigne Replacement Conspiracy Theory is a narrative that emerged on the internet. According to this urban legend, the Canadian pop rock singer Avril Lavigne, who first rose to fame in the early 2000s with hits like Complicated and Skater Boy, died in the mid 2000s. The theory suggests that following her alleged death, record company executives decided to replace her with a lookalike to continue profiting from her music career. 
This lookalike, purportedly named Melissa Vandella, then took over Levine's public persona, music productions, and appearances. The origin of this conspiracy theory is traced back to a Brazilian fan site that claimed to present evidence of Levine's replacement, including discrepancies in her physical appearance like changes in her nose, birthmarks, and height, differences in her handwriting, and a supposed shift in her music style and voice. Proponents of the theory also point to cryptic messages in her songs and music videos, which they interpret as hints about the truth of her death and replacement. Skeptics and rationalists, however, have widely debunked this conspiracy theory, attributing the alleged differences to natural changes over time, makeup, photographic angles, and the evolution of an artist's musical style as part of her creative growth. Furthermore, no credible evidence supports the claim of Levine's death or the existence of a doppelganger taking her place. And Levine herself has actually addressed the conspiracy theory in her interviews, dismissing it as a rumor and reiterating her identity as the real Levine. Despite her responses though, the legend persists in some corners of the internet as an intriguing story. Polybius Polybius is a legendary arcade game said to have appeared briefly in 1981 in Portland, Oregon before vanishing without a trace. The urban legend surrounds a game that reportedly caused severe psychological effects including amnesia, insomnia, night terrors, and hallucination among its players. According to the legend, the game was part of a government-run psychological experiment with men in black visiting arcades to collect data from the machines, analyzing how the game affected players. The origin of the Polybius legend is not really clear though, with the earliest mentions appearing on internet forums in the early 2000s. No credible evidence of the game's existence has since been ever found, including game ROMs, cabinet photos, or eyewitness accounts that can be independently verified. The name Polybius might have been inspired by the ancient Greek historian, known for his assertion that historians should verify their reports through eyewitness testimony. Despite the dubious origins though, the legend of Polybius has interest the imagination of the gaming community and beyond, inspiring various media adaptions, including games that pay homage to the myth. Chain letters. Chain letters are messages sent to received with the instruction to copy the letter and send it to a certain number of other people. The content of these letters often includes a story or a message that claims to bring good luck, wealth, or happiness to those who forward it and bad luck or misfortune to those who ignore or break the chain. Despite their seemingly harmless nature though, chain letters have been the subject of interest, skepticism, and sometimes fear because of their claims and the psychological pressure they exert on recipients to comply with their demands. The origins of chain letters can be traced back to the early 20th century, with some of the earliest examples appearing in the form of letters asking the recipient to pray for the success of a particular cause, promising good fortune in return. Over time, the context of chain letters evolved, incorporating elements of urban legends, hoaxes, and superstitions. Some chain letters even took on a more threatening tone, suggesting dark consequences for recipients who failed to keep the chain going. Chain letters have been distributed through various means over the years, from handwritten notes passed among friends, to mass emails and social media messages in the digital age. The advent of the internet and email has significantly increased the reach and speed of chain letter distribution. While many people dismiss chain letters as harmless fun or simple nuisances, others view them with suspicion or fear, mainly those that contain threats of bad luck or harm for not complying with their instructions. Some chain letters have been linked to scams and phishing attempts, exploiting the format to trick recipients into revealing personal information or sending money. Authorities and experts often advise against participating in chain letters, especially those that ask for money or personal information. Jersey Devil The Jersey Devil is a creature said to inhabit the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey in the United States. The creature is often described as a flying biped with hooves, but there are many variations. Most descriptions make it out to be a kangaroo-like or wyvern-like creature, with a horse or goat-like head, leathery bat-like wings, horns, small arms with clawed hands, legs with cloven hooves, and a forked tail. It's been reported to move quickly and is often described as emitting a high-pitched blood-curdling scream. The Legend of the Jersey Devil dates back to the 18th century and the most popular origin story says that it was a 13th child of Mother Leeds, a local witch. In 1735, burdened by the prospect of another mouth to feed, she cursed the child, declaring it would be the devil. When the child was born, it was normal, 
but then changed into a creature with hooves, a goat's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. And it killed the midwife before flying up the chimney and heading into the pines. For over 250 years, there have been numerous sightings and reports of the Jersey Devil throughout the Pine Barrens and surrounding areas. During the week of January 16 to 23, 1909, newspapers published hundreds of claimed encounters with the Jersey Devil from all over the state. Among alleged encounters, claims included attacks on a trolley car in Haddon Heights and a social club in Camden. Police in Camden and Bristol, Pennsylvania supposedly fired on the creature to no effect. Other reports initially concerned unidentified footprints in the snow, but soon sightings of creatures resembling the Jersey Devil were being reported throughout even South Jersey and as far as Delaware and Western Maryland. Green Clawed Beast The Green Clawed Beast is a lesser known cryptid reported to have attacked a woman in 1955 near the Ohio River in the United States. The encounter contributes to a small but interesting part of American folklore mainly because of its singular and dramatic nature. According to the account, a woman named Mrs. Darwin Johnson was swimming with a friend in the Ohio River near Evansville, Indiana, when something grabbed her from under the water. The creature, described by Johnson, had large claw-like hands that clasped around her knee, pulling her under the water. She fought desperately and managed to break free from its grasp, thanks in part to the timely intervention of her friend. When she emerged, she bore a green, hand-shaped bruise on her leg, which served as a physical testament to her terrifying encounter. Mrs. Johnson reported that the beast had hairy, clawed hands, making it unlike any known aquatic or semi-aquatic animal in the area. The event is isolated too, with no known preceding incidents or subsequent sightings of the so-called green clawed beast. Following the attack, Mrs. Johnson was reportedly visited by someone claiming to be an Air Force colonel who took her statement but advised her to refrain from speaking about the incident publicly which added some mystery and conspiracy to the tale. Spiteful Mermaid of Pyramid Lake The Spiteful Mermaid of Pyramid Lake is rooted in the folklore surrounding Pyramid Lake, a remnant of the ancient Lake Lahonatan that once covered much of Nevada. The legend mixes with the cultural heritage of the Peyote tribe, indigenous to the area, and reflects the deep respect and caution they hold towards natural bodies of water. According to the legend, the mermaid entity residing at Pyramid Lake possesses both captivating beauty and a malevolent nature. The origin of the mermaid legend dates back to peyote oral traditions, where it was said that a mermaid residing in the lake would often interact with a tribe. Initially, these interactions were peaceful. However, the relationship between the tribe and the mermaid soured because of undisclosed reasons. But some versions of the story suggest that the mermaid's advances were rebuked or that she was mistreated by members of the tribe. As a result, the mermaid's demeanor shifted from benign to vengeful as she began to exert her wrath upon the people. The legend describes the mermaid luring young men to their deaths with her enchanting voice and striking appearance. Those who succumbed to her lure were never seen again, presumed drowned in the depths of the lake. The tribe came to view these tragic incidents as a stark reminder of the consequences of disrespecting or angering the spirits of nature. In an attempt to appease the mermaid and put an end to the series of unfortunate events, the tribe reportedly sought to banish her from Pyramid Lake. Elders and shamans perform rituals, directing the mermaid towards another location, which varies depending on the version of the legend. However, despite these efforts, it's said that the mermaid's presence is still felt, and her story remains a cautionary tale among the Paiuti people and others familiar with the legend. Cadbur's Horse Cadbur's Horse, often abbreviated as Caddy, is a sea serpent or cryptid rumored to inhabit the coastal waters of the Pacific Northwest of North America. Its name is derived from the Cadboro Bay in Victoria, British Columbia, and the Greek word Saurus meaning lizard. Signs have been reported from the Alaskan Panhandle south to the coast of California, with a concentration of settings reported in the waters between British Columbia and North California. The first reported settings date back to the late 19th century, but it was during the early to mid 20th century that Cadbur's horse gained significant attention. Numerous sinus accounts have been documented, including those by fishermen, sailors, and residents along the coast. Some of the most compelling evidence for Cadbur's horse's existence includes photographs and videos, although these have often been subject to debate regarding their authenticity, like a lot of cryptid, you know, evidence. One of the most famous pieces of evidence though is a series of photographs taken in 1937 by members of a whaling station near Naden Harbor, British Columbia. The photos allegedly show a Cadbur's horse carcass, 
but skeptics argued that the creature could have been a misidentified basking shark or other known marine animal, as basking shark carcasses can decompose into shapes that some might mistake for a plesiosaur-like creature. 2012 Phenomenon the 2012 phenomenon centered around the belief that significant events, potentially world-changing or apocalyptic, would occur around December 21st, 2012. This date was considered the end date of a 5,126-year cycle in the Mesoamerican Long Count Calendar. Activities and celebrations took place globally, particularly in countries that were part of the ancient Maya civilization such as Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. The origins of the 2012 phenomenon lie in the Mesoamerican Long Count Calendar, which is often associated with the Maya civilization. This calendar was linear, keeping time in units roughly corresponding to 20 years, with the completion of 13 Bactuns, which is about 5,125 years, marking significant cycles. The transition from one cycle to the next was seen as a time of renewal or change rather than apocalyptic end. Speculation about 2012 included various astronomical alignments and numerological formulae. Some interpretations suggested a positive, transformative event leading to a new era, while others predicted catastrophic ends ranging from solar flares to planetary collisions. Despite these speculations though, scholars and astronomers debunked these theories as pseudoscience, pointing out misrepresentations of Maya culture and basic astronomical facts. The calendar itself didn't predict an end to the world, and Maya inscriptions and modern interpretations often focus on the cyclical nature of time, suggesting that while one cycle ended, another would begin, and not like any apocalyptical things. Notably, no classical Maya accounts for casted doom, and the idea that the long count calendar ends in 2012 misrepresented Maya history and culture. Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light is a well-known urban legend that emerged around the 1980s. The narrative basically centers on two college roommates, Julie and Meg, attending the same science class. As the midterm approaches, Julie is invited to a party by a popular student, while Meg opts to stay behind to study, emphasizing her dedication to her academics. Julie spends the evening at the party, enjoying herself thoroughly, whereas Meg remains in her dorm, committed to preparing for the upcoming exam. Upon returning in the early hours, Julie chooses not to disturb Meg, presuming her to be asleep, and decides against turning on the lights. The following morning, Julie discovers a horrifying scene, being that Meg has been brutally murdered in her bed with her study materials splattered with blood. A chilling message written in Meg's blood on the wall, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the lights, reveals the gruesome reality that the murderer was present in the room when Julie returned. Hangy Munchkin The Hangy Munchkin legend is associated with The Wizard of Oz, a film released in 1939. According to this urban legend, a small figure can be seen hanging from a tree in the background of a scene where Dorothy, the Scarecrow, and the Tin Man are on their way to the Emerald City. It's been widely speculated and rumored that this figure is a Munchkin actor who, despondent over unrequited love affair, ended their own life on set. The legend suggests that this tragic event was accidentally captured during filming and remained unnoticed by the editors, thus making its way into the final cut of the movie. This story has persisted for decades fueled by the grainy resolution of VHS tapes and early television broadcasts, which made the background of the scene difficult to discern clearly. It gained further traction with the advent of home media, allowing viewers to examine scenes frame by frame. In reality though, the alleged Hangy Munchin is actually a large bird from the Los Angeles Zoo brought on set to create a more dynamic and natural forest environment. Several large birds, including cranes and peacocks, were allowed to roam the set during filming. The scene in question, when viewed in high definition or on remastered editions of the film, clearly shows a bird stretching its wings rather than, you know, person hanging. Despite thorough debunking by film historians, cast members, and crew, the legend sort of still persists. Ogopogo Ogopogo is a legendary creature said to inhabit Okanagan Lake, located in British Columbia, Canada. The legend of Ogopogo has a long history with origins among the First Nations in the region. They called the creature Nahaatik, which means lake demon or water god, and told stories of a serpent-like entity residing in the lake, requiring a live sacrifice for safe passage across the water. The Mar name Ogopogo derives from a 1924 English music hall song, and the creature is often described as a multi-humped, serpentine body with a horse-like head. 
sightings and purported encounters with Ogopogo have been reported for decades with the first documented accounts by European settlers in the 19th century. Descriptions of the creature vary though with some witnesses reporting a creature up to 50 feet long with a dark greenish complexion. It's often depicted with humps that protrude from the water much like those of a serpent or a prehistoric dinosaur. Throughout the years, there have been numerous efforts to capture evidence of Ogopogo's existence, including photographs and video footage. However, much of this evidence has been inconclusive, often attributed to misidentifications of common lake phenomena such as floating logs or waves caused by boat wakes. Despite the lack of concrete evidence though, the legend of Ogopogo still persists and attracts a lot of tourists to Okanagan Lake in hopes of spotting the creature. Gore Orphanage the story, of Gore, the story of Gore Orphanage and Swiss Hollow, located in Vermilion, Ohio, has a history of over a century of tales. Despite being deeply rooted in local lore, the narrative of a devastating fire at an orphanage that resulted in the loss of numerous children's lives is not supported by historical evidence. Instead, the true story of the area, which is known for its haunting phenomena, is pretty complex. The legend of Gore Orphanage, as is calmly retold, describes a catastrophic fire at an orphanage where many children perished, unable to escape a burning building. This tale, however, conflates several unrelated historical events and locations into a single horrifying story. In reality, the Light of Hope Orphanage, established by Reverend Johann Sprunger in 1902, was located on Gore Road. The name Gore Orphanage derives from the road's name, which itself was named due to a surveying error that left a strip of land resembling the gore of a dress. This orphanage, while real, was not the site of a tragic fire described in the legend. Instead, the true stories of the orphanage involve allegations of neglect, abuse, and harsh conditions faced by the children under the care of the Sprungers. The Swift Mansion, part of the property where the orphanage was located, adds another layer to, you know, the lore there. Originally built by Joseph Swift, the mansion later became known for its connection to the Wilbur family, who were involved in spiritualism and reported to hold seances in the home. After the Wilbers left though, the mansion fell into disrepair and became a target for vandalism and legend, eventually burning down in 1923 under circumstances unrelated to the orphanage story. Over time, the tragic fire at their school in Collinwood, which did result in the deaths of many children, became mistakenly associated with the Gore Orphanage legend. Despite no evidence of a deadly fire at the orphanage itself, many visitors to Gore Orphanage Road report unexplained phenomena such as apparitions, mysterious lights, and the sounds of children's cries. These reports contribute to the area's reputation as one of the most haunted in Ohio. Fresno Nightcrawlers The Fresno Nightcrawlers is a mysterious entity that has been spotted in multiple locations, primarily in Fresno, California and, and Yosemite National Park. This cryptid has also been seen in Portland and more recently in Billings, Mont and more recently in Billings, Montana in April 2020. The creature is known for its appearances in video footage where it displays distinctive physical characteristics, notably its long legs and small upper body with no discernible arms. The first report setting occurred in April 2010 when a Fresno resident referred to as Jose captured the creature on his home surveillance system. This event was followed by additional footage from Yosemite showing two creatures, one significantly smaller than the other, with visible webbing from the knees to the upper body on the larger one. Another recording in Poland shows a similar entity, although the footage is shaky, indicating it was captured with the handle of the camera. The creature's traits align with those observed in the earlier sightings, suggesting a consistent appearance across different locations. Various theories though have been proposed to explain the Fresno neck collars, ranging from an extraterrestrial being to a new species, possibly a type of primate with unusually short arms. Other explanations include a misidentified deer, pants, or a puppet on a wire, a crane-like bird, or even a hoax involving a balloon or remote-controlled cars. Hanging Tree The Hanging Tree is an urban legend that centers around a specific tree, often located in a secluded or historically significant area, which is said to have been used for executions, typically by hanging in the past. This legend is not tied to a single location, but appears in various forms across many cultures and regions. Each iteration of the hanging tree legend usually carries with it stories of the people who were executed there, the reasons for the executions, and the supernatural phenomena that are said to occur around the tree as a result of its grim history. Many hanging tree legends involve the spirits of those 
who were unjustly executed haunting the site with reports of ghostly apparitions, unexplained sightings such as the creaking of ropes or the desperate gasps of the hanged and feelings of unease or dread among visitors. The legend often serves as a cautionary tale about injustice or as a reminder of a dark chapter in a community's history. The trees themselves are usually described as being old with gnarled branches and a foreboding presence enhancing the reputation as a place of death. In some stories, the tree's growth is said to have been affected by Tusa's gallows, with branches growing in unusual shapes or the tree displaying an unnatural vitality or resistance to dying. Notable examples of hanging trees can be found in various states across the US, such as the famous hangman's tree in California, which was used during the gold rush era, or the hanging tree in Goliath, Texas, associated with the execution of Texan soldiers during the Texas Revolution. Similar stories can be found in other countries, where a particular tree becomes the focal point of local ghost stories and legends because of its association with executions or acts of violence. Dark Watchers The Dark Watchers are a group of mysterious figures reported in the Santa Lucia Mountains along the central coast of California. These entities have been described as tall, shadowy figures often seen standing on ridges and peaks of mountains watching those who pass along the area. They're typically depicted wearing wide brimmed hats and cloaks, which gives them an old, timeless appearance. Reports of these figures date back to the Chumash people, the Native American tribe that originally inhabited the region. Legend of the Dark Watchers was popularized though in the 20th century through literature and local folklore. Notably, John Steinbeck mentioned them in his short story Flight, published in 1938, and his son Thomas Steinbeck also wrote about them. These accounts have contributed to the mystique and interest surrounding these figures. Eyewitnesses who have reported seeing the Dark Watchers describe them as appearing to be observing or contemplating, disappearing when approached or directly looked at. They're most often seen in the late evening or twilight, particularly when the fog is rolling in. But there have been no reports of direct interaction or communication with these figures, and they don't appear to be malevolent in nature. Skeptics suggest that the sightings of the Dark Watchers could be attributed to a phenomenon known as pareidolia, where the human mind perceives a familiar pattern such as a human figure, where none actually exists. Others propose that atmospheric conditions peculiar to the area might create visual distortions that some interpret as the Dark Watchers. Large Antarctic Sea Mammal In 1958, a Japanese research ship in Antarctica reported a mysterious sighting of an enormous sea mammal, unlike anything known to science. This event took place on February 13 at 7 p.m. in the icy waters of Ludso Home Bay. The creature observed was so extraordinary that the captain of the vessel, the Soya, nicknamed it Antarctic Godzilla because of its massive size and dotic appearance. Descriptions of the creature suggest it was of monumental size, with physical features that led some to speculate they might belong to the same mysterious species as the Cabagon, another cryptid of legend. Speculation around the nature of this sighting has varied widely though. Some suggest it could have been a misidentified known animal, perhaps an unusually large whale given the poor visibility and the challenging conditions of Antarctic exploration. Others suggest the notion of an undiscovered species, a real life leviathan in the depths of the Antarctic Ocean, hidden away from human eyes. Agamemnon Counterpart Agamemnon Counterpart is a title that refers to a piece of media, specifically a video, that became known through internet sharing and is often discussed in the context of creepy, unsettling, or surreal media found online. Originating as a form of internet lore, the video gained attention for its cryptic, bizarre nature and the discomforting feelings it evokes in viewers. This piece of media exemplifies how digital content can quickly become enveloped in mystery and speculation. The video itself is action animation featuring distorted characters and scenes accompanied by dissonant sounds and music, which many find disturbing or unnerving. The content and the aesthetic of the video are reminiscent of experimental animation or public access television from the late 20th century, along with low fidelity visuals and audio. It's this quality, along with the video's ambiguous origins and meaning, that has fueled its mysterious status. Upon its discovery by internet users, Agamemnon counterpart had a lot of discussions regarding its origin, purpose, and the message behind its presentation. Some theories suggest that it's an art project designed to evoke an emotional response or to comment on aspects of media consumption, psychology, or society. Others believe it's simply a creative experiment with no deeper meaning intended by the creator. Tier 5. Annabelle Annabelle is a doll that many believe to be haunted. 
This doll is not just a toy, but it's actually a Raggedy Ann doll that became famous thanks to a story told by Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were paranormal investigators. The doll was originally given to a student nurse in 1970. Soon after those strange events started happening, leading to the belief that the doll was possessed by the spirit of a girl named Annabelle. The student nurse and her roommate noticed the doll seemed to move on its own and would sometimes be found in different positions or rooms from where they left it. They also found messages on paper that looked like a child's handwriting, though no children were found in the house. A psychic medium told them that a spirit named Annabelle was attached to the doll. According to the medium, Annabelle was a young girl who had died in the area and found comfort in the doll and the two women. They tried to accept and nurture the spirit, but the doll's actions became more disturbing, including physical attacks. The Warrens then got involved after hearing about these incidents. They concluded that the doll was not possessed by a spirit, but was being manipulated by an inhuman presence, specifically a demon seeking a human host. They took the doll to their alcohol museum in Monroe, Connecticut, where it was placed in a glass case believed to prevent the entity from causing harm. The story of Annabelle has influenced pop culture a lot. It's inspired movies in the Conjuring universe where the doll appears more terrifying than the original Raggedy Ann. This adaption for the screen includes a porcelain doll with a more sinister appearance, which is a lot of contrast to the original doll's soft, fabric exterior. Baby Train The Baby Train legend tells of a small town experiencing an unusually high birth rate attributed to the sound of a freight train passing throughout night. This legend, first appearing in Christopher Morley's 1939 novel Kitty Foyle, has variations in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. The essence of the story though is that the train's whistle disrupts the town people's sleep, leading couples to engage in intimacy since it's too late to sleep again but too early to rise, resulting in a surge of births 9 months later. Australian author Bill Scott in his book The Long and the Short and the Tall narrates a version set near Sydney where a government official investigates the town's thrice average birth rate. He discovers the town's proximity to a railway line with the train's nightly stops and whistles leading to the town's high birth rate. The myth reflects broader themes seen in other tales and real events where disruptions, like power outages or natural disasters, supposedly led to birth rate spikes. For example, rumors of increased births following the Northeast Blackout of 1965 or the Boston Blizzard of 1978 suggest a similar pattern, though often these spikes are not supported by data. Blue Star Tattoo the Blue Star Tattoo legend is an urban myth suggesting that temporary tattoos soaked in LSD are distributed to children. These tattoos allegedly feature a blue star or popular cartoon characters. The legend gained traction in the United States and has appeared in schools across various countries including Brazil, Italy, and the UK among others. Flyers warning parents often accompany the spread of this myth, sometimes attributed to reputable hospitals or advisors to the president, advising parents to contact police if they encounter such tattoos. This legend likely stems from the way LSD was historically distributed on blotter paper, which can feature various designs including cartoons. However, there's no documented evidence of LSD being distributed to children through temporary tattoos. Despite the chemical properties of LSD, which don't allow it to effectively penetrate skin in a way that would cause hallucinogenic effects from touching or looking at tattoo, the myth still persists. The spread of this legend has been notably facilitated by poor quality photocopies of warning flyers, and more recently through internet mailing lists and websites. Eyeless Jack Eyeless Jack is a character from a creepypasta story. This character is often described as a figure in a black hoodie and a dark, expressionless blue mask, lacking visible eyes with a mysterious black liquid dripping from where the eyes should be. Despite this appearance though, Alice Chak has a complex backstory that contributes to its actions within the stories in which he appears. The character is known for its unique and horrifying habit of removing and consuming the kidney of his victims, often while they are asleep. This aspect of the character suggests that he possesses not only anatomical and medical knowledge, but also the ability to perform these procedures quietly and efficiently. His abilities include high intelligence, evasion, teleportation, and a form of sight that doesn't rely on eyes, among others. The version of Eyeless Jack is not fully detailed though in the original creepypasta. In one popular version, Jack was a college student who was transformed into a demonic entity following a ritual gone wrong. Another account describes him as being used in a cult sacrifice, which turned him into an entity known for stealing organs. The Legend of Eyeless Jack started with a photograph being posted online and was later accompanied by a story. 
Over time, Alice Jack has become one of the most recognized creepypasta characters, alongside others like Jeff the Killer and Slenderman. Maanak Phra Kanong Maanak Phra Kanong is a ghost story from Thailand and tells about Ma Nek, a woman who lived by the Phra Kanong Canal in Bangkok. It's said that she loved her husband, Mak, very much, but when Mak was sent to war and badly hurt, Ma Nak died with her baby during childbirth. When Mac came home, he found Mainek and her child waiting for him, not knowing they had died. Neighbors told Mac that his family were ghosts, but he did not believe them until one day he saw Mainek stretch her arm in a very unnatural way. Realizing the truth, Mac ran away, and to escape, he hid behind a bush that ghosts are said to avoid, and later saw refuge in a temple, a place Mainek could not enter. Angry at being separated from her husband, Mainek became furious and went on to scare a lot of people in Phra Kanong. A monk though finally stopped her by capturing her spirit in a jar and thus throwing it into a canal. But there's some different endings to the story, including one where a monk convinces Maynak to move on to the afterlife with promises of future reunion with her husband. Historians researched the legend and found a story from 1899 suggesting Maynak might have actually been real. According to the story, she was the daughter of a local leader, to prevent his father from remarrying and sharing their inheritance, her son might have started the ghost stories. Men in Black Men in Black are part of an urban legend that tells of mysterious figures who appear to enforce silence or compliance regarding UFOs and extraterrestrial encounters. These individuals are described as wearing black suits, exhibiting unusual behaviors, and possessing a very intimidating presence. They're often reported to approach individuals who have witnessed unidentified flying objects or have had direct contact with extraterrestrial beings, advising or threatening them to keep their experiences secret. The origin of the Men in Black legend though isn't clearly defined, but it became widely known in the 1950s and 1960s during a time when interest in UFOs surged in the United States. One of the first to report an encounter with the Men in Black was Albert K. Bender, a UFO researcher who claimed in 1953 that he was visited by three men in dark suits who warned him to stop investigating UFOs. Bender's experience, detailed in his later publications, contributed a lot to the lore surrounding the MIB. These encounters though are not limited to any single location since there's reports coming from various parts of the world. Descriptions of the men in black vary but common descriptions include their all black attire consisting of suits, hats, and sunglasses, and pale or unusual facial features and their method of transportation is often described as large, black, unmarked cars. Also, men in black are said to exhibit odd behaviors, such as displaying a lack of understanding of common social cues or possessing outdated technology. Witnesses have reported feeling extreme fear and anxiety during and after encounters with the MIB, sometimes accompanied by mysterious illnesses or psychological effects. Skeptics argue that men in black are a product of cultural folklore though, and influenced by the Cold War era spy paranoia and popular media. Also, critics suggest that the phenomenon can be explained by psychological factors such as the misidentification of government or military officials or as fabrication stemming from the heightened state of UFO interest. Raymond Robinson Raymond Robinson is actually a real person who became the center of an urban legend known as the Green Man or Charlie No-Face. He lived in Pennsylvania and was born in 1910 and when he was 8 years old, Raymond was involved in a tragic accident. He was basically electrocuted by a trolley line, which resulted in severe injuries that led to a loss of his eyes, nose, and one of his arms. Despite severe disfigurement though, Raymond survived the accident. However, his appearance was significantly altered, which led him to live a life of relative seclusion. To avoid causing alarm or distress to others due to his appearance, Raymond chose to take his walks at night. This habit, along with the rarity of his public appearances, contributed to the development of myths and legends surrounding his figure. Local lore in Pennsylvania told of the Green Man or Charlie No-Face, a figure who roams the roads at night, mainly along State Route 351 in Beaver County. According to the legend, this ghostly or monstrous figure was often seen by motorists and local teenagers. Over time though, the story came to light. Despite the frightening stories circulated about him, those who actually met Raymond during his night walks described him as a gentle and friendly person who enjoyed social interaction, which he lacked because of his appearance. 
he would often chat with those who offered him a cigarette or beer, happy for the company. Robinson eventually passed away in 1985, but his story lives on as an example of how a real person's life can evolve into an urban legend. Rougarou The Rougarou, also known as Loup Garou, is a creature in French, Canadian, and American folklore, mainly in the Cajun and Creole, and Creole cultures of Louisiana. This creature is often described as having a human body and the head of a wolf or a dog, with glowing red eyes and sharp teeth. It's basically like the North American version of the European werewolf, but it has its own unique stories and characteristics. According to a legend, the Rougarou roams the swamps and forests of Louisiana, as well as the fields and forests of the Canadian provinces. It's said to hunt and kill those who do not follow the rules of the Catholic Church, including not observing Lent. The creature is often used by parents though to scare children into good behavior, telling them that the Rougarou will come after them if they don't behave. Also, the curse of the Rougarou is thought to last for 101 days, and during this time, the cursed person must not mention the curse to anyone. If they speak of it, the curse will remain with them forever. However, if they keep the curse a secret, it will pass on to the next person after the 101 days are over. The origins of the Rougarou legend are believed to have begun with French settlers in Canada, later spreading to Louisiana with French Canadian immigrants. And also, some stories suggest that the creature will hunt down and punish individuals who disrespect the environment, especially those who litter in the swamps and bayous. But yeah, despite its fearsome reputation, it's pretty popular in Louisiana culture, and is celebrated in festivals, stories, and even tourist attractions. Way to Hell The Way to Hell is an urban legend that claims a borehole drilled in Siberia penetrated into hell, releasing the screams of the damned. This story gained widespread attention in the late 20th century and continues to be and continues to fascinate a lot. According to the legend, a team of Soviet engineers supposedly drilled a hole that was more than 14 kilometers deep in a remote part of Siberia before breaking through to a cavity. The temperature sensors indicated extremely high temperatures of over 1000 degrees Celsius, which was unexpected for the Earth's crust. The most sensational part of the tale though came from claims that a microphone, which was lowered into the hole, captured the tormented screams of the damned. The horrifying screams from the earth's depths were said to have been recorded, and the story further claimed that many of the drilling team members were so terrified by the screams that they decided to quit the project. The origin of this legend can be traced back to a group of American and European Christian fundamentalists in the 1980s who were often engaged in disseminating end-time prophecies and tales of divine retribution. The story was first published in a Finnish newspaper and was later picked up by other international media, including tabloids and Christian newsletters, which spread it widely without much verification. The tale though took on a new life when in 1989, Trinity Broadcasting Network, a prominent Christian television network, aired a program that featured the Way to Hell story, giving it further credibility among those predisposed among those predisposed to believe in literal interpretations of hell. Not long after, the story was debunked though when it was revealed to be a hoax. No credible scientific reports or records corroborate the drilling project and any incidents involving audible evidence of the supernatural. Krampus Krampus is a figure in Central and Eastern European folklore, mainly in the Alpine regions who is also associated with Christmas. Traditionally, Krampus is portrayed as a demonic figure, which contrasts a lot with Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus. While Saint Nicholas rewards well-behaved children with gifts, Krampus is said to punish those who have misbehaved. The origins of Krampus is not entirely clear though, but the figure is believed to predate Christianity, stemming from pagan rituals and later incorporated into Christian traditions. Krampus is often depicted as a beastly creature, covered in black or brown fur with the hooves and horns of a goat. His tongue is usually shown as lolling out, and he has fangs as well. In many portrayals, Krampus carries chains thought to symbolize the binding of the devil by the Christian church, which he thrashes for dramatic effect. He also carries a bundle of birch branches to swat naughty children and a sack or basket strapped to his back, used to cart off evil children for drowning, eating, or transport to hell. The celebration of Krampus Natched on December 5th marks the arrival of Krampus, and on this night, before the feast of St. Nicholas on December 6th, people in some alpine towns participate in Krampus Loaf, or Krampus Run, where individuals dressed as Krampus parade through the streets to scare spectators and dispense coal and ruined bundles. Bodies Buried in the Hoover Dam 
The story that there are bodies buried within the Hoover Dam is a long-standing urban legend. The Hoover Dam, which was an engineering marvel of its time, was constructed between 1931 and 1936 during the Great Depression. It required thousands of workers and the project was both risky and dangerous, leading to the deaths of over 100 workers because of accidents and harsh conditions. However, the legend that workers who fell into the concrete structure were left there and entombed within the dam is kinda unfounded. The construction process of the dam involved pouring concrete in blocks, not in one continuous pour. This method allowed the concrete to cure properly and prevented it from cracking. Each block was small enough that if a worker had fallen in, the construction would have stopped to retrieve the body. Also, the concrete used in the dam was poured in layers that were only a few inches deep, which would make it nearly impossible for a body to be covered quickly and go unnoticed. Leaving bodies in the dam would not only have been inhumane, but would have also compromised the structural integrity of the dam. The occlusion of a human body, which would decompose over time, could create air pockets that might weaken the concrete. Engineers and construction managers at the time were well aware of the importance of the dam's durability and would have definitely not allowed such risks to its structural integrity. The deaths that occurred during the construction of the Hoover Dam were mainly because of industrial accidents, such as falls, being struck by falling objects, or accidents involving machinery. One of the most significant incidents was a carbon monoxide poisoning from tunnel work in 1932, leading to the death of a worker and providing impetus for one of America's first workers' strikes for safer working conditions. Crop circles Crop circles are patterns that appear overnight in fields, mainly in cereal crops where the crop stalks are flattened in such a way to create geometric shapes and complex designs. These formations have been documented worldwide, with a significant number reported in England near ancient sites such as Stonehenge. The phenomenon basically gained widespread attention during the 20th century, linked to various theories about their origins, and some people believed they were natural phenomenon and human activity, or maybe even extraterrestrial involvement. The earliest recorded crop circle dates back to a 1678 news pamphlet in England, referred to as the Mowing Devil. However, the modern phenomenon didn't gain attention until the 1970s, with a significant increase in reports during the 1980s and 1990s. These formations range from simple circles to elaborate patterns covering large areas of land. The complexity and precisions of the designs though have led to widespread speculation and research. Several theories have been proposed to explain crop circles. Natural explanations include wind vortices or the ball lightning phenomenon, suggesting that these forces could create circular patterns. However, the really intricate designs and mathematical precision of many crop circles challenges these natural explanations. Human activity though is another major explanation. In 1991, two men, Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley, claimed responsibility for many of the crop circles found in England. They demonstrated how they used simple tools such as planks, ropes, and wire to flatten crops into specific patterns. Their confession and demonstration showed that complex crop circles could be made by humans within just a few hours. And since then, other individuals and groups have come forward to demonstrate their ability to create elaborate and intricate crop designs. Despite these explanations though, some crop circle enthusiasts continue to believe in paranormal or extraterrestrial theories. They argue that certain features of crop circles, such as cellular changes in the plants and elevated radiation levels, can't be easily explained by human activity or natural phenomena. Researchers in this camp often refer to unexplained instances where lights or unidentified flying objects were reported in the vicinity of newly formed crop circles. Shirokiya Department Store Fire The Shirokiya Department Store Fire was a tragic event that occurred on December 16, 1932 in Tokyo, Japan. It remains one of the deadliest fires in Japanese history, with a final death toll of 14 employees. The fire basically broke out in the Shirokiya Department Store, which was one of the most prominent retail centers in Tokyo at the time. This incident is notable not only for the loss of life, but also for the circumstances that led to the high number of fatalities and the impact it had on fire safety regulations in Japan. And the part where the urban legend comes from is, a widely circulated story suggests that some of these women who were at the top hesitate to jump into safety nets held by firefighters below, fearing exposure because of the traditional practice of not wearing undergarments with kimono. This account has been questioned by scholars and deemed a fabrication though tailored for western audiences. 
Shiochi Inyo, a professor specializing in Japanese customs and architecture, has critically examined this narrative, suggesting that it was connected and that, in reality, most people were rescued by firefighters. Inui's findings challenge the notion that the woman's debts resulted from a choice to preserve modesty over life. This story, despite its questionable veracity, has been repeated in various references books, including publications by the firefighting agency. The Kraken the Kraken is a legendary sea monster of gigantic proportions said to dwell off the coast of Norway and Greenland. Originating from Scandinavian folklore, the Kraken has been a staple of sailors' superstitions and maritime lore for a long, long time. Historical accounts of the Kraken date all the way back to the 13th century with descriptions in Old Norse sagas. These early references describe the Kraken as a creature so large that it is often mistaken for a chain of islands when submerged. The monster is said to possess numerous arms or tentacles, capable of dragging whole ships and their crews beneath the ocean surface. One of the earliest detailed descriptions comes from the 18th century Danish historian Erik Pontopiden, who characterized the kraken as a creature of extraordinary size and power, capable of creating dangerous whirlpools and seizing ships with its tentacles. According to him, the kraken would surface to feed and its appearance was a sign of abundant fish making it kind of a double-edged sword for fishermen. Scientifically though, the legend of the kraken may have some actual roots and sightings of real marine animals. The giant squid, for example, matches the description of the kraken in several ways. Giant squids can grow up to 43 feet in length and have been known to engage in battles with ships. Their elusive nature and rare appearances on the ocean surface could have contributed to the mythological embellishments over the centuries. Yowie the Yaoi is an intriguing figure in Australian folklore, often described as Australia's own version of Bigfoot or the Himalayan Yeti. This creature is said to inhabit the remote and dense forests of Australia, mainly the regions of the eastern and southern parts of the country. Descriptions of the Yaoi kind of vary, but it's generally portrayed as a large, hairy ape-like creature standing anywhere from 6 to 12 feet tall, with a strong bill and imposing presence. The origins of the Yaoi legend can be traced back to the Aboriginal Australian cultures where stories of such creatures existed long before European settlers arrived on the continent. These indigenous tales speak of various beings that resemble the descriptions of the Yaoi known by different names across various Aboriginal languages. The Yaoi is said to possess supernatural powers in some of these stories, blending into the landscape and disappearing at will. European settlers though began reporting sightings of the Yaoi in the 19th century, with accounts often appearing in newspapers. Sightings and encounters typically described a shy but curious creature, with some reports even claiming some aggressive behavior, although those were kind of less common. Skeptics and researchers have proposed several explanations for Yaoi sightings. Some suggest that the creature could be an undiscovered species of ape or a surviving population of an ancient human relative, such as Homo erectus or Gigantopithecus, though there's no concrete evidence to support these theories. Champ Champ, often referred to as Champy or the Lake Champlain monster, is a cryptid said to live in Lake Champlain, a natural freshwater lake in North America that primarily lies within the borders of the United States, but extends into Quebec, Canada. The legend of Champ has a pretty rich history, with both Native American lore and later European settler accounts contributing to the narrative surrounding this creature. Descriptions kind of vary, but most accounts depict it as a large, serpent-like creature. Some eyewitnesses have compared Champ's appearance to a plesiosaur, which draws comparisons with other monsters like the Loch Ness. The history of Champ sightings dates back to the indigenous people of the region, including the Abenaki and Iroquois, who had stories of a creature living in the lake long before European settlers arrived. The first recorded sighting by European is often attributed to Samuel de Champlain, the French explorer who founded Quebec and after whom the lake is named in the early 17th century. However, a closer examination of Champlain's writings reveals no mention of such a creature. Instead, Champlain described a large fish. Over time, the story may have embellished to include Champ as part of the lake's lore. Signs of Champ have continued over the years though, with numerous individuals claiming to have seen the creature or capturing what they believe to be Champ on films or photographs. Like one example is a famous piece of evidence that was taken in 1977 by Sandra Mansi, which appears to show a large creature in the lake. The photograph has been analyzed and debated by experts, but no definite conclusions have been reached regarding its authenticity. Crybaby Bridge 
Crybaby Bridge is a notorious location steeped in urban legend, situated on the border between Prince George's and Anne Arundel counties in Maryland. As one of the oldest bridges in the state, it has become the focal point of numerous chilling tales and local folklore, drawing those intrigued by the supernatural and tragic stories. The Legend of Crabberry Bridge basically tells a tale from the 1970s of a pregnant teenager living in Anne Arundel County. Facing abandonment by the baby's father and subjected to relentless ridicule and abuse by her family, the distressed young woman finds herself with no support. In a moment of utter despair, she goes to the bridge where she drowns her newborn baby before taking her own life in the same dark waters. Alternative versions of the story suggest a more sinister end being the girl and her baby were murdered by her own father. According to this version, after committing the act, he drove to the bridge under the cover of night and disposed of the bodies in the water below. It's said that on certain nights, drivers crossing the bridge might glimpse a pair of headlights and a black sedan following them, only for the mysterious vehicle to vanish upon closer inspection. The bridge basically earned its name Cry Baby Bridge because of reports from locals who claim to have heard the unsettling cries of a baby while crossing the bridge. Bear Lake Monster The Bear Lake Monster is a cryptid set to inhabit Bear Lake, which sits on the Utah-Idaho border. The legend of this mysterious creature dates back to the 19th century and is rooted in articles written by Joseph C. Rich, a Mormon colonizer. To his accounts, initially reported second-hand accounts of the creature, but it's noteworthy that Rich later recanted these stories. Despite this, the Bear Lake Monster has continued to be a tourist attraction in the region, with the last reported setting occurring in 2007. According to descriptions, the Beast of Bear Lake is often depicted as a formidable creature, measuring at least 40 feet in length. It said it possesses short, powerful legs, an appearance that combines elements of a grayish greenish hue with the head of an alligator. The legend details how the monster lurks by the shores, ready to pull in victims or attack swimmers venturing into the lake. A man featured on Monsters and Mysteries in America recounted his encounter with the monster in 2007, describing a growling sound and a subsequent sighting of the creature, which then submerged itself in the water. Several sightings have been proposed like a basilosaurus, a paddlefish, or even a sturgeon, but it's kinda still mysterious. Yaramaya Hu The Yaramaya Hu is a creature from Aboriginal folklore and is basically like a vampire and a goblin mix. Unlike many supernatural beings that might be considered purely mythical by non-native Australians, the Aramayahu holds a place of genuine concern in Aboriginal traditions. Standing 3-4 to four feet tall, the Aramayahu is described as having a frog or monkey-like appearance with a disproportionately large head. Its body is covered in red skin or hair, and the ends of its fingers and toes are covered with octopus-like suckers. It has a wide, toothless mouth resembling that of a frog and is capable of engulfing a human whole. Traditionally, this creature is said to inhabit the foliage of fig trees lying in wait for unsuspecting humans to rest at the base of its tree. It then employs a unique and gruesome method of attack, being dropping down to latch onto its victims, drain their blood, and then drain their blood. Survivors of such attacks are advised to remain passive as the creature ceases its assault once its prey stops struggling. After feeding, the Yaramayahu leaves its victim weakened but alive, only to return to swallow them whole. Glitches in Reality Glitches in Reality, often referred to as glitches in the matrix, are events that seemingly defy the established norms of a physical world. These anomalies, which stretch across all continents and countries, suggest breaches in the fabric of what we perceive as reality. The phenomenon basically encompasses a wide range of incidents, including objects and people spontaneously appearing or vanishing, and even physical impossibilities such as individuals moving through solid matter. This phenomenon is not really confined to a single description or a manifestation, but often includes objects that suddenly materialize or dematerialize, similar to the spawning or despawning mechanisms seen in video games. There have been reports of cars unexpectedly emerging in traffic intersections or people vanishing from videos inexplicably. Specific locations are reputed to experience a higher frequency of such glitch-like events. For example, bottomless pits are perceived as voids on Earth that defy the laws of the surrounding reality, with Mel's Hole being a prime case where objects reportedly fall at a slower pace than normal gravity, and dead animals are mysteriously revived. 
Glitches in reality have been proposed as explanations for various paranormal phenomena. This includes the interpretation of Bigfoot sightings in the Ape Canyon incident of 1924 as manifestations of immaterial beings momentarily crossing into the material realm, similar to interdimensional beings or thought form creations known as tulpa. Historically, the notion that our perceived reality might not be the absolute form of existence has some deep philosophical roots. From Plato's allergy of the cave to Eastern, to Eastern philosophies and the advent of quantum physics, humanity has long contemplated the nature of reality and perception. The theory of reality being a computer simulation has brought a modern twist to these ancient ideas, suggesting our universe might be a fabrication by beings from a higher dimensional reality, which is kind of similar to the Matrix movie if you guys have seen it. Tier 6. Wood Island Light Wood Island Light is a functioning lighthouse located on the eastern edge of Wood Island in Saco Bay, southern Maine coast, marking the entrance to Biddle Ford Pool and the Saco River Terminus. This 47-foot granite rubble tower established in 1808 is notable for its automation in 1986 and its position 71 feet above mean high water, flashing green and white lights every 10 seconds. The urban legend associated with Wood Island Light centers around a tragic event from the 1890s involving a confrontation that escalated to murder and anyone's life. Basically, according to the story, a local squatter, also engaged in lobster fishing, resided on the western part of the woodland. This individual previously had a conflict on the mainland and while on the island encountered a sheriff's deputy. The meeting resulted in the squatter fatally shooting the deputy. After the act, the squatter sought to surrender to Thomas Orca, the lighthouse keeper at the time, who refused him entry, possibly because of fear or confusion. Left to his own devices, the squatter returned to his makeshift home on the island and took his own life. The tale basically concludes with claims that the spirit of the slain deputy lingers around the lighthouse and the island, suggesting his unrest or attachment to the site of his untimely death. Three-Legged Lady The Three-Legged Lady is an urban legend that originates from the Nashford area of Columbus, Mississippi. This legend involves encounters with a ghostly entity known as the Three-Legged Lady who is said to chase vehicles traveling along Nash Road. According to folklore there, the legend has several variations regarding the origin of this figure. One version of the story suggests that the three-legged lady is the spirit of a mother whose daughter was kidnapped and murdered. It said that the daughter's body was dismembered and one of her legs was returned to the mother. In her grief and desire for revenge, the mother sued her daughter's leg to her own body and now roams the area, seeking vengeance or searching for the rest of her daughter's remains. Another interpretation suggests that the three-legged lady was a woman accused of witchcraft. After being punished or executed for her supposed crimes, her spirit returned with an additional leg, either as a mark of her torment or as a symbol of her power in the afterlife, haunting the area around Nash Road. A third version though involves a more personal tragedy, where the three-legged woman is said to have lost her leg in an accident and fashioned a replacement from the wood. Over time, as her story was told and retold, it morphed into the legend of a spectral figure with three legs, haunting the road where her life changed forever. Legend has it that those daring enough to park on Nash Road at night and flash their headlights three times will summon the three-legged lady. She then either appears suddenly by the vehicle or engages in a terrifying chase, with the sound of her three legs heard running alongside or behind the vehicle as it speeds away. Endless Elevators the phenomenon of endless elevators involves elevators that purportedly descend below the known basement levels of buildings reaching deep into the earth. This legend is recognized globally and draws on various cultural narratives and fears about what lies beneath the surface of our world. Originating from tales and theories of Richard Sharpie Shaver as published in the Amazing Stories magazine, these stories introduce an underground world filled with ancient ruins, malevolent reptilian beings, and sophisticated robots. Endless elevators are characterized by the ability to access subterranean levels far beyond the architectural plans of the buildings they serve. These elevators are often linked to networks of caverns and tunnels, suggesting a world teeming with mysteries right under our feet. Contrary to the Hollow Earth theories though, Shaver's narrative depicted a subterranean world filled with danger and inhabited by beings far removed from human benevolence. In Japan, urban legends like the elevator game have popularized the concept of elevators 
as gateways to other dimensions or realms, especially in the wake of the Alyssa Lamb case in 2013. These stories resonate with other legends of mysterious passageways such as stairways to hell and bottomless pits. The explanations for the endless elevators phenomenon range from practical jokes and exaggerated tales to theories about unknown cave systems, ancient ruins, or even entrances to a hollow earth. Some speculate about paranormal or interdimensional phenomena, suggesting that these elevators might serve as wormholes or portals to alternative realities. Accounts of encounters with endless elevators kind of vary. Some stories like Shavers claim personal exploration into this underground realm, with details fluctuating between brief visits and extended stays of up to 8 years. Other accounts include narratives of individuals experiencing torment at the hands of subterranean dwellers, only to be saved by benevolent forces. Also, there are reports of people dreaming about endless elevators long before becoming aware of the legend, suggesting a deeper, perhaps psychological, layer to this legend. Puebla Tunnels The Puebla Tunnels, located beneath the Mexican city of Puebla, transitioned from an urban myth to a significant historical discovery in 2015. Basically, people used to talk about, you know, underground tunnels for a long time, but it wasn't until 2015 that there was actually a historical discovery that was found. These subterranean passages, which were estimated to be about 500 years old, originating in Puebla's historical center and concluding at the Lorado 4, which was the site of the famed Cinco de Mayo battle, the tunnels are spacious enough to accommodate a person on horseback. The purpose of these tunnels though is still up to speculation. Some suggest they might have served various roles, such as facilitating movement of soldiers during the Mexican liberation battle, providing secretive routes for clergy, or even serving as passages for the general populace. As of 2017, these tunnels have been accessible for tours, offering guided visits and a museum experience that provides insight into their historical context and utility. Curse Pillar The Curse Pillar, also known as the Haunted Pillar, stood in Augusta, Georgia until its collapse in 2016. This pillar, which is located at the corner of 5th and Broad Street, was all that remained of a market that once thrived in the mid-19th century. Legend has it that a traveling preacher was denied permission to deliver a sermon at the market. In response, he cursed the structure, prophesying that all would fall except for the one pillar, which would remain standing as a testament to his words. And true to the legend, the market did eventually meet its demise, with the lone pillar standing through numerous natural disasters that otherwise devastated the area, including tornadoes and storms. The pillar basically became a subject of local lore, with additional tales suggesting that bad luck or disaster would befall anyone who attempted to move or vandalize it. Over the years, the cursed pillar attracted attention from both locals and tourists. Despite skepticism regarding the supernatural aspects of the story, the pillar's survival through significant adversities contributed to its reputation. In December 2016 though, the pillar was knocked down by a car, leading to speculations about the continuation of the curse. The incident didn't significantly deter the legend, but instead added a modern chapter to the narrative. Sony Timer the Sony Timer, also known as the Sony Kill Switch, is an urban legend alleging that Sony's electronic devices are designed to fail after reaching a preset time limit, compelling users to purchase replacements. Originating in Japan during the 1980s, the myth suggests this practice is a form of planned obsolescence. Despite widespread belief in its circulation as humor in media and online forums, no evidence has really substantiated these claims. The legend though basically gained traction in the late 1980s and early 1990s in Japan and was localized until the mid 2000s when a defective Sony lithium ion battery recall for Dell laptops revived discussions on this topic. This event brought in the legend's audience internationally via the internet, impacting Sony's reputation and actually affected the sales of Vio laptops because of growing consumer weariness. An incident involving Sony Bravia televisions which were reported to fail around 1,200 operational hours or shortly after warranty expiration due to a software bug exacerbated the situation. Sony though responded by denying intentional product lifespan limitation and attributing the issue to a software glitch, offering patches as a remedy. The legend though then resurfaced in 2021 with the discovery of an anti-cheat mechanism in the PlayStation Network that potentially rendered games unplayable on PlayStation 3, 4, and 5 
because of reliance on an accurate date and time setting, dubbed the C-Bomb. Sony though addressed the outcry by releasing firmware updates for the PS4 and PS5 to resolve this issue. Hitogata Commercial The Hitogata Commercial is an urban legend surrounding a Japanese television advertisement that purportedly aired in the late 1980s to early 1990s. The commercial was for Hitogata, a brand of body pillow, but the intrigue and mystery stem from claims of unsettling and paranormal occurrences associated with viewing the commercial. According to the legend, the advertisement featured a humanoid figure dancing or moving in a peculiar manner, accompanied by distinctive and eerie jingles, with lyrics that some interpreted as a curse or incantation. Viewers who reportedly watched the commercial experienced a range of adverse effects, including nightmares, unexplained feelings of dread, and even physical illness. Some versions of the story suggest that the commercial contained subliminal messages or was cursed, leading to its quick withdrawal from airing. The narrative includes claims that attempts to locate or broadcast the commercial again resulted in technical difficulties or harmful effects to those involved. Despite extensive searches and discussions on the internet, no concrete evidence of the commercial's existence has been found, including video footage or records from the broadcasting network. Mongolon Monster The Mongolon Monster, also known as the Arizona Bigfoot, is a creature reported to inhabit central and eastern Arizona along the Mogollon Rim. Descriptions of the creature resemble a lot like Bigfoot, basically describing it as a bipedal entity. Eyewitness accounts suggest that the Mogollon monster is nocturnal, omnivorous, and exhibits territorial and sometimes aggressive behavior. It reportedly walks with wide, non-human strides, leaving behind large footprints and can even mimic wildlife sounds. Other behaviors include exploring campsites at night, building nests from forest materials, and throwing stones from hidden locations. It's also said to decapitate deer and other wildlife before consumption and to emit a distressing high-pitched scream, similar to that of a woman in distress. The creature is primarily sighted within the Ponderosa pine forest of the Mogollon Rim, with reported sightings spanning from Prescott to Williams, southeast to Alpine, south to Clifton, and back northwest to Prescott. The first recorded sighting dates back to 1903 though, in an account describing a creature with long, white hair and a beard seen near the Grand Canyon. Momo the Monster Momo the Monster, also known as the Missouri Monster, is a creature reported to resemble Bigfoot as well, sighted in rural Louisiana, Missouri during 1971 and 1972. Witnesses described it as a large, bipedal humanoid around 7 feet tall with dark hair and a foul odor. The most notable setting occurred on July 11, 1972, when Doris, witnessing from her kitchen, saw the creature holding a dead dog in her backyard as her younger brothers played outside. The creature was reported by several people in 1972 as well, including the local fire department chief, Richard Allen Murray, who encountered a massive upright creature in his vehicle's headlights while driving along a creek bed. Following these sightings, a 20-person crew was formed to hunt for the creature, but no evidence was found. In 2019, the docudrama horror film Momo the Missouri Monster was released and dramatized the 1972 events, featuring Cliff Barkman and James Bobo Fay from the Animal Planet series Finding Bigfoot. Additionally, Six Flags St. Louis also operated a ride named after the creature from 1973 until 1994. Witch of Yazoo the Witch of Yazoo is a legend centered around a grave in the Glendawood Cemetery in Yazoo City, Mississippi. This grave, which is covered with chain links, is known as the Witch's Grave. The story basically gained widespread attention through Willie Morris's 1971 book, Good Old Boy, although the grave and its legend actually predate Morris's birth, with the chain long having been broken. The legend basically narrates that an old woman lived by the Yazoo River, accused of luring and torturing fishermen. When pursued by the sheriff, she was trapped in quicksand. As she sank, she cursed Yazoo Village, vowing to return in 20 years and burn the town to the ground. On May 25, 1904, a devastating fire indeed swept through Yazoo City, destroying over 200 homes and nearly every businesses, totaling 324 buildings. While the cause of the fire still remains uncertain, some attribute it to the witch's curse, especially given the abnormal and forceful winds that day, which seemed to propel the fire with supernatural intensity. Following the fire, citizens found the chains around the witch's grave broken. 
This discovery fueled beliefs in the curse and the supernatural involvement in the fire's ferocity. And despite skepticism and alternate explanations for the fire, the legend of the Witch of Yazoo still persists. Laki Laki is a demon in Nepalese folklore, prominently featured in various cultural festivals and rituals in Nepal. This figure is not merely a subject of urban legend, but also a significant component of traditional Nepalese culture, embodying both fear and reverence in societal celebrations. Characterized by Frosh's appearance, Laki is depicted as a fearsome demon with a large red face, protruding fangs, and wild hair. The costume of Laki in cultural dances and festivals includes a large colorful mask and traditional attire designed to invoke the demon's intimidating appearance. Traditionally, Laki is believed to be a protector as well as a destroyer, a complex figure capable of intense violence against evil forces, yet also guardian-like towards the community. Laki dances are a common sight during festivals too, especially the Indra Jatra and Dashin festivals in Kathmandu Valley, where performers embody the spirit of Laki, dancing through the streets to drive away evil spirits and protect the townspeople. The most famous Laki is the Majipa Laki or the Laki of Majipa, considered a deity by the Newark community of Kathmandu. Majipa Laki is said to appear during the Indra Jatra festival, performing dances throughout the city of Kathmandu. According to the legend, the Majipa Laki was a wild and dangerous demon who fell in love with a girl from Majipa and chose to protect the city to be near her. Resurrection Mary Resurrection Mary is a classic example of the vanishing hitchhiker urban legend reported to haunt the area around Resurrection Cemetery in Justice, Illinois, near Chicago. Since the 1930s, numerous drivers along the Archer Avenue have reported encounters with a young female hitchhiker described as wearing a white party dress with blonde hair and blue eyes who vanishes as they approach the cemetery. The most detailed account occurred on July 11, 1972 when two young boys playing outside and their sister Doris inside their house near the cemetery witness a large, dark-haired figure holding a dead dog. This figure, which was presumed to be Resurrection Mary, has been cited by others, including a fire department chief and a city council member, Richard Allen Murray, who reported seeing a massive upright creature in his vehicle's headlights in 1973. Bloody Bucket Bridge The Bloody Bucket Bridge legend comes from Florida, mainly associated with the area around Wachala in Hardy County. The story centers on a bridge, often referred to as the Bloody Bucket Bridge, which is said to be the site of numerous paranormal occurrences and ghostly sightings. The name Bloody Bucket itself is derived from the grisly details of the legend that involve a bucket filled with blood. According to the legend, the story dates back to the post-Civil War era. It involves an elderly African-American woman who was known in the community for her skills in midwifery. However, the tale takes a dark turn with claims that, for reasons not fully explained in all versions of the story, she began to kill the newborn babies she was supposed to be delivering. She would then collect their blood in a bucket. Overcome with guilt for her actions, she attempted to dispose of the evidence by dumping the blood into a nearby river at what became known as the Bloody Bucket Bridge. As the story goes, the woman's ghosts, along with the anguished cries of the infants, can be heard near the bridge at night. Some versions of the legend also suggest that the ghostly figure can be seen carrying a bloody bucket to the river, endlessly attempting to wash away her sins. Another element of the legend involves a warning to those who visit the bridge at night. It's said that the ghostly woman becomes angered by the presence of the living, leading to frightening encounters for those who dare to explore the area after dark. Shanghai Dragon Pillar The Shanghai Dragon Pillar, also known as the Dragon Pillar of Shanghai, is an urban legend centered around a decorative pillar located near the entrance of the Yan'an East Road Tunnel in Shanghai, China. This legend gained prominence in the late 20th and early 21st centuries and is basically an example of modern urban folklore blending with traditional Chinese cultural motives. According to the legend, during the construction of the Yan'an East Road Tunnel in the late 1990s, workers encountered numerous difficulties. These included unexplained accidents and technical failures, which were rumored to be caused by the disturbance of a dragon vein, a concept in Chinese feng shui that represents lines of energy or qi believed to flow through the earth similar to ley veins in western mysticism. It was believed that the construction of the tunnel disturbed this dragon vein, thereby invoking the wrath of a dragon spirit. 
To appease the dragon spear and ensure the safety and success of the project, a pillar decorated with the dragon motif was erected at the tunnel's entrance. This dragon pillar was not only meant to serve as an architectural feature, but also as a spiritual pacifier to calm the disturbed dragon and protect the area from further misfortunes. The pillar itself is covered with intricate carvings of a dragon, a symbol of power, strength, and good fortune in Chinese culture. The dragon is also seen spiraling up the pillar, which is a common motif in Chinese art and architecture, and symbolizes the dragon's dynamic movement and celestial power. Guangzhou Shopping Plaza This entry basically refers to an urban legend surrounding the tiny city mall, also known as the Team Plaza, in Guangzhou, China. This legend suggests that the mall is cursed or haunted, leading to a higher than average number of people ending their own life and other tragedies occurring within its premises. It's important to note that while this tale is widely circulated, it blends elements of folklore, rumor, and actual incidents into, you know, an urban legend. The legend began to circulate not long after the mall's opening in the late 20th century. The narrative suggests that the construction of the mall disturbed spiritual forces or that the site upon which it was built had a troubled past, contributing to its purported curse. And as with many urban legends, details vary between tellings, but common elements include stories of individuals inexplicably compelled to jump from the mall's balconies or reports of strange, unsettling feelings experienced by visitors in certain parts of the building. Investigations into these claims typically reveal a combination of factors, including personal issues of the individuals involved and the architectural design of the mall, which may contribute to the perception of the site as prone to such incidents. Skeptics and researchers point out that the number of incidents linked to the mall does not statistically differ significantly from other locations within large cities, suggesting that the legend may amplify normal occurrences into a pattern that feeds the narrative of a curse. Also, mental health awareness and the impact of urban environments on psychological well-being are often cited in discussions about the legend, highlighting the importance of addressing these issues openly and without stigma. Nanjing Battalion The mystery of the Nanjing Battalion involves the disappearance of 3,000 Chinese troops during the Second Sino-Japanese War. In December 1937, the battalion was stationed around Nanjing, tasked with preventing Japanese forces from exiting the city, focusing on defending a strategic bridge on the Yangtze River. On the morning of December 10, 1937 though, it was discovered that the battalion's defensive line had been abandoned, without any signs of struggle or conflict. Weapons were in place, fires were still burning, but the soldiers and officers were gone. Witnesses, including those stationed at the bridge, reported no movement or sounds of combat during the night. Several theories have emerged though regarding the disappearance. One suggests the battalion surrendered to the Japanese, a scenario deemed unlikely because of the lack of evidence and the anticipated harsh treatment of prisoners by the Japanese forces. Another theory suggests desertion, with the soldiers potentially seeking refuge among local farmers, though this too is hard to substantiate given the lack of subsequent sightings or records. But more speculative theories include the possibility of the battalion vanishing into a parallel universe. However, skepticism surrounds the entire narrative, with discrepancies in the dates and events leading to speculation that the story might be a fabrication. The incident's supposed occurrence, either in the lead up to the Battle of Nanjing in December 1937 or in 1939, and the absence of historical evidence or acknowledgement from reputable historians or military records, suggest the possibility that the Nanjing Battalion's disappearance may be more myth than fact. Rolling Calves Rolling calves are part of Caribbean folklore, mainly in Jamaica, where they're considered one of the most fearsome of all mythical creatures of the region. These entities are said to take the form of large, calf-like beasts with eyes that glow like fire. It's said that they roam the countryside at night, especially at crossroads, graveyards, and the outskirts of villages where they're believed to frighten or even harm those who encounter them. The origin of rolling calves is basically tied to the island's history of slavery. They're often thought to be the spirits of people who are wicked in life, mainly those who are involved in the practice of obeya, which is a system of spiritual and healing practices developed among enslaved West Africans. According to the legend, these spirits are condemned to roam the earth in the Rome in the form of rolling calves. 
Rolling calves are described as having chains around their bodies, which make a loud clanking noise as they move, alerting people to their presence. They're said to have a hide that is impervious to human weapons, making them immune to physical attacks. Their appearance is often considered an omen, and seeing one is a sign of bad luck or a warning. To protect themselves from rolling calves, people in Jamaica follow several traditions. One common method is to drop objects on the ground, as it's believed that the creature has to count all the items before it can move on, giving the person time to escape. Another method involves carrying salt or pepper, as these are said to repel the creature. Some also believe that calling out the creature's name forces it to acknowledge the caller and temporarily halts its advance. Three Sacks of Truth The Three Sacks of Truth is a folk tale that underscores the value of honesty and complex nature of truth. It's not really tied to a specific location, as variations of the story appear in different cultures around the world, each with its own unique characters and settings, but still conveys a similar moral lesson. The story typically involves a protagonist, often a young and honest individual, who is set on a journey or given a task by a higher authority, such as a king, a wise man, or supernatural entity. The task basically involves carrying three sacks that represent different aspects of truth, being the truth about oneself, the truth about the world, and the truth that others hold about the protagonist. As the protagonist embarks on the journey though, they encounter various challenges and characters that test their honesty and integrity. Each of these encounters is designed to reveal the content of one of the sacks. For example, the stack containing the truth about oneself might be open when the protagonist faces a situation that tests their self-awareness or humility. The sack containing the truth about the world could be open in circumstances that reveal the harsh realities of life or the nature of human society. Lastly, the sack containing the truth that others hold about the protagonist may be revealed through interactions that show how perceptions can be misleading or influenced by prejudice. The climax of the story usually involves a moment of significant personal growth for the protagonist where they learn the value of truth and the importance of being honest with themselves and others. This revelation often leads to a resolution where the protagonist's integrity is rewarded, sometimes with wealth, wisdom, or a higher social standing. Avon Haunted Bridge The Avon Haunted Bridge is located in Avon, Indiana and spans County Road 625 East, crossing over the White Lake Creek. This railroad bridge, built in the early 1900s, has become the center of local folklore and one of Indiana's notable haunted sites. The bridge's architecture, with its massive limestone blocks and imposing structure, sets a dramatic backdrop for the tales that have emerged over the years. According to local legend, the haunting of the Avon Bridge is rooted in a tragic accident that occurred during its construction. The story tells of a construction worker who fell into the wet cement during the bridge's building and was unable to be rescued. His body, as the tale goes, remains entombed within the bridge's structure and is said that his ghost haunts the site to this day. Witnesses have reported hearing unexplained sounds, seeing mysterious figures, and experiencing an eerie feeling when near or on the bridge. Another version of the legend involves a young mother who, struggling with depression, threw her baby off the bridge and then jumped to her own death. The cries of a baby and the grieving mother's wails are said to be heard by those who visit the bridge at night. San Antonio Haunted Railroad Tracks The haunted railroad tracks located near the San Juan Mission in San Antonio, Texas, at the intersection of Villa Main and Shane, are the site of a haunting legend ingrained in the folklore there. This legend revolves around a tragic accident involving a school bus full of children that met a catastrophic fate at this crossing, leading to numerous accounts of paranormal activity. According to lore, the tragedy occurred either in late 1930s or early 1940s. Basically, a bus carrying school children stalled on the railroad tracks at this intersection. Despite the bus driver's desperate attempts to restart the bus or evacuate the children, a train collided with the vehicle, resulting in the tragic loss of young lives. In another account, a nun driving a bus with children back from a field trip experienced a similar fate when the vehicle stalled on the tracks and was stuck by a train. Miraculously though, the nun survived the incident, but the children did not. Haunted by guilt, the nun later returned to the site, intending to end her own life on the same tracks. However, as the train approached, her car, parked on the tracks, was mysteriously pushed to safety. Upon exiting the vehicle, she discovered small handprints on the truck believing them to belong to the ghosts of the children she failed to save. 
This act of posthumous salvation gave the nun a new purpose, leading her to dedicate her life to teaching orphans. The haunted railroad tracks have since become a focal point for those seeking to experience the supernatural firsthand. Many visitors report their vehicles being pushed over the tracks by unseen hands when parked in neutral near the crossing. Some even apply baby powder to their cars' as rear bumps to reveal the small handprints of ghostly children, serving as evidence of their presence and benevolent intentions. But despite the chilling nature of these accounts, official records don't confirm the occurrence of such a tragic accident at this location. The legend may have been inspired by a smaller, real event that took place in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1938, suggesting that the San Antonio story might be a localized adaption of a broader narrative. Hound of Goshen The ghost hound of Goshen, often referred to as Happy Dog, originates from an urban legend in South Carolina, mainly around a stretch of road in the Sumter National Forest. This legend described the ghost hound as a white furred dog of considerable size, and local folklore suggests that the ghost hound harbors a vendetta against the residents of a nearby town, blaming them for the wrongful death of its innocent owner. The backstory of the ghost hound remains shrouded in mystery though, with few details about the identity of its owner or the circumstances leading to their death. But according to legend, after the owner's demise, the dog began to manifest along a particular road in the forest purportedly seeking justice or retribution for its owner's untimely death. Eyewitness accounts over the years have contributed to the legend's growth, with several people claiming to have encountered the ghost town. These encounters often describe a silent, ghostly figure of a dog that appears without warning and disappears just as quickly, leaving no trace behind except for an eerie feeling among those who see it. Kristaka Kushtaka translates to Land Otter Man and is rooted in the folklore of the Tlingit people, indigenous to the Pacific Northwest coast of North America. These beings are central to the mythology shared by several indigenous groups in the region, each having their own versions. Described as shape-shifting, Kushtakas have the extraordinary ability to transform into humans, otters, and potentially other forms. Accounts vary though with some stories asserting Kushtaka can change into any otter species while others suggest they are limited to a specific kind. The folklore surrounding these beings is pretty complex too, portraying them as creatures with dual natures. In some tales, Kushtaka are Malve, reveling in deceiving sailors to their demise. On the other hand though, other narratives depict them as benevolent spirits, rescuing individuals from certain death by freezing. To fend off Kristaka, various deterrents are mentioned, including copper, urine, dogs, and fire. They're also said to produce a distinct, high-pitched whistle characterized by a low-high-low pattern. Nankanom Tom The urban legend surrounding Nankanom Tom starts in 1767, around the time the ancient Siamese capital of Oyotaya fell to invading Burmese forces. This period marks a significant chapter in Thai history, characterized by turmoil and the capture of thousands of Siamese citizens. Amidst this backdrop, an urban legend emerged which centered around a figure known as Nai Kanotom. In the wake of Ayutthaya's capture, the Burmese organized a seven-day, seven-night festival to honor Buddha's relics. The festival was a grand affair, featuring various forms of entertainment including costume plays, comedies, and sword fighting matches. It was during this festival that King Mangra of Burma expressed a desire to compare the fighting prowess of Thai fighters against his own champions. Nai Kanotom was chosen to represent the Thai fighters and was brought forth to the boxing ring, which was set up in front of the throne for the king to witness the contest. As the fight commenced, Nai Kanotom unleashed a barrage of punches, kicks, elbows, and knees, overwhelming his opponent until the latter collapsed. Impressed by his skills, King Mangra proposed a challenge to Nai Kanotom, asking if he would face nine other Burmese champions to prove his might. Kai Kanotom accepted this challenge and fought against each opponent consecutively with no rest periods between the fights. His final adversary was a renowned kickboxer teacher from Rakhine State who Nai Kanotom defeated using a series of powerful kicks. King Mangra, astonished by his ability to defeat 10 opponents in succession, allegedly praised him by saying every part of the Siamese is blessed with venom. Even with his bare hands, he can fell 9 or 10 opponents, but his lord was incompetent and lost the country to the enemy. If he had been any good, there was no way the city of Ayutthaya would ever have fallen. And yeah, that's basically how the story goes. 
Nordic aliens. Nordic aliens, also known as Pleiadians or the Tall White Aliens, are a subject of interest within ufology, described as humanoid extraterrestrials. These beings are said to originate from the Pleiades star cluster. Legend of Nordic aliens has grown over the years, fueled by various eyewitness accounts. They are characterized by their tall stature, pale skin, long blonde hair, and blue eyes, distinguishing them from humans primarily by their larger foreheads. The interest in Nordic aliens gained momentum from an incident reported on October 21, 1954 in England. Basically, a woman and her two children claimed to have seen a large UFO hovering over their home. Initially, the mother thought the strange noises were her children playing, but upon investigation, she discovered them outside, staring at the sky. Skeptical at first, she soon witnessed the object herself and reported seeing two humanoid figures inside. This sighting prompted a flurry of speculation and interest, although the story was later pulled from British news outlets for reasons that remain unclear. Nordic aliens are often portrayed in a positive light though, with some accounts suggesting they possess advanced knowledge and technology that blends science with what appears to be magic. They are also said to engage in spiritual activities, like meditation, and have goals that presumably include helping humanity awaken its spiritual potential. A notable figure in the Nordic alien lore is Virlon, purportedly a representative of the Astra Galactic Command. Virlon's message famously interrupted a UK television broadcast in 1977, urged humanity towards peace, warning of the dangers of weapons, and advising on the importance of spiritual evolution. Isles of Sholas Murders The Isles of Sholas Murders refers to a chilling event that took place in March 1873 on Smutty Nose Island, part of the Isle of Shoals, located about 10 miles off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine. The incident basically involved the brutal murder of two women, Anathy Christensen and Karen Christensen, by a Prussian fisherman named Louis Wagner. Wagner, who had previously worked in the area and was familiar with the victims, was living in poverty in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at the time. Driven by desperation and knowing that the men of the household would be away fishing, he rode to Smanino's island during the night with the intent to steal money he believed was in the house. The situation though turned deadly when Wagner was discovered by the woman. In a panic, he murdered them with an axe. A third woman, Marin Hotvet, managed to escape and hid among the rocks on the island until she was rescued the following morning. Wagner then fled the scene but was later arrested, tried, and convicted for the murders. He was then executed in 1875. The Isle of Shoals murders has since become part of local folklore, surrounded by stories of hauntings and ghost sightings on Smynos Island. The case has also been subject of various books, articles, and investigations, intrigued by the isolated nature of the crime and the survival of Marin Hauntvet under harrowing conditions. Dead Ship of Platte River the Dead Ship of Platte River in Wyoming is a well-known legend that tells of a ghostly ship appearing on the river between Torrington and Alcova. This ship is said to emerge from a thick fog, with both the ship and its crew appearing covered in frost. According to the legend, the ship predicts the death of someone by showing their body on the deck, covered with a canvas sheet. The identity of the deceased is known to the person who sees the ship. The first report of seeing the ship dates back to 1862 by a man named Leon Weber, a trapper who claimed to see his fiancée's body on the ship. She reportedly passed away on the same day. Similar incidents were reported by others, including a cattleman in 1887 who saw his wife's body and a man in 1903 who saw his friend's body on the ship. In each case, the sighting happened in late fall and the person seen on the ship died on the day of the sighting. Signs of the ship had been reported in locations such as 6 miles southeast of Guernsey, Wyoming and at Bessemer Bend on the Platte River. Vomitoriums The concept of a vomitorium is often misunderstood in modern culture. Many people think it was a place where ancient Romans went to vomit during meals to make room for more food, which is like basically the urban legend, but this image fits more into the idea of room and gluttony but isn't actually true. A vomitorium in ancient Rome was actually an entrance or exit in large public buildings, like amphitheaters or stadiums. The term comes from the Latin word vomitus, which Macrobius, a Roman writer, used to describe how crowds seemed to erupt out of these passageways, similar to vomiting. This misunderstanding likely started in the late 19th or early 20th century because of the similarity to the words and existing stereotypes about Roman excess. 
Historical texts like those by Seneca, a Stoic philosopher, have contributed to the misconception. Seneca mentioned Romans vomiting at banquets, but he was basically criticizing their luxury, not describing a common practice. In reality though, both wealthy and poor Romans ate primarily grain-based diets, with the wealthy having more access to wheat and meat. Roman feasts did include elaborate dishes too and presentations, but there's no evidence they involved routine vomiting to consume more food. Corpse Light Corpse Light, also known as Will o' the Wisp or Ignis Fatus, are phenomena where lights appear at night over marshes, swamps, and other wet grounds. These lights have been part of folklore in many cultures around the world, often attributed to spirits or ghosts leaving travelers astray. The scientific explanation for these lights involves the combustion of gases like methane, which is released by the decomposition of organic material in wet areas. When this gas comes into contact with oxygen and a spark or other source of ignition, it can ignite, creating a flickering light. Despite the scientific understanding though, corpse lights have been surrounded by urban legends and stories. They're often seen as omens or warnings, sometimes believed to mark the location of a death or to lead people to treasure. In some tales, they're considered the spirits of the dead, unable to find peace. Miniwashitu The Miniwashitu, also known as a war monster of the Missouri River, is a creature reported to inhabit the Missouri River in central North Dakota. Described as a large, hairy bipedal being, it stands 7 to 8 feet tall and is said to resemble the sheep squatch of West Virginia. The Miniwashitu has a pretty unique appearance with bison-like hide and fur, one eye, a single bison horn above its eye, hooves similar to those of an elk, human-like hands, and even a spine resembling that of a chupacabra. This creature is a significant part of the local Mandan tribes' folklore, believed to have the power to break up river ice during spring, indicating its activity increases with warmer temperatures. The Legend of the Miniwashitu was documented in 1921 by Melvin Randolph Gilmore, a curator for the North Dakota State Historical Society. According to Gilmore, the Miniwashitu is a fearsome entity within the Missouri River, rarely seen by humans. When spotted though, it could cause a red glow in the water and was accompanied by a loud, roaring sound. The sighting of this creature was considered an ill omen too, with witnesses reportedly becoming insane and dying shortly after the encounter. Gilmore's account describes the Miniwashitu as having a red buffalo fur, a single eye and a horn on its forehead, and a jagged, saw-like spine. Raven Mocker The Raven Mocker is a feared entity in Cherokee mythology. This being is considered the most malevolent of Cherokee witches, which is known for its acts against the sick and dying. The Raven Mocker's primary aim is to basically steal the hearts of those near death, thereby extending its own life by the years the victim would have lived. Typically described as appearing elderly or entirely invisible except to specific medicine men, the Raven Mocker can transform into a fiery shape, flying through the air with the sound of a raid flying through the air with the sound of a raven's cry and a strong wind as it searches for its next target. And when it finds a victim, it's set to torment and eventually kill them by removing the heart without leaving any physical marks. These entities are feared not just by the people but also by other witches in Cherokee folklore who may mistreat the body of a raven mocker after its death. However, certain medicine men, through their powerful practices, can see a raven mocker and are believed to have the ability to cause its death within 7 days. Grateful Dead The Grateful Dead or Grateful Ghost refers to a story motif in a series of related folk tales that appear in various cultures worldwide. The central narrative though involves a traveler who comes across the corpse of someone who didn't receive a proper burial, often because of an unpaid debt. The traveler either settles the dead person's debt or pays for their burial. Later on, the traveler's life is saved or they are rewarded by the person or an animal, which turns out to be the soul of the deceased they helped earlier. This entity, known as the Grateful Dead, can appear in many forms such as a guardian angel, an animal, or another traveler, and usually enters the story towards the end of the traveler's journey. The Grateful Dead story basically encompasses various subtypes that focus on different aspects of the legend. There's also tales where the Grateful Dead helps the hero rescue a princess, win a bride through a tournament, or deal with a monster or evil spirits afflicting a maiden. These stories highlight themes like the importance of giving someone a proper burial, the belief in the soul's journey after death, and the idea of reciprocal kindness or rewards for good deeds. 
this motive has basically been present in literature from ancient times. The Adventure of the German Student The Adventure of the German Student is a short story written by Washington Irving. It basically tells the tale of a young German student, Gottfried Wolfgang, who is deeply engrossed in his studies and has a fascination with the supernatural. Sent to Paris to continue his education, Wolfgang becomes distressed by the chaos of the French Revolution swirling around him. One story midnight, night, Wolfgang encounters a beautiful and mysterious woman sitting on a guillotine steps. Feeling compassion for her, he offers her shelter in his apartment. The woman, silent and seemingly traumatized, accompanies him. They basically spend the night together, but when Wolfgang wakes up the next morning, he discovers that the woman is dead. Horrified, Wolfgang summons the authorities, who revealed that the woman was executed the day before and had been a victim of the guillotine. The story basically concludes with Wolfgang's mental collapse, unable to cope with the realization that he had spent the night with the revenant or ghost. Nalba Naliba is an urban legend from Karnataka, India that has become popular in the 1990s. It basically translates to come tomorrow in English. According to the legend, a witcher Malavan spirit roams the streets at night, knocking on doors and mimicking the voices of relatives to trick residents into opening their doors. Those who do are said to meet fatal consequences. To ward off the spirit, residents began writing Naleba on their doors and walls, instructing the witch to return the next day, thus creating a cycle where the spirit is perpetually postponed from entering homes. The story kind of varies across regions within Karnataka and has parallels in neighboring states like Telanga and Adra Pradesh. In some versions, the spirit seeks to abduct the household's primary breadwinner, often depicted as a bridal ghost searching for her husband, bringing misfortune to the family. AIDS Mary The urban legend of AIDS Mary emerged in the late 20th century during the height of the AIDS epidemic. It revolves around the story of a woman who is allegedly infected with HIV and intentionally spreads the virus to others as a form of revenge. According to the legend, this woman, referred to as AIDS Mary, targets unsuspecting men, often by seducing them. After the encounter, the men would reportedly receive a message from her revealing her HIV positive status and indicating that she had intentionally transmitted the virus to them. This legend basically reflects broader societal fears and misconceptions surrounding HIV during the time, particularly the stigma attached to those living with the disease. It also taps into anxieties about trust, intimacy, and the unknown aspect of the virus's transmission. The story of AIDS is married though has been debunked as a myth, with no verified cases matching the narrative. However, it did serve as a cautionary tale that played into the moral panics and misinformation prevalent during the early years of the AIDS crisis. Spiders in the Hairdo The Spiders in the Hairdo urban legend involves a story about a person, typically a young woman, who gets a very elaborate hairstyle. According to the tale, the hairstyle is so intricate that it is left untouched for a long period, either because it's too difficult to restyle or because of the individual's desire to maintain its appearance. The legend claims that spiders basically find their way into the hairdo, nest there, and eventually the spiders cause harm to the person, leading to severe injury or even death when they bite the scalp. Kesaragi Station Kesaragi Station is an urban legend from Japan about a mysterious train stop that doesn't appear on any maps. The story begins with a woman named Hasumi on her regular commute when she knows the train isn't stopping as it usually does. After a long period without stops, the train halts at an unknown station named Kisaragi Station, which is deserted and eerie. Trying to figure out her situation, Hasumi posts on an internet forum seeking help. She decides to get off the train and finds herself alone at the station. Despite searching for ways to leave, including trying to hail a taxi and calling her parents, she remains stranded. The atmosphere grows increasingly unsettling, marked by strange sounds and a creepy encounter with a one-legged man. As Hasumi attempts to leave by walking along the train tracks, she encounters bizarre situations that escalate her fear. After a final unnerving experience with the man who offers her a ride, Hasumi's updates stop, leaving her fate unknown. The Legend of Kisagari Station has had a significant cultural impact, inspiring a Bollywood film titled Stri and other creative works. This also led to a surge of interest in the supposed location of Kisaragi Station, with some visiting Saginomiya Station, believed to be the motive for the urban legend. Enshu Railways, which operates in the area speculated to be Kisaragi Station's location, received numerous inquiries and capitalized on the legend by temporarily renaming a station and selling replica tickets. Better Grease Singing Sands 
The Bedigree Singing Sands is a phenomenon located on the shores of Bedigree, Michigan. This natural occurrence involves the sands on the beach producing musical or humming sounds when the wind passes over them or when they are disturbed. The sound produced can vary, often described as singing, whistling, or humming. Local legends have attempted to explain this phenomenon, with stories ranging from the spiritual to the supernatural. Some tales suggest the sounds are spirits of the past communicating, while others believe they are simply the result of the unique composition of the sand and the environmental conditions. Scientifically though, the singing sands are understood to be caused by the shape, size, and distribution of the sand grains. Certain conditions such as dry sand and specific wind patterns can amplify the sound, making better agree a notable location for experiencing this rare natural acoustic phenomenon. Hot Rod Haven The legend of Hot Rod Haven centers around a stretch of road that is said to be the site of a tragic accident involving a hot rod race gone wrong. According to a tale, in the 1950s or 1960s, a group of teenagers were racing their modified cars along this secluded road when one of the drivers lost control, resulting in a deadly crash. The accident claimed the life of a young driver, and ever since, the area has been rumored to be haunted by the ghost of the teenager and his hot rod. Witnesses have reported seeing a phantom vehicle speeding down the road at night, only to disappear without a trace. Others have heard the sounds of screeching tires and a crashing car, but upon investigation, find no evidence of any accident. Some locals believe that the ghostly hot rod appears as a warning to discourage reckless driving and remind visitors of the dangers of high-speed racing. Efforts to locate official records of the accident though have been futile, leading skeptics to dismiss the story as an urban legend. However, the lack of concrete evidence has not deterred believers, who continue to share the tale as a cautionary story of youthful recklessness and its consequences. Hot Rod Haven remains a popular spot for thrill seekers and ghost hunters, drawn by the allure of potentially encountering the spectacle racer. The legend has also inspired various forms of local lore, including tales of other ghostly appearances and unexplained phenomena in the area. And despite its status as a legend, the story of Hot Rod Haven serves as a reminder of the risks associated with dangerous driving behaviors. Sally Carter's Ghost The legend of Sally Carter centers around her ghost said to haunt the area of her death and original burial site in Huntsville, Alabama. Born in the early 19th century, Sally passed away on November 28, 1837, just shy of her 16th birthday. Her death occurred at Cedarhurst, a plantation-style home built by relatives in 1825. Following a brief illness, Sally died in an upstairs bedroom while visiting her sister. Sally's grave, once located off Drake Avenue in southeast Huntsville, became a focal point for local ghost stories, particularly during the 1960s when visiting her grave at night became a popular dare among teenagers. This activity led to a well-trodden path to a resting place nestled among the cedars. The gravesite was so encompassed in local lore that some visitors claimed to see bones or even encounter Sally's ghost. In December 1982, development of a townhome community on the site necessitated the excavation of Sally's grave along with those of her sister, Mary Ewing and Ewing's three children. The relocation of these graves was shrouded in secrecy with the family not disclosing the new locations. Sally Carter's legend grew in the 60s and 70s though, attracting not only thrill seekers but also vandals to her gravesite and Cedarhurst, causing disturbances that often required police or fire department intervention. The origin of the ghost story dates back to as early as 1919 though, when a 17 year old boy from Dothan, Alabama reportedly dreamed of Sally during a thunderstorm. In the dream, she asked him to fix her fallen tombstone. And the next day, the boy discovered the tombstone had indeed fallen, just as in his dream. After sharing this experience with his relatives, who had initially laughed at his intentions, he promptly returned to Dothan, never to visit Huntsville again. Disappearance of Orion Williamson In July 1854, in Selma, Alabama, an unusual and unsettling event occurred involving Orion Williamson. Basically, on a typical sunny afternoon, Williamson, along with his wife and son, were outside their farmhouse watching their horses graze in the distance. Deciding to move the horses to a shaded area, Williamson walked towards the field with the stick in hand. This ordinary act turned extraordinary when, witnessed by neighbors Armour Wen and his son James, Williamson vanished into thin air while waving back to them. The immediate search for Williamson involved not just the Wren family, but also Williamson's wife and son, who found no trace of him on the spot where he last stood. 
the community was in utter disbelief. Like, how could a man disappear so suddenly and completely? The event drew widespread attention, with around 300 people joining the search efforts, even employing bloodhounds and later digging into the ground where Williamson vanished, only to hit bedrock. As time passed though, the incident grew even more mysterious. The following spring, a peculiar patch of barren and dry grass near where Williamson was last seen intrigued investigators. Adding to the mystery though were reports from Mrs. Williamson and her son, who claimed to hear Orion's voice calling for help weeks after his disappearance, though they never found him. Theories abounded in attempts to explain Williamson's disappearance. Some suggested an unstable universal ether might have disintegrated him or a magnetic field transported him to another dimension. These theories, while fascinating, remain speculative and unproven. The concept of a universal ether, an ancient idea proposed to explain natural phenomenon, has largely been debunked by modern science, leaving Williamson's fate a mystery. Degdir The story of Degdir, originating from Somali folklore, narrates the eerie and cautionary tale of a cannibal woman feared by all, especially children. Degdir, whose name translates to the one with the long ear, was known for her supernatural hearing ability. Her ear would basically stand upright, capturing sounds from great distances and fold when she rested. This unique trait made her a formidable predator in the tales passed down through generations in Somalia, where the legend varies slightly but still retains its core message. Degdir's tale begins with a woman, envied by her husband's new, younger wife, leaving her home with her child. Lost and desperate, she encounters the dreaded Degdir in the Nugal Valley, a place infamous for the cannibals hunting escapades. A chase then ensues between Degdir, hungry for the fat mother and child, and the terrified pair. Despite Degdir's presence, the mother's prayers for salvation lead her to miraculously jump across deep holes in the ground, escaping the cannibal's grasp. Degdir, unable to cross these Hargera holes, laments her loss and expresses her desire in a haunting chant. This tale basically serves multiple purposes within Somali culture. It's kinda like a cautionary story and warns children against wandering too far from home, especially after dark. Dagdir is utilized basically as like a boogeyman figure, instilling fear and promoting discipline among the youth. Warning on Mulch The urban legend regarding a warning on mulch emerges from a cautionary tale circulated widely through emails and social media platforms. The story claims that mulch available for purchase at garden centers and home improvement stores is contaminated with a harmful substance, often described as toxic or diseased. This contamination is said to originate from the debris left after natural disasters, such as hurricanes or floods, where destroyed homes and treated woods are gathered and processed into mulch. According to a legend, the mulch, alleged to contain arsenic and other chemicals from the treated wood, poses severe risk to plants, pets, and humans. It's claimed that using this mulch in gardens or landscapes could lead to the absorption of these harmful substances by plants, subsequently affecting those who come in contact with them or consume the plants. The story intensifies though with warnings about specific brands or sources of mulch, urging readers to avoid purchasing mulch labeled as coming from regions recently hit by natural disasters. Some versions of the legend even include accounts of gardeners or pets falling ill after being exposed to the supposedly contaminated product, although these accounts are anecdotal and lack verification. In response to the spread of this legend, experts and fact-checking organizations have investigated the claims. They found that while it is true that treated wood should not be used in mulch or compost because of the potential for chemical leaching, reputable mulch suppliers adhere to regulations and standards that prevent the inclusion of such materials in their products. Also, mulch associated with natural disaster debris is subject to strict processing and testing before being deemed safe for sale and use. Mali Cyrus Death Hoax The Mali Cyrus Death Hoax is an example of how quickly misinformation can spread in the digital age. This particular urban legend claims that the pop star and actress Miley Cyrus died in a variety of ways, depending on the version of the story being circulated. Some versions allege a car accident, others claim a drug overdose, and still others suggest more outlandish causes of death. These rumors have surfaced multiple times over the years, causing confusion and concern among fans and the general public. Typically, the hoax would begin with a seemingly credible news report or social media post claiming to have inside information on Cyrus's death. 
These reports often included details designed to make the story seem plausible, such as fake quotes from family members or fabricated police statements. The rumors would quickly gain traction, spreading across platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and various blogs, as people shared the news out of shock or in search of validation. In reality though, these death hoaxes are completely false. Miley Cyrus is alive and well and has continued to release music, act in films and television, and engage with her fans on social media. After each occurrence of the hoax, either Cyrus herself or her representatives have come forward to debunk the rumors, reassuring the public that she is fine. Tier 8. The Bleeding Stone The ancient Roman Hippodrome, a site of grandeur and spectacle, became the stage for a horrific event under the Byzantine Emperor Theodosius' reign. The historical records recount a massacre where thousands of spectators, estimates ranging from 7,000 to as many as 18,000, were slaughtered upon the emperor's orders. In the aftermath, the city's grieving survivors erected a memorial stone, inscribing the names of all victims as a tribute to their lost lives and a reminder of their atrocity. This memorial stone reportedly possessed a miraculous attribute, being it was said to bleed once annually on the anniversary of the massacre. However, this lasting reminder of the emperor's brutality is sort of short-lived. To expunge the memory of this dark event, Theodosius commanded the destruction of the memorial, an act that would have unforeseen consequences. A curse is rumored to have settled over the Hippodrome Square following the obliteration of the memorial. Legend has it that every building erected in the area, particularly those occupants ignored or denied the site's tragic history, faced violent destruction. This curse purportedly remained active up until 1978 when a severe earthquake caused the residential building to collapse, tragically claiming 29 lives. In what many considered a twist of fate or perhaps a resolution to the enduring curse, the site now hosts the Billy Building, home to the archives of the history of Thessaloniki. This institution houses comprehensive historical documents, including those detailing the Roman Hippodrome massacre. By acknowledging the sacred history of the site, the new building appears to have appeased the spirits of the massacre's victims, and the curse has not manifested since. The Alaska Triangle The Alaska Triangle, which is a term that refers to an area stretching from Jono and Yakutat in the southeast up north to the Barrow Mountain Range and then back down to Anchorage, is steeped in a lot of mystery. Within this vast expanse, an unusually high number of people and planes have vanished under unexplained circumstances similar to the Bermuda Triangle's own mystery. The triangle basically encompasses some of Alaska's most untamed wilderness, including dense forests, mountain peaks, and desolate tundra, providing ample room for mysteries to thrive. The origins of the Alaska Triangle's legend, though, can be traced back to October 1972, when a small private plane carrying prominent U.S. Congressman Hale Boggs, alongside three other passengers, disappeared while flying from Anchorage to Juneau. Despite a massive search effort, neither the plane nor its occupants were ever found, igniting public fascination with the region and its purportedly sinister nature. Since then, the Alaska Triangle has been linked to over 16,000 disappearances since 1988 alone, according to the Alaska State Troopers. This figure includes tourists, hikers, and locals who have seemingly vanished without a trace, leaving behind bewildered families and a plethora of unanswered questions. The region's harsh environmental conditions, including sudden weather changes, avalanches, and the presence of wildlife provide some plausible explanations for some of these disappearances. However, many incidents still remain inexplicable, which fuels some supernatural theories. Among the numerous theories attempting to explain the mystery of the Alaska Triangle, some suggest the presence of vortexes or portals to other dimensions within the area, which are believed to be responsible for the sudden disappearances. Others propose the influence of malevolent spirits in the region, drawing upon some indigenous beliefs. For example, the Tinglet people, native to southeastern Alaska, speak of the Kushtaka, or the Land Outer Man, a shape-shifting creature that lures people to their doom with ill intentions. Skeptics and scientists, though, on the other hand, point to more rational explanations for the disappearances within the Alaska Triangle. They emphasize the challenging terrain and unpredictable weather, which can disorient which can disorient even the most experienced adventures. Also, the vast sparsely populated wilderness makes search and rescue operations extremely difficult, often hindering the recovery of those who go missing. Dudley Town Dudley Town, which was once a bustling settlement in Connecticut, has turned into an abandoned area in mystery. Found within the dark entry forest in northwestern Connecticut, Dudley Town's tales of ghost setting and curses have interest a lot. 
Despite its name suggesting a town, Dudley Town was actually a small community consisting mainly of the Dudley family among other settlers from the early 1740s. As a farming area located atop a high hill, life in Dudley Town was pretty challenging. The land, unsuitable for farming and distant from clean water sources, led to its gradual abandonment as residents moved westward in search of better opportunities in the mid-19th century. The area, which is not privately owned and closed to the public because of vandalism, harbors stories of hauntings that have attracted attention since the 1980s. Basically, legends claim that the Dudley family was cursed since an ancestor, Edmund Dudley, was executed in England, leading to misfortunes for Dudley Town's residents. These tales speak of crop failures, strange deaths, and mental illnesses attributed to the supposed curse. Local historians, though, have found no connection between the Dudley family of Cornwall and the English nobleman. Instead, the hardships faced by Dudley Town settlers are likely because of its poor location for agriculture and isolation. Velissa Axe Murder House The Velissa Axe Murder House in Velissa, Iowa is the site of a gruesome unsolved crime that took place on June 10, 1912. The Moore family, which consisted of Josiah B. Moore, his wife Sarah, and the four children, along with two guests staying over for the night, were all found brutally murdered in their beds. The weapon, which was an axe belonging to Josiah Moore, was left at the scene, covered in blood, but the murderer was never caught. In the aftermath of the murders, the small town of Alyssa was thrown into a state of fear and confusion. Multiple suspects were considered, including a traveling preacher and a serial killer, but no conclusive evidence was ever presented against them, and the case still remains open to this day. Over time, the Alyssa Axe Murder House has gained authority as one of the most haunted locations in America. Visitors and paranormal investigators report strange occurrences such as unexplained noises, visions of a man with an axe, children's voices, and objects moving on their own. These eerie happenings have led many to believe that the spirits of the Moore family and their guests still linger in the house, restless because of the violent nature of their deaths and the absence of justice. Witch Girl Next Door the urban legend of the witch girl next door typically involves a young girl accused of witchcraft by her community, leading to tragic consequences. In this particular tale from Crittenden County, the legend of Mary Evelyn Ford unfolds with a haunting narrative that mixes with the community's history and fears. Basically, Mary Evelyn Ford was a young girl from Marion, Kentucky in the 1910s. According to local lore, the townsfolk believed Mary Evelyn and her mother were witches, a suspicion that led to a horrifying act being both were said to have been sentenced to be burned alive. Mary Evelyn was only six years old at the time when she met her fate, and her mother's remains were buried far from Marion. In a bid to contain the young girl's spirit, which the townsfolk feared would return for revenge, Mary Evelyn was buried in Pilot Knob Cemetery. The measures taken were also pretty extraordinary, being her grave was lined with steel, covered with concrete and gravel, and surrounded by a white fence made of interconnected crosses. This setup was believed to prevent the spirit from crossing over and pulling the living into her grave. Despite these precautions though, the legend claims that Mary Evelyn's spirit reaches out to anyone who dares come near her, attempting to pull them into her gated grave. An even darker presence though, known as the Watcher, is said to lurk nearby, trying to snatch her soul. This entity cannot cross the protective barrier of crosses, leaving it to terrorize bystanders and try to chase them away. However, upon closer examination though, research into Crittenden County records reveals that Mary Evelyn Ford's death in 1916 was because of peritonitis, not a violent execution. And her mother Rebecca was found alive in the 1920 census, debunking the story of their fiery deaths. This discovery has brought relief to the family's descendants, who had been pained by a false narrative of witchcraft and murder. Candy Lady in Terrell, Texas, a tale whispered through generations revolves around a woman named Clara Crane. Born in 1871, Clara's life took a tragic turn in the 1910s with the accidental death of her daughter Marcella caused by her husband Leonard while under the influence. Blaming him for her child's demise, Clara sought revenge by poisoning Leonard with tainted caramels, leading to his death. This act of vengeance landed Clara in the North Texas Lunatic Asylum, which she was later released from due to overcrowding. The legend gains a chilling momentum though in 1903, when children in the vicinity of the Crane property began to vanish. Others discovered candy wrappers bearing the Candy Lady signatures on their windowsills, a haunting reminder of Clara's sinister deed. 
The disappearance of the local sheriff, later found with his eyes mutilated and pockets filled with candy, only deepened the mystery. Feeding rice to birds The urban legends surrounding feeding rice to birds, mainly pigeons, suggest that doing so is harmful and could even lead to the birds' deaths. The myth posits that once ingested, the rice will expand in the birds' stomachs and cause them to fatally blow or explode. This tale has been so pervasive that it has influenced wedding traditions, with some opting for bird seed or bubbles instead of the traditional rice toss to avoid harming any birds. However, thorough investigations and scientific studies have debunked this myth. Experts and wildlife biologists have confirmed that birds, including pigeons, can safely digest rice without any adverse effects. The digestive system of birds is capable of handling raw rice, and there's no evidence to support the claim that rice can cause harm or death to birds. Shaved hair grows back thicker The belief that shaved hair grows back thicker is a common misconception that's been around for many years. This idea basically suggests that after shaving, the hair that regrows will appear darker, thicker, or coarser than before. However, scientific studies have shown that shaving does not affect the thickness, color, or rate of the hair growth. Basically, hair is made out of keratin, a protein that grows from the hair follicle located under the skin. When the hair is shaved, only the visible part of the hair above the skin is removed. The characteristics of hair, such as its thickness and color, are determined by genetics and cannot be altered by shaving. The misconception might arise from the appearance of hair as it grows back after being shaved. Since hair is cut off at the skin, the new hair growth might initially appear blunt and feel coarser to the touch compared to the fine tip of uncut hair. Additionally, the contrast between the stubble and the bare skin can make the hair seem more noticeable. However, as the hair continues to grow, it will return to its original state. KFC Mutant Chickens A widely spread urban legend claims that KFC uses genetically modified chickens, often described as mutant chickens, in its products. According to the story, these chickens are engineered to have multiple legs and wings, enabling KFC to produce more meat per animal. The legend also suggests that these chickens are kept alive by tubes, as they supposedly do not have beaks, feathers, or even bones, making them different from any chicken seen on a farm. The origins of this myth are kinda unclear, but it has great traction from the internet and through word of mouth, leaving some to question the quality and origin of KFC's chicken. The rumor became so widespread that KFC was forced to address it publicly, stating that they use real chickens and all the poultry is bred in a manner consistent with industry standards. Experts in agriculture and food science have since debunked the claims of the urban legend too, explaining that not only would such genetic modifications be unethical and likely illegal, but they would also be unnecessary and impractical from a farming and economic perspective. Hito Bashira Hito Bashira, translating to human pillar, refers to an ancient practice found across various cultures in East and Southeast Asia, where individuals were burned alive under significant structures like bridges, dams, and castles. This act was believed to appease deities, ensuring the buildings' protection from natural disasters or enemy attacks. The practice is known by different names in regions like China, Burma, and Indonesia. But in China, it was thought that large-scale construction could disrupt the land's Feng Shi, angering spirits. To counteract this, Da Sheng Zhuang was performed to pacify these spirits and reduce construction mishaps. Historical evidence of this practice dates back to the early Tu culture, as seen in the Dongzhou excavation in Henan province, where an infant's remains were found in the city's foundation. Also, ancient beliefs held that the construction of bridges required the sacrifice of a boy and a girl to ensure their stability. The concept of Hitobashira in Japan is documented as far back as the Nihon Shoki, the Chronicles of Japan, detailing sacrifices made to prevent river floods during Emperor Nitoko's reign. Another 15th century account, the Yasuo Tomiki, narrates the story of a woman and her child who were sacrificed for the construction of a bridge over the Nagara River. These practices underline the cultural belief in self-sacrifice for the greater good, often associated with water-related projects. Maruka Castle's construction allegedly incorporated Hitobashira, following the story of O Shizu, a poor, one-eyed woman who agreed to become a human pillar in exchange for a child's future as a samurai, which was a promise that was never fulfilled. Bangor Village Hospital Bangor Village Hospital, located in West Lothar in Scotland, was established in 1906 as a psychiatric hospital. The sprawling complex, designed to resemble a village rather than a traditional hospital, 
once housed up to 3,000 patients. Its self-contained community included a variety of facilities such as a church, a farm, and even its own railway station, promoting a sense of normalcy and therapeutic environment for their patients. Over the years, Bangor Village Hospital expanded its services beyond psychiatric care, playing a significant role during both world wars and as a military hospital. Despite these noble contributions though, the hospital gradually saw a decline in use with advances in psychiatric treatment and a move towards care in the community. It officially closed its doors in 2004, leaving the vast estate with its numerous buildings abandoned. The abandoned state of the hospital, combined with the stories of psychiatric treatment, has led to numerous urban legends and ghost stories. People have reported hearing mysterious noises, seeing ghostly figures, and experiencing an eerie atmosphere when visiting the site. These tales have been fueled by the hospital's appearance in film and media, notably serving as a location for the 2005 horror film The Jacket. Lydia of Jamestown Bridge In Jamestown, North Carolina, a local legend tells of a young woman's spirit haunting the underpasses of two bridges. This spirit, known as Lydia, is said to appear on rainy and foggy nights, either walking alone or standing beside the road, seeking help to return home. The origin of this haunting is believed to be a tragic car accident that occurred many years ago, involving a young couple on their way to a dance. Since the accident, Lydia, dressed in her white formal dress, supposedly returns to the scene, seeking assistance. The first recorded sighting of Lydia dates back to around 1924, as detailed by folklorist Nancy Roberts, an illustrated guide to ghosts and mysterious occurrences in the Old North State. A man named Burke Hardison recounted his encounter with Lydia during a rainy and foggy night as he was driving home from NC State University. Basically, he saw a girl in a white gown by the road, who asked for a lift to High Point. Upon reaching the destination, she disappeared from his car. After knocking on the door of a nearby house, he was informed by a woman that her daughter, matching Lydia's description, had died in a car accident at a nearby overpass the previous year. Further investigations into this legend have not conclusively linked Lydia to any historical records of a young woman dying in such an accident during the 1920s. However, researchers Amy Greer and Michael Reniger found a 1920 newspaper article about the death of Annie Jackson in a car accident near the location of the bridges. This incident might have contributed to the legend. Alnwick Castle Vampire Alnwick Castle, located in Northumberland, England, stands as a historical monument with a lineage that includes the Percy family and the 12th Duke of Northumberland. Known as the Windsor of the North, the castle has seen significant events from border wars with Scotland to the Wars of the Roses. It's also been featured in modern media, notably in movies such as Beckett and Harry Potter but the castle is also associated with darker tales. A story from the 12th century mentions a former master of the castle rising from his grave at night, wandering the town's streets. This event, which is documented by Chronicle William of Newburgh, supposedly brought a deadly stench and a subsequent plague. The villagers, believing the former master to be a vampire responsible for the diseased, exhumed and burned his body, which allegedly stopped the plague. Another haunting tale from Alnwick Castle involves the Grey Lady, believed to be the spirit of a Victorian era maid. Legend has it that she fell down a chew into the tunnels below the castle, where a broken dumbwaiter crushed her. Her ghost is said to still wander these dark passages. Kiyotaki Tunnel Kiyotaki Tunnel, which is in Kyoto, is a site shrouded in eerie tales and dark history. This tunnel, which was once a segment of the Atagoyama Railway built between 1927 and 1928, stretches about 500 meters. Its construction, which was fraught with hardship, involved laborers working under dire conditions without compensation, often referred to as slaves. The construction witnessed numerous deaths because of the accidents, harsh working conditions, and subsequent violence in the area. The tunnel has since become infamous for sightings of apparitions and unexplained phenomena, believed to be the spirits of those who perished during its construction and other tragedies in its vicinity. Legends tell of sightings of these spirits wandering the tunnel at night. One prevailing rumor is the tunnel's length, purportedly 44 meters, a figure associated with death, or she in Japanese. Another aspect of the tunnel's lore involves the traffic signals outside, which are said to unpredictably change from red to green during the night, leading to potential accidents. The surrounding woodland seclusion also marks the tunnel and its overpasses as sites of people ending their own life, with tales of spirits, including that of a woman who leapt to her death, still visible to those who pass by. 
Lake Pen Oriole Paddler. The mysterious creature known as Paddler is said to reside in Lake Pen Oriole, Idaho. This deep lake, being the fifth deepest in the United States, boasts some regions that reach nearly 1,150 feet in depth and covers a surface area of 148 square miles. The creature, according to eyewitness accounts, measures over 20 feet long and exhibits a unique swimming pattern that involves moving up and down through the water. The origins of paddler sightings basically trace back to 1944, with additional reports surfacing in the 1970s. Notably, in September 1977, a young girl near the Sandport City Beach claimed she was attacked by a strange creature, prompting local journalists to name the being the Penn Oriole Paddler. Further investigations in 1984 by North Idaho College professor James R. McLeod suggested that some sightings could be attributed to a massive prehistoric looking sturgeon, although this didn't fully explain all reported encounters. Also adding to the intrigue, the US Navy and the International Submarine Engineering Group from Canada have utilized Lake Penn Oriel for submarine research, which some believe could have contributed to sightings. However, in 1985, Julie Green and her friends reported an encounter with a large, undulating object in the water, reinforcing the belief in Paddler's existence. Also, a photograph taken in 2007 seemingly captured humps surfacing in the lake, which further ignited interest in, you know, Paddler. Stony Hollow Road Stony Hollow Road, which is in a city, carries with it a chilling legend that has interested locals and visitors for generations. The story centers around the tragic tale of a young woman named Lucinda, whose heartbreak and subsequent death have left a permanent mark on the seemingly ordinary stretch of road. According to local lore, Lucinda was deeply in love with the man who, on the night he was supposed to meet her on Stony Hollow Road and proclaim his love, cruelly betrayed her. Devastated and unable to bear the pain, Lucinda took her own life, plunging from a cliff into the ravine below. It's said that her spirit, unable to find peace, continues to haunt Stony Hollow Road, searching for the love that was denied to her in life. Those who dare to visit Stony Hollow Road at night, especially near the spot where Lucinda met her tragic end, report unexplained phenomena, being ghostly apparitions, sudden drops in temperature, and even the feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. The most persistent tale though is that if one calls out Lucinda's name three times near the cliff at midnight, her ghost will appear, sometimes offering a glimpse of the future before vanishing into the night. Singing River In Pascagoula, Mississippi, there's a river that makes a strange humming noise. People have heard this sound for hundreds of years but can't fully explain it. This river and its sounds are linked to a story about the Pascagoula tribe. Basically, the story goes that a long time ago, the Pascagoula people lived peacefully until they had a conflict with another tribe, the Biloxi. The chief of Pascagoula, named Altima, fell in love with Anola, who belonged to the Biloxi tribe and was promised to another. This basically caused a war between the two tribes, and the Pascagoula tribe was outnumbered and feared being captured and enslaved by the Biloxi. So they decided it was better to choose their own fate rather than being captured. The whole tribe walked into the river singing a song and drowned themselves. And some say this is why you can hear strange sounds from the river, being the tribe's song. Over the years, many people have tried to match the story with real events or people, but haven't really found anything concrete. Ghost of St. Augustine's Lighthouse in 1871, Hezekiah Pitti moved to St. Augustine to oversee the construction of a new lighthouse. The Pitti family's life at the construction site turned tragic though on July 10, 1873. The Pitti sisters, Mary, Eliza, and Carrie, along with an unidentified African-American girl, were playing on a rail cart used for transporting supplies. The cart, which typically stopped by a wooden board at the track's end, was without a stopper that day. It flipped into the water which resulted in the drowning of three of the girls. Only Carrie survived and this accident gave rise to stories of ghostly occurrences at the lighthouse. Reports included unexplained footsteps, sightings of ghostly figures, and interactions suggesting the presence of the children's spirits. These incidents have fueled the legend and make it a part of the lighthouse's history. Visitors and staff have shared experiences of hearing giggles with no apparent source, seeing apparitions of children, and even encountering playful spirits. One specific incident involved a visitor's shoelace being mysteriously tied to a staircase, hinting at the nature of the spectacle of children. Over the years, the legend of the Pity Sisters has since become a focal point for ghost tours and paranormal investigations at the St. Augustine Lighthouse. Sunshine Skyway Bridge 
the Sunshine Skyway Bridge spanning Tampa Bay in Florida is not only known for its impressive architecture, but also for the urban legends that have emerged around it. One of the most enduring stories is that of a ghostly hitchhiker associated with the bridge. The legend basically stems from a tragic event in 1980 when the bridge was the site of a catastrophic accident. The freighter MV Some Adventure collided with the bridge during a storm, causing a section of the bridge to collapse and result in the deaths of 35 people. This disaster has since become the backdrop for numerous ghost stories and unexplained phenomena reported on the new Sunshine Skyway Bridge, completed in 1987. Basically, according to local lore, drivers crossing the bridge at night have reported picking up a hitchhiker only for the mysterious passenger to vanish from the vehicle before reaching the other side. Descriptions of the hitchhiker kind of vary, but the story usually involves the figure suddenly disappearing from the car, leaving the driver alone and bewildered. Some versions of the story suggest that the ghostly hitchhiker is one of the victims of the 1980 collapse, perhaps seeking to complete their journey across the bridge. These accounts have become a part of the local folklore, with residents and visitors alike sharing their eerie experiences or those of someone they know. Curse of the River Serpent The urban legend of the Curse of the River Serpent originates from the Kusar River, a notable waterway in Alabama which is known for its biodiversity including 147 fish species and the presence of unique wildlife such as the painted rock snow and alligators. This region's mysterious and rich history predates the arrival of Europeans in 1540. The legend itself began to take shape in 1822 with sightings of a massive snake-like creature with large fins near Ball Play Creek along the Coosa River. In a detailed exploration of this legend though, columnist E. Randall Floyd recounted several eerie incidents in a 1993 article for the Spartanburg Herald Journal. The narrative begins with Buck Sutton, who while fishing in Van's Hole, encountered the serpent in the swampy shallows. Despite sharing his terrifying experience with friends, Suran met a mysterious and untimely death shortly after. Following Suran's death, others in the vicinity also succumbed under strange circumstances, including Billy Burns in 1827 and Jim Wyndham in 1829. The cause of these deaths still remain unexplained and fuel speculation and fear about a curse associated with the river serpent. Tanaka the Drowned Ghost Tanaka the Drowned Ghost originates from the village of Ola'a on the big island of Hawaii, a place that had a tragic event in 1947. This haunting centers around the eerie phenomenon surrounding a local pond where a young boy, referred to as Tanaka, lost his life under mysterious circumstances. Basically, in the summer of 1947, a group of children were playing near the pond's edge when Tanaka, one of the children, accidentally fell into the water. Despite efforts to rescue him, he was found deceased, positioned unnaturally at the pond's bottom, seated on a rock with his eyes and mouth wide open, suggesting a serene acceptance of his fate. This incident laid the groundwork for the legend of Tanaka, the drowned ghost. Manifestations associated with Tanaka's spirit include individuals being inexplicably pulled toward the water, alongside disturbing wailing sounds near the pond. These occurrences have caused the site to become sort of haunted, with locals and visitors reporting these eerie experiences. And years after the initial tragedy, another boy experienced a similar horrifying encounter. He was walking near the pond when he suddenly screamed for help, claiming something was dragging him into the water. Rescuers later found him at the bottom of the pond, alive but in a state eerily reminiscent of Tanaka's, with his body positioned passively, eyes and mouth open, swaying with the water's current. This incident basically intensified the belief in Tanaka's restless spear haunting the pond. In response to these unsettling events, a Shinto priest from Hilo was called upon to perform a blessing over the water, an effort to appease the disturbed spirit and halt the paranormal activities. Although the official ceremonies were said to quell the wailing and pulling manifestations, whispers persist among the local community and visitors that the mournful cries of Tanaka can still be heard on quiet nights, suggesting that the spirit may not be fully at rest. Gobble Squatch The Gobble Squatch legend emerges from Virginia's folklore, mixing Native American traditions and colonial anecdotes with a mysterious creature similar to a colossal turkey. Professor Wesley Wimscott basically brought it to academic attention in his 2009 paper, highlighting its origins in the oral histories of Virginia's Native American tribes. These tribes, including the Catawba and Cherokee, reportedly had cultural representation suggesting an awareness of such a creature long before European settlers arrived. 
historical records and folklore recount various encounters with the Goblin Squatch across centuries. In 1672, Ezekiel Fitzgerald was executed for claiming to have seen a creature with a wingspan greater than the heavens. Thomas Jefferson, intrigued by the legend, supposedly commissioned the Lewis and Clark expedition in part to seek out the Goblin Squatch, and the 19th and early 20th century continued to see reports. The Virginia Lumber Company abandoned operations in 1861 because of inexplicable phenomenon attributed to the creature, and the Wright brothers, inspired by bird flight for the early aircraft designs, reportedly named their prototype the Warbler after it in a nod to the legend. Horse Trailer Horror The urban legend of the Horse Trailer Horror tells a tragic story linked to the world of horse racing. The central figure of the tale is a man with a keen interest in horse racing who owned several horses. Among these was an older horse which the man decided to enter into a race one final time despite its age. On the day of the race though, the man encountered difficulty while trying to load the horse into a mini trailer attached to his truck. The horse basically resisted entry but the man persisted and finally managed to secure the animal inside the trailer. Throughout the drive to the racetrack, the horse displayed signs of distress making continuous noise. The man, attributing the horse's behavior to stubbornness, chose to ignore the warning honks from other drivers on the road. Upon arriving at the racetrack and opening the trailer, the man was confronted with the horrifying scene being that he discovered that his horse had died during their journey. The cause of the tragedy was revealed to be the deteriorated condition of the trailer's floor through which the horse's leg had fallen, causing them to be severely injured by the road. This resulted in the interior of the trailer being covered in blood, marking a gruesome end to the man's beloved horse. The Grey Man The Grey Man is a notable ghost from the coast of Pauley's Island, South Carolina, associated with the forewarning of severe storms and hurricanes. The origins of the Grey Man date back to 1822, predating the incorporation of the town's government. The most recent sightings occurred before the onslaught of Hurricane Florence in 2018 and Hurricane Hugo in 1989. The legend basically describes the Grey Man as the spirit of a young man en route from Charleston to Pauley's Island to visit his fiancée in 1822. Tragically though, he and his horse succumbed to quicksand like pluff mud in the marshes near the island, leading to their untimely deaths. Since then, his spear has been reported to roam the shores, eternally searching for his lost love. The tale of the Grey Man first appeared in print in Julian Stevenson Bullock's Wakama Plantations in 1946 and was elaborated upon in his 1956 collection of ghost stories. The Grey Man basically gained national attention though following Hurricane Hugo, mainly through an episode of Untold Mysteries aired in 1990 featuring Jim and Clara Moore's encounter with the apparition. They reported that their house remained undamaged by the storm, unlike their neighbors', attributing the fortune to the Grey Man's warning. Tier 9 Alexandra's Genesis Alexandra's Genesis is an urban legend that describes a supposed genetic mutation resulting in a set of extraordinary physical traits. According to the legend, individuals with this mutation have a variety of unique characteristics, including purple eyes, extremely fair skin that is immune to sunburn or tanning and a lack of body hair other than that on the head, eyebrows, and eyelashes. Additionally, the legend claims that the women with Alexandria's genesis have a menstrual cycle without bleeding, a condition that supposedly does not affect their fertility. It's also said that individuals with this mutation maintain an ideal body weight regardless of their diet or lifestyle and do not produce feces as frequently as the average person, and also have a lifespan extending up to 150 years. The origins of Alexandria's genesis are kind of difficult to trace, with various stories and versions existing online and in folklore. One version suggests that the mutation first appeared in ancient Egypt around 1000 AD. The legend states that a mysterious light flashed in the sky, and everyone who walked outside to investigate turned blue-eyed and gained the aforementioned traits overnight. These individuals then moved to Europe, where they were perceived as witches because of their unusual appearance and longevity. Despite the widespread fascination with Alexandria's genesis though, there's no scientific evidence to support the existence of such a mutation. The Haunting of Wat Samia Nari The Haunting of Wat Samia Nari is a well-known urban legend in Thailand, specifically associated with a civil temple located in Bangkok. The temple covers approximately 7.11 acres near the Northern Railway Line and Bang Sun Station. The legend basically centers around the ghostly apparitions of two sisters dressed in black known as the Tisukri sisters, Chuli and Suli. 
According to the story, these spirits frequently haunt the area at night, targeting taxi drivers in particular. The narrative recounts that a taxi driver picks up the sisters from an entertainment district after midnight. The sisters request to be taken to Wat Sami and Nari Temple. Throughout the journey, the driver observes that the sisters remain silent, neither speaking to each other nor responding to him. Upon nearing the destination though, the sisters mysteriously disappear from the taxi. Confused and alarmed, the driver exits the vehicle only to witness a horrifying sight being the two sisters lying on the railway tracks in front of the temple with their bodies severed in half. Beijing's Ghost Bus The last bus to Fragnet Hills or Beijing's Ghost Bus is a famous Beijing ghost story. On the night of November 4th, 1995, a young man boarded bus route 302 to Fragnet Hills in Haidan District. Shortly after, the bus stopped for two men not at a bus stop, dressed in King Dynasty robes, carrying a third man between them. Passengers noticed the trio's unusually white faces and their lack of interaction. As the bus emptied though, only an old lady and the young man remained with the mysterious trio. The lady accused the young man of theft and they both exited the bus to go to a police station, which was not there. The old woman then revealed she noticed the three men had no legs, suggesting that they were ghosts. The next day, the bus was reported missing. It was later found in the reservoir miles from the Fragnet Hills with three decomposed bodies inside, being the driver, the conductor, and an unidentified person with long hair. Some reports suggested that the bus's fuel tank was filled with blood. This urban legend has several variations, including one featuring a female ghost in a red dress instead of the three men. The bus number and the details of the accuser vary across different tellings as well. Aburiga Masluka Aburiga Masluka translates to man with a burnt leg or a burning mummy child in English. This figure is a well-known boogeyman in Egyptian culture used by parents to discourage misbehavior among children. This legend tells of a creature that was burned as a child for not listening to his parents. As an adult, this character is said to prey on children who misbehave, capturing them to cook and eat. The story serves as basically a cautionary tale, emphasizing the importance of obedience to parental authority and the dangers of straying from guidance. Jengangar In Scandinavian folklore, the Jengangar is a type of revenant, a spirit or ghost of someone who has returned from the grave. The term Jengangar is derived from the Norwegian and Danish languages, meaning one who walks again after death. This ghostly figure is said to take a physical form, unlike the ethereal ghost commonly depicted in modern tales. The Jengangar is often associated with violent or malicious intentions, haunting its living relatives or those who have wronged it in life. Historically, the Jengangar could return for various reasons. Victims of murder and the murderers, or those who took their own life, or even individuals with unfinished business were believed to be unable to rest peacefully. This belief led to numerous protective measures to prevent the deceased from, re from returning as a Jengangar. Such practices included carrying the coffin three times around the church before burial and marking the graves with crosses or other symbols. The Jengangar tradition dates back to the Viking Age as well, evident in many Icelandic sagas where these beings were sometimes referred to as Draugr. These creatures were described as corporeal, able to interact with the physical world and required physical means to be dealt with, such as being slain by hero's sword. Alabama's Dead Children Playground The Dead Children's Playground is a well-known urban legend centered around a playground next to Maple Hill Cemetery in Huntsville, Alabama. This playground, despite its ordinary appearance with swings and climbing structures, is said to be haunted by the spirits of children. Visitors and passerby have reported seeing swings moving without anyone on them, along with unexplained orbs or spectacle figures. The eerie name, Dead Children's Playground, is linked to the history of Maple Hill Cemetery, the largest and oldest cemetery in Huntsville, and the tragic impact of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic on the local population. It's believed that many children who succumbed to the flu were buried in plots adjacent to the playground, leading to legends that the spirits emerge after dark to play as they once did in life. During the pandemic, Huntsville faced a devastating number of deaths with hospitals overwhelmed and families quarantined in their homes. The city experienced a rapid spread of the illness, leading to the closure of public places statewide in an attempt to control the outbreak. The pandemic basically left a deep scar on the community with a significant loss of life. While there's no official count of children buried in Maple Hill from the pandemic, the legend still persists fueled by settings and photographs of unexplained phenomena at the playground. Diana of the Dunes 
Diana of the Dunes is the nickname for Alice Mabel Gray, an American intellectual who chose to live in the Indiana Dunes, embracing a life close to nature away from urban society. Born on March 25, 1881, in Chicago, Illinois, she produced higher education at the University of Chicago, excelling in mathematics, astronomy, Greek, and Latin. After her studies though, Gray worked at the US Naval Observatory and continued her education in Göttingen, Germany, and at the University of Chicago. But disenchanted with urban life and its constraints on educated women, Gray sought solitude and a deeper connection with nature. In 1915, at 34, she moved to the Indiana Dunes, living in primitive conditions in an area that was largely undeveloped and considered a wasteland ripe and considered a wasteland ripe for industrial development. Her life in the dunes involved surviving harsh conditions, including making her own furniture from driftwood and consuming a simple diet of fish and berries. Despite her solitude, Gray remained engaged with the outside world, frequenting the local library and making occasional trips to Chicago. Gray's decision to live in the dunes drew media attention and she was soon dubbed Diana of the Dunes by news reporters, a reference to the Roman goddess of the hunt. This attention was a double-edged sword providing her with a platform to advocate for the preservation of the dunes while also attracting unwanted publicity and intrusion into her life. Hell's Bridge Hell's Bridge in Rockford, Kent County, Michigan is a secluded metal footbridge nestled within Michigan woods and crossing of the Rogue River. The story of Hell's Bridge basically centers around Elias Frisky, an elderly man whose actions would mark the area with a dark history. When a group of children vanish, a search party formed to comb the woods, leaving Frisky to watch over the remaining youngsters. Frisky led the children he was supposed to protect into the woods, claiming it was to prevent them from wandering off. However, upon reaching the bridge, a horrifying discovery was made. Frisky revealed the bodies of the missing children, previously hidden under leaves and branches. He then murdered the children in his care one by one, throwing their bodies into the Rogue River. When the absence of both Frisky and the children was noticed, a search along the river led the townspeople to the grim scene. Following Frisky's bloody tracks, they found him, delirious and, and, cl and claiming demonic persuasion for his deeds. The townspeople executed vigilante justice by hanging him from the bridge using the same rope he used on the children. Legend has it that the rope broke and Frisky's body was lost to the river's current, never to be found. To this day, it's said that sinister forces linger around Hell's Bridge. Visitors report seeing children's faces in the water and hearing devilish laughter at midnight. Unusual phenomena such as glowing red eyes, screams and laughter of children, as well as tubers feeling unseen hands in the water have also been reported. Seven Sisters Road Seven Sisters Road, which is located southeast of Nebraska City, Nebraska, carries a haunting legend. This old path, also known as L Street today, runs to an area once known for its seven hills near which a horrifying event is said to have occurred in the early 1900s. The legend tells of a family living along this road where a young man resided with his parents and seven sisters. After a heated argument with his family, the young man, consumed by anger, waited for his parents to leave the house. He then led or forced each of his sisters out into the woods, one by one, to the top of each hill. There, it said he hanged them from trees, taking their lives. The fate of the brother afterward remains unknown as do the final resting places of the sisters' bodies. Despite the story's persistence through time though, no official records have been found to confirm these events. Years later, Seven Sisters Road was constructed through these hills, which have since been altered, leaving only four prominent ones. Yet, the legend has still imbued the area with the sinister reputation. Reports have surfaced of people hearing women's screams for help, the ringing of bells from a nearby private cemetery, and experiencing car malfunctions while driving through. Additionally, shadowy figures, red eyes watching from the darkness, voices, and whispers have been reported alongside sudden changes in the wind. Some visitors have even claimed to feel unseen hands trying to pull them into the river while tubing. Haunting of 657 Boulevard In June 2014, Derek and Maria Brodus bought their dream home at 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey. Shortly after purchasing the six-bedroom house and beginning renovations, they received a mysterious letter from someone calling themselves the Watcher. This person claimed to have been observing the house for decades following in the footsteps of their father and grandfather. The letter contained disturbing threats and comments about the Bradesia's children which deeply unsettled the family. Despite reporting the incident to the police, the mystery deepened with the arrival of additional letters, each more threatening than the last. 
The Watcher claimed to have detailed knowledge of the family's renovations and their whereabouts. With no suspects identified and fearing for their own safety, the Brosses decided not to move into 657 Boulevard. They attempted to sell the house, but the story of the Watcher, now public, made it difficult. They also considered demolishing the house to build two new ones, but faced opposition from the community and the planning board. Beast of Blan and Boro The Vampire Beast, also known as the Beast of Blan and Boro or the Vampire Cat, is a mysterious creature that was reported to have killed livestock and pets in Blan and Boro, North Carolina during December 1954 and again in 2007 in various locations, including Bolivia, Greensboro, and Lexington, North Carolina. The incidents in 1954 lasted for 10 days and sparked widespread fear and a massive hunt, though the creature was never captured. The first report came on December 29, 1954, when a farmer claimed a large cat-like beast attacked and dragged his dog into the underbrush. Subsequent days saw more killings, including two dogs found dead on New Year's Day 1955 with all their blood drained. The town's police chief and mayor organized a hunt, attracting hunters nationwide, but it ended when a large bobcat was killed and the officials declared the mystery solved. The case basically gained national publicity, but eventually faded from public attention. In 2007, similar killings were reported, with livestock found with their blood drained and bodies mutilated without signs of struggle, suggesting the return of the so-called vampire beast. Also, tracks were found that mentioned 4.5 inches in diameter. The TV show Monster Quest investigated in 2008, suggesting a cougar might be responsible, though cougars were considered extinct in the eastern United States, except in Florida. Turbo Bachan Turbo Bachan or Turbo Granny is an urban legend from Japan that describes encounters with an incredibly fast old lady on highways, especially around Mount Roko in Hyogo Prefecture. This legend has spread across Japan, with many drivers claiming to have seen her in the rearview mirrors, appearing suddenly and then vanishing just as quickly. Some versions of the story depict Turbo Bachan as malicious, attempting to cause accidents by tailing drivers closely or knocking on their windows. In other versions, she serves as a cautionary figure, supposedly targeting only those who exceed speed limits, thus acting as a warning against reckless driving. The Girl on the Curve The story of the girl on the curve is a chilling urban legend about a young woman seen on rainy nights. According to this tale, a man driving home one night during a rainstorm encounters a girl in a white dress by the roadside. The driver then stops and offers her a ride. She accepts and enters the car with her dress muddy and wet. During the drive, they engage in conversation, but she avoids explaining how she ended up there. At a certain point, she warns the driver to slow down for an upcoming tight curve, advice that potentially saves him from an accident. She then reveals she died in that very spot over 25 years ago on a similar rainy night. When the driver looks to thank her, he finds she has disappeared, leaving only a damp seat behind. This legend has reportedly occurred in various locations across Spain, each time involving a young woman in white who vanished after warning drivers about the dangerous curve where she met her own demise. Humeral Mansion Haunting The Humeral Mansion Haunting is a haunting urban tale from Japan revolving around a wealthy family and the large home located outside Tokyo. This family is said to have been involved in performing a sinister Shinto ritual known as the Strangling Ritual every 50 years. This ritual involved the sacrifice of a young woman to appease spirits and prevent misfortune from befalling the family. However, the story takes a dark turn when the family patriarch decides against continuing this tradition, leading to a curse that unleashes the angry spirits of those previously sacrificed. The mansion, as a result, is believed to be haunted by these spirits seeking vengeance. The London Monster The London Monster was an alleged assailant who targeted women in London between 1788 and 1790. This attacker was known for pricking or stabbing victims with sharp objects like knives, pins, or needles. The first incidents began in 1788 with reports from victims, usually from wealthier backgrounds, describing a large man following them, shouting obscenities, and then stabbing them in the buttocks. Some victims reported their clothes were cut and others suffered serious wounds, with over 50 attacks reported in two years. The press dubbed the attacker the monster, leading to widespread panic. Descriptions varied significantly though, complicating efforts to capture him. The city's response included armed vigilante patrols, and a reward of 100 was offered for his capture. The failure to apprehend the attacker though led to various false accusations and increased public fear, 
further exacerbated by the criminals using the panic for their advantage. The case took a turn when Ryan McWilliams, a 23-year-old florist, was accused and arrested following identification by one of the victims, Andy Porter. Despite protests of innocence and the presence of an alibi from one of the attacks, Williams was charged and eventually convicted on three accounts, resulting in a six-year prison sentence. Historians have debated Williams' guilt and the very existence of a single London monster, suggesting there might have been several attackers or even questioning the truth behind the reported incidents. The Devil and Tom Walker The Devil and Tom Walker is a short story by Washington Irving featured in his 1824 collection Tales of a Traveler. The narrative basically revolves around Tom Walker, a miserly man, and his encounter with the devil, known as Old Scratch. Set in colonial Massachusetts, the story begins with the legend of Pirate William Kidd, who buried treasure in a forest supposedly protected by a deal with the devil. One day, while walking through a swampy area where Kidd's treasure is rumored to be buried, Tom meets the devil, who offers him Kidd's treasure in exchange for a great price, implied to be Tom's soul. Although initially hesitant, Tom's greed eventually leads him to accept the deal on the condition that he uses the wealth and service to the devil. Tom then basically exploits people for his gain under the devil's influence. As time passes, Tom becomes fearful for his afterlife and attempts to atone by becoming religious, yet continues his greedy practices. Ultimately, the devil comes for Tom, taking it away on a black horse, and his wealth turns to ashes. The story basically serves as a moral tale about the dangers of greed and the inevitable consequences of making deals with the devil. Ohio State Reformatory The Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield, once a prison, remains a site of fascination. Before its establishment, the area hosted Camp Bartley, training around 4,000 Civil War soldiers. Recognized by the National Register of Historic Places in 1987, the reformatory's east cell block holds a Guinness world record for the largest freestanding steel cell block. It's also been a filming location for movies like The Shawshank Redemption and Air Force One. Some believe the reformatory's appeal is so strong that individuals, even after death, cannot leave. Opened in September 1896, the reformatory initially served as an intermediate prison housing young male inmates not yet eligible for the Ohio Penitentiary. Its architecture, inspired by old world German castles, aimed to uplift and reform inmates' spirits. While it housed no notable criminals, some residents like Gates Brown and Kevin Mack found fame in sports and Henry Baker became known for his role in the 1950 Brinks robbery. The reformatory witnessed significant violence too, with officers murdered and prisoners resorting to taking their own life or self-harm in solitary confinement, known as the Hole. In 1957, following a riot, over 100 prisoners were placed in the hole, designed for only 20. This led to tales of inmates being forced into the same cell, with only one surviving. Reports of hauntings in the hole include footsteps and voices, suggesting the anguish of those trapped in life and death, seeking freedom even beyond the grave. Spook Hill Spook Hill is basically a unique attraction located in Lake Wells, Florida, and is known for its gravity hill, an optical illusion where cars seem to defy gravity and roll up the hill. This phenomenon is situated on the Lake Wells Ridge, a significant area of sand and limestone hills dating back millions of years when there were islands surrounded by the sea. But yeah, it's basically like an optical illusion. White Ladies Lane The legend of White Ladies Lane unfolds in North Dakota around the small town of Valhalla. It centers around a young girl, Anna Story, who caught the eye of Samuel Callow, an older man passing through town. Callow, claiming love at first sight, saw Anna's hand in marriage from her mother, who initially refused but agreed to consider it after a year in exchange for using some of Callow's wares. A year passed, and upon Callow's return, Anna's mother again refused the marriage and did not return the borrowed items. Enraged, Callow attacked, resulting in Anna's death and severe injury to her mother. After failing to end his own life, Callow was arrested. Despite the tragic event, some say Anna's spirit remains, especially near a place called Eddie's Bridge, although exact details about the bridge location are unclear. And records confirm a Samuel Callow did kill a 16-year-old named Anna Story in 1921. While the official account differs slightly from the legend, the correlation is pretty haunting. Locals report sightings of Anna's ghost along White Lady Lane, named for the white nightgown she wore at her death. Sayings often include a figure in a white gown or the sounds of a woman crying and screaming. Camp Lula Sam In Brownsville, Texas, among the dense forests, lies an abandoned campsite known as Camp Lula Sam. 
this site is associated with one of the most unsettling urban legends in Bronzeville. The story of Camp Lula Sam basically involves a tragic secret that many locals believe. The timeline of the events is not really clear, but it's rumored that a counselor at this all-girls camp started hearing strange voices. Some accounts suggested he was possessed by a spirit from the land, and according to legend, this counselor acted under the compulsion of these voices to harm the young campers in their sleep. Following these tragic events, the camp was shut down and has since been left to decay. Thrill seekers and tourists often trespass onto this now private property hoping to explore the site and perhaps encounter something paranormal. It's said that screams of distress can be heard at night, attributed to the spirits of the young victims. The local community is divided on the truth of these stories though. Some argue that the camp simply closed in 1980 for reasons not made public with no harm coming to any campers. Yet others firmly believe that the place is haunted by the events said to have occurred there. From investigations, there appears to be no substantial evidence confirming these events ever took place at Camp Lulu Sam. The property is currently marked as private and locals warn that the landowner may take drastic measures against trespassers, setting a desire to respect the peace of the supposed restless spirits. Monster of Elizabeth Lake Elizabeth Lake in Los Angeles County near Palmdale is linked to one of California's oldest urban legends. The lake is said to have been created by the devil who placed a monstrous creature within its depths. Legends suggest that if one swims deep enough, they might find a passage leading directly to the underworld, a theory not entirely dismissed because of the lake's position over the San Andreas fault line. The creature described in sightings from the 1830s to the 1880s had bat wings, a long neck, and emitted a foul smell. The area around Elizabeth Lake saw several settlers and ranchers leave or sell their properties at a loss, driven away by the beast's presence. Spanish missionaries reportedly named it Laguna del Diablo, and Native American legends also support claims of the devil's involvement in the lake's creation. In the 1850s, American settlers abandoned the area because of unexplainable events and sightings. And despite efforts to settle and tame the land around Elizabeth Lake, the monster's terror still persisted, leading to the abandonment of ranches and livestock disappearances. One account tells of Miguel Leonis, a Basque immigrant and a formidable figure who owned a ranch by the lake. When the creature began attacking his livestock, Leonis confronted it, supposedly driving it away with his aggression. Following this encounter, the monster was said to have left Elizabeth Lake, heading east towards Arizona. Fair Charlotte Fair Charlotte, also known as Young Charlotte, is an American folk ballad rooted in a cautionary tale about a young girl named Charlotte who refused to dress warmly for a New Year's ball sleigh ride. Tragically, upon arrival, her fiancé finds that she has frozen to death during the journey. This ballad originated from a poem by Seba Smith titled A Corpse Going to a Ball, published in a main newspaper. Smith's work was inspired by an 1840 article from the New York Observer, retold in an Ohio newspaper, highlighting a similar incident that occurred on January 1st, 1840. This story also draws parallels with an 1838 narrative called Death at the Toilet from Passages from the Diary of a London Physician, which describes a vain young woman who dies of a cold while preparing for a ball. The poem was later set to music, evolving into the well-known ballad. A 20th century version by Alameda Riddle titled Young Corlotta keeps the story alive in American folk tradition. This ballad, along with others like Springfield Mountain, showcases narrative verse traditions that addresses themes of vanity, caution, and tragic loss. Blow Dried Bunny The Blow Dried Bunny is an urban legend that emerged online. The story basically centers on a man who discovers his dog holding the lifeless body of a neighbor's prized rabbit. Panicked and seeking to rectify the situation without alarming his neighbor, the man washes the deceased bunny before stealthily before placing it back in its hutch. Days pass with no mention of the incident until a casual conversation with the neighbor reveals a chilling twist. The rabbit had died naturally and was buried by the neighbor earlier on the day of its mysterious reappearance. The man's efforts to conceal the rabbit's fate from the neighbor inadvertently led to a perplexing scenario where the neighbor is baffled by the rabbit's supposed resurrection. Amish Ghost Bridge The tale of the Amish Ghost Bridge in Pinecraft, Florida narrates the tragic love story between a Dutch boy named Amos and an English girl named Ingrid. Their secret romance, hidden from their disapproving parents, led to a heartbreaking misunderstanding with fatal consequences. One evening, as Ingrid attended to meet Amos under the Philippi Creek Railroad Bridge, she slipped and sold her clothes. 
Fearing her parents' discovery, she discarded them by the river and returned home for a change. Meanwhile, Amos arrived, saw the clothes, and presumed the worst, that Ingrid had drowned. Overwhelmed with grief, he jumped off the bridge, ending his life. Ingrid, returning to meet Amos, discovered the horrifying scene and, believing herself responsible, followed suit in despair. This legend has become a cautionary ghost story, with some locals and railroad workers claiming it's true, possibly fabricated to deter children from the bridge. According to the narrative, the spirits of the two lovers haunt the bridge, supposedly causing passerby to fall into the creek and drown. Big Liz The eerie tale of Big Liz weaves through the swamps of Dorchester, Maryland, a ghost story that has haunted the eastern shore since the Civil War. This legend centers around Big Liz, a slave who was entangled in a sinister plot by her master, a confederate sympathizer. The story basically goes that amidst the chaos of the war, confederate funds were hidden on farms across the eastern shore. Many slaves, including Big Liz, were believed to have spied for the Union, revealing the locations of these hidden treasures. According to the legend, Big Liz's master, aware of her betrayal, devised a grim plan under the guise of moving the confederate treasure. He led her deep into Greenbrier Swamp under the pretext of reburying the stash. Once the money was secured, he instructed Big Liz to mark the spot with a sapling. As she bent to plant it, he cruelly decapitated her, leaving her body to vanish in the swamp. Since then, Greenbrier Swamp, spanning about 10 square miles near the beautiful Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, has been shrouded in tales of ghostly sightings. Big Liz's spirit, head in hand, is set to emerge from the mist, beckoning the curious or greedy to follow her into the depths of the swamp with the promise of leading them to the hidden confederate treasure. Those who dare to follow her whispers are never seen again, swallowed by the swamp's eerie silence. Buggy Burrito The urban legend of the Buggy Burrito recounts the chilling tale of Sarah, who, overwhelmed by hunger after a long day of work, decided to grab a quick meal. Opting for convenience, she indulged in a burrito, unknowingly setting the stage for a horrific discovery, being that the next morning, Sarah awoke to peculiar discomfort, being that her tongue felt sore and unusually swollen, a sensation that persisted, prompting a visit to the doctor. Initial examination revealed nothing alarming, but as the condition worsened, necessitating minor surgery, a shocking discovery was made. Embedded within her tongue, amidst her taste buds, was a cyst teeming with cockroach eggs, tracing their origin back to the seemingly innocent burrito she had consumed. Hex House In Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Hex House emerged from a real investigation in 1944, revealing a pretty shocking case. Caroline Smith, 45, was found to have kept Nell Willetta Horner, who was age 30, and Virginia Evans, who was 31, in a state of slavery. Smith had manipulated them into living in an unheated basement, surrendering their paychecks to her under the illusion they would receive a heavenly big payoff. This case was sparked by Smith's fraudulent acquisition of World War II ration books, leading to police discovery of the young woman's dire living conditions while Smith indulged in luxury. The backyard excavation also revealed a dog's carcass and then Bon Bon, who was Smith's dog, buried deeply in a casket alongside materials related to mind control and witchcraft. The trial highlighted Smith's manipulation, resulting in her one-year prison sentence for suborning perjury with additional probation for mail fraud and false ration book claims. The Hex House, once a site of Halloween curiosity, was eventually demolished in 1975, now transformed into a parking lot, but its story still persists as a dark chapter in Tulsa's history. Shaman's Portal In Beaver Dunes Park, Oklahoma, also known as Oklahoma's Bermuda Triangle, strange occurrences have been reported since the time of explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. According to the legend, Coronado's expedition experienced the sudden disappearance of three members amid flashes of green lightning, which he described as the work of the devil. This area, which was known to natives as the Shaman's Portal, has been linked to various disappearances, though none have been officially verified recently. Locals have reported secretive military operations during the night, and in the 1990s, an Oklahoma State University archaeologist allegedly found unusual phenomena such as ionized soil and electromagnetic interference before being halted by military personnel matching descriptions of the men in black. Some believe these disturbances indicate an ancient alien spacecraft 
buried beneath the dunes, while others speculate about portals to other dimensions or protective Native American magic. The only documented evidence of these strange events is in Coronado's diary, leaving the true nature of the shaman's portal still in mystery. Tier 10. Mr. Chu In the 1700s, Samuel Chu, Chief Justice in Delaware, faced daily torment because of his unusual name. Basically, people mockingly sneezed or pretended to chew whenever he passed by. This harassment continued until his death, after which he allegedly began haunting Dover. The first sighting was by farmer David Hendricks, quickly spreading fear throughout the town. Basically, reports described Mr. Chu's ghost in a judge's robe and white-powered wig, engaging in pranks like pulling on men's tailcoats and causing unease among women. His presence led to the shutdown of local businesses and restricted outdoor activities, plunging Dover into a state of fear. A town meeting resolved to conduct a funeral for the ghost, resulting in the burial of an empty casket at his most frequented haunting site. This unusual funeral reportedly lessened the hauntings, with only those mocking his name occasionally experiencing disturbances. This story rates highly on the scale of unique and persisting hauntings. Italian Bride In Hillside, Illinois, Mount Carmel Cemetery is the final resting place of Giulia Bosola Petta, also known as the Italian Bride. Giulia died in 1921 at the age of 29 from childbirth complications and was buried in her wedding dress. The unusual part of the story though began years later when her body was exhumed. Giulia's mother reported nightmares where Giulia asked for her body to be exhumed. Six years after Giulia's death, the family received permission for exhumation. To everyone's surprise, Julia's body was found almost perfectly preserved, unlike her stillborn son, who had decomposed normally. This led to various theories about her preservation, ranging from her sainthood to unique soil conditions, though neither fully explains why only Julia's body remained intact. Some speculate that Julia's mother fabricated the story because of disapproval of Julia's husband. However, the exhumation evidence contradicts this theory. After the whole process, a photograph of Julia's preserved state was placed on her tomb, along with a statue depicting her in her wedding dress. This has, made her create, this has caused her grave to be a significant point of interest, earning her the name The Italian Bride. Jacquis Saint Germain Jacquis Saint Germain became part of New Orleans folklore in the early 20th century, and it basically says that he claimed to be a descendant of the historical Count of Saint Germain and quickly became known in the city for hosting lavish dinner parties for the elite, although he himself never actually ate. His mysterious background and behavior sparked a bunch of rumors among the city's high society. Saint Germain was known to frequent the French Quarter, often seen with young women. His legend though took a dark turn one night when a woman brought to his home was heard screaming. She escaped by jumping from a second story window, claiming Saint Germain had bitten her neck. Police investigating the home found blood stains and bottles filled with what appeared to be blood, but Saint Germain had vanished. The injured woman later died in the hospital. Over time, Saint Germain has become a fixture in urban legend, with stories of sightings and supposed immortal presence in New Orleans. He's said to reappear throughout history, always looking the same. This legend has also inspired various cultural references, including cocktails named after him, and his supposed residence has since become a point of interest. Hitchhiker of Black Horse Lake The story of the Hitchhiker of Black Horse Lake is a well-known urban legend in Montana, specifically in Cascade County near Great Falls. The area around Black Horse Lake, which is a seasonal lake visible in spring and early summer, is the setting for this legend. The Phantom Hitchhiker is considered one of the most aggressive in the United States, differing from other hitchhiker stories because of the detailed encounters reported by witnesses. Drivers, usually at night and heading toward Fort Benton on Highway 87, report seeing a Native American man in denim trying to hitchhike. As vehicles approach, the figure rolls over the hood and windshield, mimicking being hit. Concerned drivers stop to check on the man, only to find him gone without a trace. Remarkably, these encounters leave no damage to the vehicles involved. Also, the consistency of these reports, reported by multiple individuals over the years, also adds to the legend's intrigue. Many believe this phenomenon to be the spirit of a Native American who had actually died on the highway, although there is not really any historical record to confirm such an event. The repeated nature of the settings and the similarity of experiences 
have cemented the hitchhiker of Black Horse Lake as a significant part of Montana's collection of urban legends, alongside other stories of hauntings and unexplained events in the state. Ghost Elephants of Illinois The urban legend of ghost elephants in Illinois centers around a tragic real-life event that occurred on June 22, 1918. Basically, this story originates from Woodland Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois, where a grave marker recounts the horrifying incident involving a train carrying circus performers that eventually led to this eerie legend. The section of Woodland Cemetery known as Showman's Rest is home to a mass grave where up to 61 individuals were buried following this accident. The victims included not only circus performers but also many animals. The tragic event left many of the deceased unrecognizable because of the severe damage caused by the train wreck, compounding the sorrow and horror associated with the site. Local folklore has told stories of ghostly elephant sounds emanating from the cemetery, particularly at night. While the supernatural aspect of these tales is pretty creepy, the actual events is still pretty dreadful on its own. The community members those lost in the tragedy by leaving circus-related memorabilia at their graves, acknowledging the deep impact of the accident on the circus community and beyond. Mercritus In the 1950s, Mississippi was gripped by the tale of Mercritus, a mysterious condition that allegedly turned women into homicidal maniacs. Despite the lack of concrete evidence here, stories of Mercritus have persisted, passed down through generations. The legend basically holds that men would contract mercitis by ingesting high amounts of lead, possibly from pay, which would then cause them to emit a chemical. This chemical, in turn, supposedly made women nearby enter a state of violent insanity, attacking men with lethal intent. The origin of mercitis is said to be actually European, beginning with an incident where a man, pursued by a group of women, jumped into freezing waters to escape. The woman then followed, leading to their collective demise. This tale somewhat traveled to Mississippi by the 1950s, where it was said that a small town experienced a Mercedes outbreak. Men having ingested lead triggered a horrifying response in women who violently rampaged through the town seeking male victims. Though dismissed by many as mere urban legend, there are those who firmly believe the Mercedes story conceals a kernel of truth, perhaps covered up due to a lack of cure or understanding by the medical community. Radioactive Hornets in 2013, a claim circulated suggesting that giant mutant hornets from Fukushima had become a lethal threat in Nebraska, causing multiple fatalities. This narrative attributed the hornets' supposed mutation to radiation exposure from the Fukushima nuclear disaster, alleging that the insects had grown to enormous sizes and possessed venom significantly more potent than that of typical hornets. The origin of this tale was traced back to a satirical article published by the National Report, a website known for its fictional and often outlandish stories. Despite the article's fictional nature though, the story gained traction and raised concern among readers worldwide. The Asian giant hornet or Vespa mandarina does exist and is recognized as the largest hornet species with a potent venom that can be deadly to humans in certain circumstances. Reports from Asian countries have indeed documented fatalities resulting from encounters with these insects. However, these incidents are not related to mutant varieties or linked to radioactive exposure from Fukushima. The narrative basically conflated these real dangers with, with fictional elements, creating a sensational urban legend without basis in fact. The assertion that mutant hornets cause deaths in Nebraska is entirely unfounded, with no evidence to support such occurrences. The National Report later clarified that its content, including the mutant hornet story, is fictional. Vermont's Deep Frozen Old Folks In the heart of Vermont, there's a story which is rooted in the town of Calais and revolves around an unusual practice allegedly carried out by the hardy and inventive residents of the rural community. The narrative claims that to combat the harsh winters and conserve resources, Vermonters had developed a unique method of managing their elderly population. Basically, according to the legend, during the winter months, Families would freeze their elderly relatives, placing them in a state of suspended animation until the arrival of spring. This practice was said to be a frugal solution to saving food and heating, ensuring the survival of the entire family through the cold season. The origin of this story dates back to December 21st, 1887, when it was first published in the Montpelier Argus and Patriot. The article basically described the processes in detail, noting how the elderly were drugged to insensibility then exposed to the freezing temperatures outside 
until they were completely frozen. Come spring, they were supposedly thawed with the help of herbal bats, regaining consciousness just in time to participate in the planting season. This account was attributed to a diary excerpt from an individual known as AM who had allegedly witnessed this practice firsthand. For decades, the story circulated as a genuine account of rural Vermont ingenuity. It was featured in various articles and radio shows often presented as an absolutely true occurrence. However, the truth behind this legend is far less mystical. In 1949, research revealed that the original tale was a work of fiction created by Alan Morris, a farmer and storyteller from Clyde's. Morris had crafted the story and his daughter submitted it to the newspaper, leading to its widespread dissemination. Mr. Rogers was a sniper. The urban legend surrounding Mr. Rogers, the beloved host of the children's television program Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, claims he was a Navy SEAL or Marine Scout sniper with numerous confirmed kills during the Vietnam era. Another part of the rumor suggests he wore long sleeves to cover tattoos he got while in the military. However, these stories are entirely false. Fred Rogers was born in 1928, making him significantly older than the typical enlistment age during the Vietnam conflict. Furthermore, his career path directly contradicts these rumors. After completing high school, Rogers immediately pursued higher education and upon graduating, embarked on a career in television. This timeline leaves no gap for possible military service. Also, Mr. Rogers chose to wear long-sleeved attire as a part of his on-screen persona, aiming to maintain a formal and authoritative presence that appealed to both children and their parents. Contrary to the claims of the legend, he had no tattoos to hide. The choice of clothing was purely stylistic and part of his gentle, respectful image he cultivated throughout his career. Satoru-kun In Japan, a tale circulates about a mysterious entity known as Satoru, derived from the word meaning enlightened one or one who knows all. According to legend, Satoru possesses knowledge of the past, present, and future. For those brave enough to seek answers from Satoru, a specific ritual involving a phone call to one's own cell phone from a public booth is set to summon him. Participants then must recite a chant inviting Satoru to appear and then turn off their cell phone. If the ritual is successful, Satoru will return to the call within 24 hours, although the cell phone must remain off until then. Upon contacting the individual, Satoru claims to be progressively closer with each call, ultimately announcing his presence directly behind the caller. This is basically the moment when the caller may ask a single question about anything. Satoru's response is guaranteed to be truthful, regardless of the topic. However, the legend warns against asking more than one question, delaying the inquiry, attempting to see Satoru, or turning around. Disregarding these warnings is said to result in dire consequences, including being taken to another realm. Phantom Social Workers The term phantom social workers emerged in the UK and US following reports of individuals falsely claiming to be social workers, allegedly attempting child abductions. These incidents were mainly reported during the early 1990s. Witnesses often described the impersonators as professional-looking women, sometimes accompanied by a man, who conducted unsettling inspections of children in homes. Such reports sparked widespread concern and led to police investigations. In 1990, South Yorkshire Police initiated Operation Child Care, one of the UK's largest investigations with participation from 23 police forces. This year-long probe collected 250 reports but found only a minority credible, with no arrests made. Similarly, the Lothian and Borders Police in Scotland investigate these claims but also made no arrests, disbanding their unit in 1994. The origins of these stories are kind of speculative. Some link them to urban legends or paranoia fueled by the controversial diagnosis of child abuse by pediatrician Marietta Higgs in Cleveland, England, without concrete evidence. Others suggest that vigilante citizens, mistaken for social workers, were conducting independent child abuse investigations. Additional explanations include misidentification of door-to-door -door salespeople, canvassers, or religious missionaries. Akamanto Akamanto, translating to Red Cloak, is a Japanese urban legend involving a spirit haunting toilets, often in schools or public places. This entity, which is sometimes also called Red Cape or Akai Kami Oikami, presents a deadly choice to individuals, red or blue paper, cloak or cape. Choosing either options leads to a fatal outcome, with red resulting in the person being cut until they're covered in their blood, and blue leading to strangulation or blood being drained. 
Some stories mention alternative outcomes, like a red tongue or a white hand emerging from the toilet based on the paper color chosen. To survive an encounter with Akamanto, one must neither choose an option nor bring the toilet paper as it disappears, preventing avoidance of the spirit's deadly game. Ignoring Akamanto or refusing both options is also said to make him disappear. Attempts to trick the spirit by asking for a different color results in being dragged to the underworld or hell. A peculiar escape involves choosing yellow, which can lead to one's head being submerged in the toilet, possibly resulting in drowning. Originating from schoolyard rumors dating back to the 1930s, the legend of Akomanto has varied over time, partly because of the evolving meaning of manto in Japanese from a sleeveless kimono jacket to a cloak or cape. This legend spread across Japan and even reached Japanese elementary students in Korea during Japanese rule. Yakumama the Yakumama is a mythical serpent from Amazonian folklore, described as a massive snake that could reach lengths of up to 60 meters. It's said to dwell in the Amazon River Basin, particularly around a mysterious area known as the Boiling River. According to local beliefs, the Yakumama is considered the mother of all aquatic creatures and has a terrifying ability to suck in anything alive within a 100 pace radius. To avoid its wrath, locals would sound a conch horn before entering the river, a practice based on the belief that the serpent would show itself if nearby. There's an account from the 1990s where two men attempting to confront the Yakumama used explosives in the river. The explosion bloodied but did not kill the creature, which then disappeared into the river depths, leaving the men in shock and fear. One theory suggests that the Yakumama might be related to Titanoboa, an ancient species of snake that lived millions of years ago and could grow up up to 12 meters. Some scientists speculate that the Titanoboa might have been even larger, potentially linking it to the legend of the Yakumama. Auckland Domain Witches In Auckland Domain, one of the oldest parks in Auckland, New Zealand, a tale whispers of the three witches. The urban legend has its roots in the 1800s, telling of three witches hanged amidst the swampy lands that would become the lush expanse of the domain. Witnesses and passerby have reported eerie encounters, being a lone figure shrouded in darkness, cackling in the night, shadowy forms darting through the trees, and unsettling sounds that can chill the spine. To ensure safety, locals once blew on a conch horn before entering the river, a practice believed to make the serpent reveal itself if nearby. This story, though lacking concrete evidence, has been a part of the local lore now, prompting curiosity among the people. In an effort to uncover the truth behind these tales, Paranormal New Zealand embarked on a research journey, inviting the public to share their encounters and stories. The request unearthed a variety of responses, from skeptics who attributed the sightings to homeless individuals to those who firmly believed in the witch's existence. Among the shared experiences, common elements emerged, such as the apparition of figures and the feeling of being watched or attacked by unseen forces. Goldbrook Covered Bridge Goldbrook Covered Bridge, known to locals as Emily's Bridge, is a historical wooden bridge in Stowey, Vermont. Built in 1844 by John W. Smith, this bridge spans Goldbrook and is notable for its Howie Trust construction, a method patent just four years earlier. Measuring 48.5 feet long and 17 feet wide, with a roadway width of 13.5 feet, the bridge is recognized for its craftsmanship and design. It stands on stone abutments with a metal gabled roof and also a vertical board siding. In 1974, Goldbrook Covered Bridge was added to the National Register of Historic Places, emphasizing its significance as the only 19th century public roadway bridge in Vermont of its kind. Despite its architectural importance though, the bridge is perhaps better known for the legend of Emily. According to local lore, in the 1950s, Emily was a young woman from a poor family who fell in love with a man from a wealthy background. After his parents forbade the marriage, the heartbroken Emily supposedly waited for him at the bridge at midnight, only to leap to her demise when he did not appear. Since then, her spirit is set to haunt the bridge, leading to its nickname. Nure Ona Nure Ona, a mythical creature from Japanese folklore, is a being with a woman's head and a snake's body. This entity is often associated with water environments such as seas and rivers. The name Nure Ona translates to wet woman and highlights the creature's characteristic of always having wet hair. While there's some variations in appearance and behavior, a common portrayal depicts her consuming humans. This yokai shares similarities with the Kyushu region's Isona, suggesting a broader mythological theme of female figures 
linked to water. Despite his depiction in Edo period art, such as the works in Hyakai Zukan and Gazu Hyaki Yagyo, concrete seals of Nure Ona from the Eros literature are pretty scarce. However, there's a story from the Edo period, dating 1819, and mentions a group of young men encountering a mysterious woman washing her hair by a river. This led to a terrifying encounter with a creature possessing a long tail suggesting a serpent-like form. Also, folk tales from Shiman Prefecture describe Nore Ona as a water being that, in some accounts, collaborates with another mythical creature, the Ushioni. She'd basically hand over a baby to unsuspecting victims, which turns into a heavy stone, preventing escape and leading to the victim's demise by the Ushioni. Tenome The Tenome is a mythical creature from Japanese folklore and is known for its unique appearance where its eyes are located on the palm of its hands. This entity is typically depicted as resembling a blind person, specifically a Zato, which is a member of a historical guild for the blind in Japan. Without detailed descriptions in the original text though, much of what is known about the Tanome comes from artistic depictions and various interpretations. According to legend, the Tanome is a spirit that roams at night, searching for something or someone with the eyes on its hand. Its origin story involves a blind man who was attacked and wished to see the faces of his Sicilians with his hands if not with his eyes, which led him to becoming a Tanome after death. This creature is associated with tales of vengeance and the pursuit of those who wronged it in life. In folklore, encounters with the Tanome are often marked by terror. One story recounts a man visiting a graveyard and being pursued by Tanome. Seeking refuge and hiding inside his chest, he was discovered by the creature, which then sucked all the bones from his body, leaving only skin behind. Another tale from Iwati Prefecture tells of a traveler encountering the Tanome, which is searching with the eyes on his hands. The traveler escapes to an inn, sharing his frightful experience with the innkeeper, who recounts the tale of the blind man's transformation into the Tanome. Helltown, Ohio Helltown, once known as Boston, Ohio, has a lot of myths and tales of haunting phenomena. Established in 1806, Boston was an unremarkable village until 1974 when the government, aiming to conserve forest land, decreed the area would become the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. The acquisition process displaced many residents, leaving behind empty homes that became the nucleus for numerous urban legends. Legends tell of a town cursed with everything from haunted school bus to satanic churches and even tales of a giant snake, the Peninsula Python, lurking in the abandoned woods. The truth, however, is steeped in environmental tragedy rather than supernatural phenomena. Among the government-acquired lands was Kreji Dump, later discovered to be a toxic waste site leading to illness among park rangers and extensive cleanup efforts. And despite the debunking of many legends, such as the story of the haunted bus being a temporary home for a local family, the tale still persists, fueled by the area's real-life abandonment and the human penchant for ghost stories. In 2016, the remnants of Helltown were demolished, making way for the National Park's expansion and officially closing the chapter on a place that, while no longer physically exists, still lives on through the tales of its past mysteries and alleged hauntings. Igloo City Igloo City in Cantwell, Alaska is a pretty peculiar site, originally intended to be a hotel but never saw completion. Constructed in the 1970s, the project faced a lot of obstacles meeting building codes of the time, which led to its abandonment. Despite changing hands through various owners over the years, no one succeeded in making it operational because of its deteriorating condition. This four-story concrete behemoth is so massive, it's visible from planes flying at 30,000 feet. Although the exterior of Igloo City suggests the outline of a potentially blessing hotel, the interior, the interior tells a different story with construction never fully finished. Over the years, curiosity has drawn many to explore the unguarded structure, its open doors inviting the brave to witness the decay within. Located in a remote part of Alaska, Igloo City serves as a landmark for travelers between Fairbanks and Anchorage, marking the halfway point along the park's highway. While its original purpose was lost to time and regularity changes, Igloo City has still become an unexpected tourist attraction drawing attention for its unusual architecture and the story of ambition halted by practical realities. And as of today, Igloo City's future remains uncertain. Fort Delaware In the book Civil War Ghosts at Fort Delaware, Mystery, Legend, and Lore by Ed O'Connowis, 
Readers are taken on a journey through the eerie and paranormal occurrences at Fort Delaware. Situated in Peapatch Island in the Delaware River, this fort served as a prison for Confederate soldiers during the Civil War, particularly after the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. Transformed into a state park in 1951, the fort's grim past as a war prison, marked by severe conditions and harsh treatment for prisoners, has led to its reputation as one of the most haunted locations in the United States near water. The book basically delves into various ghost stories and legends that have emerged from Fort Delaware over the years. Tales have arisen of spectacle soldiers wandering the barracks, eerie appearances of a lady in black haunting the kitchen, and other ghostly figures seen around the grounds filling the pages. Additionally, Oconowitz extends the scope of hauntings to include Fort DuPont and Old Newcastle. Green Lady of Wahiwa the Legend of the Green Lady of Wahiwa tells of a haunting figure wandering the Wahiwa Botanical Garden, the surrounding gulch, and even the grounds of the Wahiwa Elementary School. The story basically originates from a tragic tale of a mother who lost one of her children in the dense forest of the gulch many years ago. Despite her efforts and her return with the remaining children to search, none of them were seen again. Consumed by the grief of her lost child, the mother is said to have passed away, but her spirit still lingers in the area. Described as having a greenish hue with fish-like scales, jagged teeth, and hair entangled with seaweed, the green lady's appearance is as unsettling as her story. She's believed to still be searching for her lost child, and legend has it she might take any child she encounters in her endless search. Grunge Road Monster The Grunge Road Monster, also known as a variant of the Chupacabra, is a mysterious creature reported in the New Orleans area. According to local lore, the Grunge is an eerie blend of canine and reptilian features, gaining its name from the secluded Grunge Road where it was first reported. Unlike its kin in other areas, the New Orleans Grunge tales date back even further, mixing with the city's early settlement days. The legend basically holds that the Grunge's origins are deeply rooted in the New Orleans' voodoo traditions. A tale recounts how Mary Laveau, the renowned voodoo queen encountered the devil baby whose castrated testicles morphed into male and female grunches. These creatures, with their formidable strength and terrifying appearance, nearly led to Laveau's demise, prompting her to abandon her voodoo practices. The Grunge Road is rumored to inhabit remote areas of New Orleans, including city parks and golf courses, and its presence has instilled fear among local residents. Reports of the Grunge attacking pets and rummaging through garbage have also been shared, with sightings stretching across various neighborhoods. Chief Chokora The legend of Chief Chokora speaks of a mythical Native American chief connected to Mount Chokora in Tamport, New Hampshire. Despite being a creation of white colonists without historical evidence, the tale has since become mixed with the identity of the region. According to a myth, Chief Chokora lived in the early 1700s and chose to stay behind as his tribe moved to avoid conflicts with settlers. He said to have shared a close bond with a settler named Cornelius Campbell, entrusting his son to the Campbell family, only for the boy to tragically die from accidentally consuming poison. Stricken by grief, Chokorwa saw revenge, leading to the death of the Campbell family. Cornelius Campbell, in pursuit of justice, cornered Chokorwa on the mountain summit. With nowhere to go, Chokorwa uttered a curse upon the white settlers, before leaping to his demise. The curse is said to have brought misfortune and tragedy to the area. Despite its questionable authenticity, though, the legend of Chief Chokorwa has been resold through generations. Sika Hollow State Park In the northeastern part of South Dakota, there is a place shrouded in mystery and cloaked in legend, known as Sika Hollow State Park. This land, which was once the hunting grounds of the Dakota Siwaks, is believed by many to be haunted, a belief which traces back to the area's original Native American inhabitants. The Dakota Sioux named the area Sika, meaning evil or bad, because of various unexplained phenomena and their interpretation of the red tinted springs as the blood of their ancestors. This belief has endured, and today visitors can explore the Tale of Spirits, where the natural wonders of Sika Hollow are said to be accompanied by supernatural forces. The history of Sika Hollow also includes tales of early settlers who braved its reputedly cursed land. Among them was Robert Roy in the 1840s, who chose to live in what many deemed an accursed ravine, a decision that both Native Americans and later US soldiers found perplexing or mad. 
As time went on, stories of mysterious beasts and disappearances in the 1970s added to the hollow's eerie reputation, with some speculating the presence of a Bigfoot-like creature. Billywhack Monster The Billywhack Monster originates from California. Described as a towering, muscular entity resembling an ape but covered in gray fur, this cryptid is distinguished by its long, ram-like horns. The legend portrays the Billywhack Monster as a menacing figure that particularly targets high school students engaging in acts of aggression such as hurling hefty 50-pound rocks at vehicles and forcefully pounding on their hoods with its immense hands. Some accounts even suggest the creature wields a massive club. Varied versions of the tale introduce the Billywhack Monster not merely as a physical being but as a spectral entity haunting the old territories it roams. Charman Charman comes from California's urban legends and emerges from the tragic backdrop of a devastating fire. He is basically believed to have once been a man who suffered unspeakable burns, leaving him with black, peeling skin that resembles charred bandages. Now, it's said he roams the vicinity of a Jai's Creek Road, particularly targeting those who dare to invoke his wrath on the bridge. Legends offer various origins of the Char Man though, basically with one speaking of a father and son caught in a fire, with the son driven mad by his injuries and grief, skinning his deceased father. Another version involves a husband unable to save his wife from a fire who becomes a Char Man out of despair. There's also a story about a firefighter who perished while batting a blaze, his spirit unable to find peace. On the other hand, the legend might have roots in the real life suffering of a man with severe skin cancer, whose appearance at night sparked the myth among local youths. But yeah, the Char Man has since become a potent symbol of vengeance and terror, especially on the bridge on Creek Road where daring individuals test their faith by summoning him. Zunukwa Zunukwa is depicted as an opposing supernatural being known both for her ability to bring wealth and a terrifying aspect as an ogress who kidnaps and eats children. Described as a large, monstrous woman with black skin, long, sagging breasts, and a hair that hangs disheveled, Zunukwa is often portrayed naked with bright red lips, pursed as if calling out. It's said that the sound of wind passing through cedar trees is actually Zunukwa's voice. As a complex figure, Zunukwa is feared by children for a penche for stealing them away in her basket. However, she also holds a piece of respect as an ancestor of the Namgis tribe, through her son Sadawalagam and is considered a source of great wealth to those who can outweigh her. According to legend, Zunukwa has remarkable powers, including the ability to revive from death, an ability she purportedly uses to resurrect her own children in some stories. It's also said that she has poor eyesight, which allows people to avoid her easily, and despite her frightening appearance, she's said to be slow and not very intelligent. One particular myth recounts that Zunukwa was tricked into falling into a pit of fire, which was kept burning for many days until nothing was left, ensuring she could not regenerate. Dashes from this fire are believed to have transformed into mosquitoes. Ram-headed Southern Storyteller Frank Fleming's sculpture The Storyteller in Birmingham, Alabama features a distinctive design, being a human body with the ram's head, known locally as Ram Man. This sculpture, contrary to some concerns, does not really represent foreign ideologies or occult rituals. Instead, Fleming, an Alabama native, created this work inspired by the southern tradition of using animals in storytelling. His aim was to highlight storytelling as a peaceful kingdom, appealing especially to children. The sculpture basically depicts a storyteller engaging with animal listeners from an open book. Located in front of a Methodist church, its unique theme has led to urban legends about its purpose and meaning, including assumptions of satanic connections. However, these are unfounded. The sculpture and its surrounding animal figures, including frogs that create a fountain effect, are meant to embody the joy of storytelling, not really to provoke fear or suspicion. And the storyteller is situated in Birmingham's Five Points District, with an area which is known for its lively atmosphere. Pigman Road Bridge The Angola Pigman in New York's lore inhabits the eerie sketch of Holland Road, infamously dubbed Pigman Road. This legend mixes with Angola's past, featuring a butcher known for its gruesome habit of displaying pig heads on stakes along the road during the 1950s and 1960s. The narrative though takes a darker turn with tales of murder, where it said the same individual escalated from displaying animal remains to committing human atrocities. 
One chilling account tells of the butcher taking the life of a man, then basically showcasing the victim's body on a meat hook within a shop. Pigman's legend also further haunts Holland Road with its association with its association to a tragic train derailment on December 18, 1967. Their catastrophe claimed 50 lives and left 40 others severely injured. Locals believe the souls of these victims linger, with their anguished cries permeating the night air around Pigman Road. The area is plagued by reports of paranormal phenomena, from inexplicable squealing, similar to that of a distressed pig, to encounters with shadowy figures and ghostly handprints on vehicles. These eerie occurrences have filled a pervasive sense of dread, deterring the curious and leaving an indelible mark on local consciousness. Mingwa The Mingwa, a cryptid reported in Tanzania, is known for its massive size and unusual grey fur. This creature, which is described to be large as a donkey, has puzzled locals and researchers alike since the early 1900s. Unlike the well-known lines of the region, the Mingwa's fur samples and tracks suggest the creature more similar to a gigantic leopard but with notable differences, including a unique brindled pattern on its coat. First gaining widespread attention through a 1938 article in Discovery by William Hitchens, accounts of the Mingwa include tales of vicious attacks on humans. These reports sparked a lot of interest and fear, leading to numerous expeditions to uncover the truth behind these settings. For instance, Patrick Bowen, a hunter who once pursued the creature, noted that its footprints were larger than those of, of any known leopard, supporting claims of its really immense size. Theories about the Mingwa's identity kind of vary, with some suggesting it could be a new species or even an unknown variation of the African golden cat. Despite these theories though, the Mingwa still remains a mystery, with no definite proof of its existence beyond ominous accounts and anecdotal evidence. Lalachuza Lalachuza, which is rooted in Mexican folklore, tells of a supernatural owl, often white, identified as a witch transformed. This legend is more than just a tale of an owl, but a tale of transformation, revenge, and warning. Predominantly recognized in northern Mexico and bordering regions of Texas and California, the creature is described as a colossal owl about 7 feet tall with a wingspan of 15 feet, and notably, it possesses an old woman's face. The origin of Lalachuza kind of varies. In some narratives, it's a tale of a woman seeking vengeance for her wronged or murdered child, turning her sorrow and anger into a quest for retribution against those she deems responsible or those embodying the vices that led to her tragedy. This transformation into La Lechuza is sometimes said to be a pact with the devil, allowing her to assume the owl's form to carry out revenge under the veil of the night. The creature is also notorious for its eerie call, mimicking a baby's cry or a whistling sound, which is used to lure unsuspecting individuals into its grasp. Legends say that just hearing or dreaming of La Lechuza, signaling her as a harbinger of doom. The owl is also attributed incredible strength, capable of carrying an adult human away with ease. Caddy Wampus in the Woods In the secluded woods of Possum Valley, Arkansas, there is a creature known as Caddy Wampus, or Wampus Cat, a legend deeply rooted in the local lore. This mythical creature is described as a six-like panther, far larger than any mountain panther known to science. Locals, respecting the lore passed down to generations, advise that if one ever crosses path with the Wampus Cat, the best course of action is to basically quietly retreat, acknowledging the creature's dominion over the woods without posing a threat. Legend has it that the Caddy Wampus roams the dense forest in search of food for her offspring, and those unfortunate enough to challenge or threaten her presence risk invoking her wrath, marked by her terrifying screams as she feasts on her prey. Yet, the Caddy Wampus is not without a sense of judgment. It's said that if you ever find yourself lost within her domain, the Caddy Wampus might approach. She then gazes into the eyes of the lost, assessing their character. To those deemed good-hearted or innocent, she might offer guidance, leading them to safety. However, individuals with malintent or those who disrespect her force find themselves led deeper into confusion and snared in a maze from which there is no escape. Adopted dog that was really a rat. So this urban legend basically goes that a tourist in Mexico, charmed by a stray dog's company, decided to bring it home, unknowingly crossing international borders with what she thought was a canine companion. Upon arrival, signs of illness in the animal prompted a visit to a local veterinarian. 
The visit unveiled the shocking truth that the supposed dog was not a dog at all, but a Mexican sewer rat nearing death. This tale, which is rooted in 1983, underscores the unease and suspicion that often accompany the crossing of cultural boundaries. Hamster Misha So this one basically goes that a young boy was playing with his hamster in the basement when the arrival of a carpet installer interrupted their fun. Instructed by his mother to let the carpet man work, the boy left, unknowingly leaving his hamster behind. As the installer neared completion of his task, he noticed a small bump under the newly laid carpet, mistaking it for his misplaced cigarette pack. Opting for a quick fix, he hammered the lump flat, only to later discover his cigarettes in his truck. Puzzled about the bump's true nature, he called the homeowner the next day, leading to the grim realization that the hamster had been the lump under the carpet, its whereabouts unknown since the day of the carpet installation. Choking Doberman The choking Doberman tale emerged in the United States, narrating an event where a dog's owner finds her pet struggling to breathe, only to discover human fingers lodged in its throat. This tale was documented by Jan Harold Brunvard, a professor emeritus of English at the University of Utah, known for his extensive work on urban legends. He presented various versions of this narrative in his 1984 publication, highlighting how details like the dog's breed and the intruder's condition when found subtly change across accounts. But in the core of the story, a woman returns home to find her Doberman in distress. Rushing the dog to the vet, she later learns from an urgent call to vacate her home as the dog had choked on human fingers. The police then uncover a burglar, incapacitated from blood loss because of the dog's defensive actions hiding within her home. Bunvard also traces this modern urban legend back to old ages, such as the story of Gellert, a loyal dog wrongfully killed by its master, Llewellyn the Great, under the mistaken belief it harmed his son. Bonsai Kin Bonsai Kitten was basically a controversial hoax website created by an MIT student. The site was falsely claimed to offer instructions on how to grow kittens in jars to shape their bones, mimicking bonsai plants. This sparked a bunch of widespread outrage and complaints to animal rights organizations. Authorities, including the Michigan Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and even the FBI, investigated the site for promoting animal cruelty. Despite being a satire, the site's content led many to believe it was advocating for real harm against animals. And animal welfare groups have since debunked the site, emphasizing it as a fake, yet acknowledging the potential harm it could cause by promoting cruelty. The original site has now been taken down, but copies and mirrors continue to circulate online, still drawing criticism and concern from activists. Subway Stare so this is a creepy pasta and basically talks about a woman who was on a late night subway ride feeling uneasy because of another passenger's intense gaze. Trying to ignore it, her discomfort grew until a new rider sat beside her and advised her to leave at the next station. Heeding his suggestion for safety, she exited the train with him. Away from the subway, the man revealed his alarming observation that the woman who had been staring at her appeared lifeless with two individuals on either side maintaining her upright position, giving the illusion she was alive. The Merry-Go-Round This urban legend basically goes that in an amusement park, a carousel known as the Merry-Go-Round had been closed for years because of a lack of visitors. The decision to shut it down was made by the ride's owner who could not find a buyer to take over. And as a result, this section of the park fell into disuse and was forgotten. A decade later though, the owner's daughter, feeling that it was a waste to leave the beautifully crafted ride unused, persuaded her boyfriend to help her bring attention back to the carousel. They basically planned a publicity event where the boyfriend would attempt to break a record by riding the merry-go-round for a continuous 72 hours. The event attracted a lot of media attention and as the boyfriend confidently mounted his chosen horse, everything seemed set for a successful stunt. However, just minutes into the ride, he began to complain of being bitten by a horse he was riding. Initially, his claims were dismissed as an excuse to back out, which frustrated his girlfriend, who accused him of letting her down. But the situation took a grave turn when, a few months later, the young man unexpectedly fell from the horse, dead. In disbelief and shock, his girlfriend backed away from the scene, only to find the horse to emit a hissing sound. A closer inspection revealed a poisonous snake hiding inside the horse's mouth, which explained the so-called bite the young man had complained about. This discovery shed light on the actual cause of his sudden death, turning the event meant to revive the merry-go-round into a tragic occurrence marked by horror 
and disbelief. Spook light. The spook light, also known as Hornet spook light or Joplin spook light, is an atmospheric ghost light observed on the border between southwestern Missouri and northeastern Oklahoma near Hornet, Missouri. This phenomenon basically involves the misidentification of distant car headlights with its cause traced to an alignment issue involving Route 66 and a nearby road called E50 or Spook Light Road. Because of their alignment, headlights from cars on Route 66 appear as mysterious lights from Spook Light Road, giving rise to the ghost light legend. The Spook Light was first documented in print in 1936, and despite legend suggesting an older origin, Research indicates no mention of it prior to the designation of Route 66 in 1926. Over time, local businesses and chambers of commerce have promoted the spook light as a tourist attraction, despite demonstrations debunking its supernatural nature through experiments in the 1940s to recent years. Myths surrounding the spook light involve various ghost stories, such as those involving Native American spirits or the ghosts of miners, but no evidence supports these tales. Third Eye Man The Third Eye Man is a mysterious figure associated with the catacombs beneath the University of South Carolina. First spotted in 1949 by two students, this figure, dressed in silver, was seen entering the underground through a manhole. The incident gained attention when a student journalist reported it, and months later, a police officer encountered mutilated chickens on campus and reported seeing a strange silver-clad man with a third eye in the middle of his forehead who vanished before backup arrived. In the late 1960s, the figure reappeared in the university's catacombs during a fraternity initiation, attacking the group with a pipe. And despite a manhunt, the third eye man was never found, and the entrance to the tunnels was sealed. Since then, there's been no sightings of the third eye man, and it leaves itself as a haunting legend of the university. Antalya. The legend of Antalya, also known as the Isle of Seven Cities, emerged from an Iberian legend set during the Muslim conquest of Hispania around 714. Basically, to escape the conquest, seven Christian bishops and their followers sailed west into the Atlantic Ocean, eventually finding an island where they established seven settlements. This story led to the belief in a phantom island located far west of Portugal and Spain, which appeared on nautical charts during the 15th century. As exploration increased and the Atlantic Ocean became more accurately mapped, the depictions of Antilia gradually disappeared from charts. However, the legend contributed to the naming of the Spanish Antilles and fueled speculation about pre-Columbian transoceanic contact. The island was first noted explicitly on the 1424 chart of Zuan Pizango and continued to appear in various maps associated with myths of great riches and utopian societies. Microsoft Acquisition Hoax the Microsoft acquisition hoax, which dates back to 1994, falsely claimed that Microsoft Corporation intended to acquire the Roman Catholic Church. This event basically marks the first widespread internet hoax and gained a lot of attention. The hoax was articulated through a fake press release mimicking the style of the Associated Press and circulated across the internet. It humorously suggested Microsoft's takeover of the church in exchange for Microsoft stock and introducing absurdities such as taking Holy Communion through computers and treating conversion as a software upgrade. Despite the clearly unrealistic and satirical nature of the press release, it confused and alarmed some readers, leading to inquiries directed at Microsoft for clarification. On December 16, 1994, Microsoft officially addressed and debunked the hoax. And following this initial hoax, a series of similar fictitious press releases emerged, humorously suggesting acquisitions of various entities by major corporations, including a mock claim of IBM acquiring the Episcopal Church and Microsoft establishing the Microsoft Divine Network with Italian network RAI. Jackal Hoax Jacko hoax originated from an 1884 Canadian newspaper story and reported a capture of a gorilla-like creature near Yale, British Columbia. Initially, the Daily Colonist newspaper presented Jacko as a gorilla, but later Bigfoot advocates used the till as supposed evidence of Sasquatch's existence. The story basically gained attention through mentions in various books on Bigfoot and cryptids, discussions by Michael Kremel as potential Sasquatch proof, 
and features in television documentaries narrated by Leonard Nimoy, such as Ancient Mysteries and In Search Of. Lorne Coleman also highlighted the story's popularity surge in the 1950s when reporter Blues McLevy rediscovered the article, sharing it with researchers John Green and Rene Dahinden. Despite initial belief in its authenticity, John Green eventually discovered articles that cast doubt on the entire affair, deeming it likely journalist fiction. Joe Nickel referenced the mainland Guardian's dismissal of the case as a hoax, further discrediting the story. Subsequent follow-up articles and public inquiries revealed no evidence of the jackal's existence, with the mainland Guardian explicitly stating that no such animal was caught. Michigan Blue Hell The Michigan Blue Hell legend suggests a mysterious passage out of reality within Michigan's extensive underground tunnels. Named after a video game glitch where the player exits the map, creating an unreachable skeletal view of the environment, the legend proposes similar eerie consequences for those who find it. Some believe entering blue hell means you can never return, potentially leading to death or trapping one in a state where they can observe the world unseen. Michigan's history with subterranean systems fuels speculation on the blue hell's location, including beneath Lake Erie, tied to Native American legends, and early colonial accounts of a tunnel system within Westford Hood's military base rumored for secretive projects, and even in Detroit via a specific abandoned building associated with the elevator game and Native American myths of a great serpent. Explanations for Blue Hell range from a portal to another reality, exaggerations of Michigan's real tunnels, urban legends to deter novice explorers, or genuine glitches in reality. Our last entry, Super Mario 64 1995-07-29 build. The July 29, 1995 build of Super Mario 64 is a mysterious version of the game predating the Ultra 64 patent. Its content is reportedly so sensitive that research into it is highly discouraged. Originating before Nintendo's official release, it's believed to have been developed by an unknown Japanese entity, which then sold it to Nintendo. This version is notable for a severe texture bug causing rapid color changes, potentially including seizures and hallucinations in playtesters, leading to rumors of it being the source of the game's most horrific anomalies. The build has sparked various speculations, and some say it wasn't related to Mario or developed by Nintendo, but was actually a prototype focused on personalizing gameplay. Others believe it was intended as a desolate and unrecognizable version of the Mario franchise, featuring simplistic characters and a smaller, more interconnected castle design. The basement is rumored to have contained experimental AI that created endless, labyrinthine experiences, contrasting a lot with the final game's cheerful tone. Reports both from developers and individuals with purported inside knowledge describe a game far removed from the family-friendly Mario universe. These include tales of a playtester driven to madness, advanced fog effects, and even an AI designed to subvert players' expectations. While some suggest connections to other realms or realities, the consensus among skeptics is that the build is either a deeply buried secret of Nintendo's early development efforts or a complex urban legend that has captivated the imagination of Mario fans and conspiracy theorists alike. So that ends the video. If you got this far, I really appreciate it and I hope you liked the video. Make sure to drop some suggestions or any feedback in the comments and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.